fight, never quit, do it right, play the game, win your life, have no shame, there's no time, feel the pain, with the grind, I could change, in my mind, pick a lane, commit and climb, the only way, to win it life, I never miss that fact. What is going on, everybody? And welcome back for week number four of the ECAC Top 8 Plays of the Week. Now, at this point, you're probably realizing two things. One, that's right. We're at the Collegiate Esports Commissioner's Cup. Let's make some noise. Ow. Oh, and it's going to be... Into it. It's corner, Judge. It's good for one, two, ten. He needs more in the... They're oh, doing man. even more here. You gotta touch the point. Mr. College walks it in. Joy Boy is gonna drop. Knife him. Right out front. Yeah. Three, oh, two, one. Right. He's running. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting night in college esports right here on Esports U Live. I'm your host, Paulie Hype, and before we get into tonight's matchups, let's take a look and recap what we saw last night right here on the channel. It started with the Padilla Cup matchmaking season week number three, which featured University of Houston Scarlet versus Andromeda. We have some new faces in Padilla coming in as University of Houston Scarlet takes on Andromeda. UH Scarlet were on an explosive start as they kept on getting flawless, thrifty rounds early on. Players from UH Scarlet like Binko and Orchid kept on getting multiple 3K and 4Ks on Icebox before cleaning, cleanly taking the 13-0 win Ooh, before we moved on to Fracture. Game number two seemed like a similar story as UH Scarlet had Andromeda's number no matter what kind of play they decided to do. We also got to see one of the fastest aces on this channel as Binko was able to tap all of Andromeda's heads with her Vandal. U8 Scarlet did not drop a single round in the series, showing that they are a major adversary right here in the Padilla Cup. Coming up next, we head over to the ECAC for Valorant Week 5, which featured Army West Point versus Loyola University, Maryland. Army West Point is looking for their first win of the season, but their upcoming match is against the undefeated Loyola University, Maryland. Map number one saw us on Icebox, and it was a bloodbath in the first half as both teams took turns taking rounds with only one member left standing. It looked like Loyola would take the victory after the half, but Army West Point MIB Police was on a rampage as they took their team all the way to match point at 12-10. We did end up going to an overtime where Army West Point's spark of hope finally went away as Leola was able to take Icebox as their own. It felt like something changed for Leola as we went into map number three, Pearl, as the players, map number two, Pearl, excuse me, as the players of Leola, like Bai, had their intensity turned up to 110% as their plays were breathtaking. Army West Point were only able to claim a couple rounds, but not to the likes of map one, as Leola were able to snatch away the victory to remain undefeated in the ACAC for Valorant. Well done, Leola University, Maryland. The third match of the night went over to the Mountain West Conference as we had some Overwatch 2 action featuring Utah State University versus Colorado State University. We go over to the west of the U.S. where we got to see Utah State taking on Colorado, of course, in the Mountain West Conference. From the get-go, both Utah State and Colorado State were able to claim the first two points in Nepal before heading over to the final part of the village. Like the first two areas, both teams were able to get to the point to about 90 plus percent that final moment, but the team that came out on top was Utah State. Over to King's Row was the next destination, and this is where Utah State's Cats came online as his Genji was slicing and dicing all through Colorado State. Colorado State was not able to push the payload at all before Utah State did just that to take us to series point. The momentum was squarely in the hands of Utah State as they took down Colorado State on Circuit Royale, which completed the 3-0 sweep. Colorado State winds up falling to Utah in the Mountain West Overwatch Round 2. That's what we saw last night right here on the channel. And coming up tonight, we have some more action-packed esports, college esports, for you all watching at home. 
Coming up first, right after this, we have Rocket League at 7 p.m. EST. That'll be a best of seven rounds for the ECAC, which will feature Pyro J on the commentary with Flader. After that, 8 p.m. EST, it's a best of five maps again in the ECAC conference. That will feature Sam Talks on the play-by-play and Twin Salty as the color commentator in that matchup at 8 p.m. EST. To finish out the night here, we have League of Legends at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That will be a best of three maps from the Mountain West Conference. And we will have the play-by-play is my man Jay Turbo. Good to see him. We have the color commentator as Rare Adam. And then the observer, which is Ebrom. I love to see Ebrom in the mix. So the family of Esports U casters is all dialed in and we are ready. But before we send it over to Pyro Jane Flater, let's get hype, baby. we got Boise State this weekend. As we are headed to the West for our regional event, we've got College Esports, Rocket League, Overwatch, and League of Legends tonight from the ECAC and Mountain West Conference. Woo! 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 Yeah! Get excited! Get ready! College Esports, only the best, being presented right here by Esports U. Pyro J and Flater, take it away for some ECAC Rocket League. Over to you. Well, Flater, we're going to try our best to keep up that hype from my man, Paul Lee Hype. He knows what he's talking about, and you know what you're doing. Folks, being right here for the ECAC Rocket League action this week number five. As I said, my name is Pirate Jay. I am here with Flater. Flater, we've got a good match on our hands today. Absolutely. St. Lawrence going up against Buffalo State and Pyro. You know, I've heard a lot about these teams. It's mm. going to be an absolute fun one. A best of five. Plenty of plenty of time for both of these teams to feel out what kind of strategies they're going to bring on and how to face them, how to face those counterattacks. It's going to be extremely competitive and it's going to be extremely fun Rocket League. I think, you know, we've heard about these teams and folks, I believe we have the game ready. So we're going to get there in just a moment. But we've got a team of SLU that's three and one. And over on BSU, they're undefeated four and oh. So for SLU, this is a big chance to show BSU up to say, no, no, no. We are the top dogs here in Rocket League. I get it. No one's been tough enough to take you guys down. That's because you haven't faced us. So here we go. Game number one without. Without further ado, we're on. Here we go. We're heading right on to game number one. The first five seconds, we see a lot of offensive pressure coming in from the BSU side. You know, kind of trying to pick that one up into five hole here. High gear game so far. Heading into Elmo Fingers, who's putting a shot on target. Jesco sends it right back on the other side. Opportunity for Nimui, but Gubbins is there to pick it right onto his hands we got Emui on the ball pass down center it's a pretty good pass but look Elmo with an even better clear solid start for them here most certainly but Elmo uh -oh, a little awkward on the goal line there trying to keep up with the play as Nemui wants to drop this right down oh really trying every angle around the goal line here and it's looking more and more awkward for SLU eventually play to this goal had to go in yeah, absolutely. We saw so much pressure coming in from BSU here in the early pass of that game and a 110 KPS shot coming in from Milk from the BSU side. And, you know, it's always that first goal that sets the tone mm. of how the rest of the game is going to turn out. The momentum currently in favor of BSU. Yeah, and, you know, this is fine from BSU. Their, their shots were okay. I, SLU, they just really didn't get their defense together for me, Flader. And that's going to be a continued display of just that these players may be not too warm to the engines quite yet. Not yet, but hey, Pyro, I said this before, a best of five, plenty of time to get those coils hot, get that adrenaline into your bodies and get those goals for yourself. However, as of right now, two goal lead for BSU and they're feeling pretty confident. Yeah, and I think I was just checking with production here, best of seven tonight, so even more time later even more time for these players to get set and get those four wins under their belt for this ECAC week five matchup so yeah SLU we'll see if they uh, get their defense situated it looks like they'll have a chance on offense here as Jesco no touch there it's a hard shot to the corner from Gubbins but Nemoe keen to their ways nice catch on the ground but immediately dunked here as Gubbins looking for a lane to the midsection Jesco good clear here it diffuses the effort 
Now we got Milk on the ball, putting up a simple shot on target. Gubbins is there to save it away, sends it higher back onto the midfield. Namui picks it up. A lot of boost to work with for that second dub. Jesco is there. Can he get the second one for a double? No, he can't. And the shot is missed here. The second goal still very much intact. The two goal lead is still intact here for BSU. They're trying to make it three. It is, and you know, we. They... So you have contained BSU for now to two single goals, but uh, my problem here still no registered shots. Uh, although they've spent some time in their opponent's territory here, they need to register a shot here. They need to start to pressure that defense, pressure test them, see what they're made of. This BSU squad, which is undefeated, they're going to remain undefeated if they don't face any of those shots right now, still not finding their way towards the net. Nemoe. Oh, fantastic move there with the extra flip granted. But Turks will bring it straight back down. No touch there. But SLU trying to find that pressure. And I oh. believe they've almost found it. SLU so close yet so far to that first goal. Unfortunately, it's BSU sending it right back on the other side. Hit the post and SLU have been just, have just been given another life here. Holding on to that two goal deficit. Trying to make it a one. We got Elmo on the ball. No boost to work with. Maybe a wave dash into it. Could have resulted in a goal. Unfortunately, not the world we live in. It's BSU still applying tons and tons of pressure. Oh, look at this. Jesco like Spider-Man crawling up at the top of the wall looking for that long clear. I like the communication right now from BSU. They've got that two goal cushion. So I think they're trying to work some fancy maneuvers here. They're saying, hey, I'm down long. Give it to me. Those passes just not connecting the way I think they're looking for right now. However, Nemoe, oh, if this was missed by Turks, that was an open look. But now it's the infield pass. Elmo drops it straight back down to Turks. That's a shot on target. It forces two defenders on the play. A registered save there for Milk for BSU to keep this shutout going. Oh, that was a pretty good shot coming in from Turk there. No power, it doesn't matter. He was trying to change up the pace of this game, and that is extremely important when you're getting tunnel visioned. No goals coming in for the SLU side in the last two minutes, but that also means that the defense has held strong. All we need is the offense to roll on out even further to see what they're capable of doing in these last 40 seconds. It all starts with applying pressure on the other side. And SLU, they're on the right track. Oh, they most certainly are here. Jesco awkward there towards the goal line. And oh. Elmo fingers. That was not the right place to be. Saves the shot from their own teammate. Trying to help out in that scenario by getting a bump on the defender. But it doesn't connect there. Milk looking for the pass or the shot. Neither will connect. But that offense from BSU. Oh, no, it will defuse here. Turks last ditch effort is dunked. Jesco, the dunk, the shot. It goes wide, but it will not change the result. SLU run out of time as BSU win it with just two goals. Just two goals, but it seemed like BSU had possession, had had the control, had the boost possession, they had everything for the longest periods of time. We, we see it right now, six shots coming in from the BSU side, while SLU on five, but you know, it doesn't look like it. It seems like BSU, even with six shots on target, they were the most threatening for the entire five minutes. You say the entire five minutes, and to an extent, I want to agree later, but SLU, they hadn't got those five shots until like the last 90 seconds. Like that's when the offense finally started to formulate some shots onto the Buffalo State. And so Buffalo State, yeah, for the majority of the game, weren't really feeling too pressured. They were trying to throw these cross-court clearing passes to throw out some nice yeah. plays. SLU, though, towards the end, were finally chomping at the bit, finally knocking on that door. We'll see, Flader, what it takes for them to break through, though, in the next game. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, in that last minute, we did see some flashes of brilliance coming in from the SLU side, but we need them to cross that line. We need them to cross the threshold and actually make some offensive plays that result in goals. Mm. Let's see if game number two is it. Okay, we'll find out here, folks. I'll say maybe the shots came and not the goals, but they were able to keep this uh, BSU squad to two goals that game. That's a winnable feat if you can accomplish that uh, against such a 
such a talented squad, truly, that Buffalo State University are. Uh, so, game two does, in fact, begin. This best of seven, first of four wins, is going to take the victory here tonight on ECAC Week 5. So right now, starting off here in this game, the first 30 seconds, you know, we see just a lot of back and forth between these two teams. SLU applying tons of early pressure at the start, and you like what, I mean, I like what I, like what I see here. Elmo on the ball, trying to get this past two. Fortunately, Turks will have to work twice as hard to make that happen here. Oh, a bit of a rule one there in the corner is going to result in a bit of a 2v2 going on here between the two sides. Turks. No boost to work with, but the 50 is going to oh. be going in favor of SLU. And yes, I did notice that. That was the rule one breaker. <laughs> I wonder if that's uh, part of the unwritten traditions of rule one, if you're allowed to break it like that. Yes, yeah, so we had two cars locked together, but they've been broken up. So the 3v3 is maintained. That's an interesting pinch play between Gubbins and Turks. Gets a little momentum behind the ball. Maybe amps up the play for just a tad. Suddenly, though, Nemui. Oh, looking threatening here from the corner. I think Buffalo State University, they're fine. Continuing to wrap this around the corner, depleting the resources of SLU until eventually they can strike when they're at their weakest milk. Here comes a shot off the backboard again. Turks does get a touch. Gubbins is there. The give and go goes wide. The passing option was there so close. Warming up the defense and striking when the iron is hot. That is what we have seen from BSU so far. And that is what they continue to portray us in these last two minutes as they head on right back onto the offensive sides. The pass down center over to Milk, who's not ready for the touch yet. So Jesko is going to be on the ball here. He's looking to get it past one with a 50 boost to his name. Unfortunately, it's going to be Nemui trying to get this ball rolling onto the center field opportunity for a dribble or a flake, but it seems like possession is just going to be given away to SLU. And you mentioned the giving away of possession. There's one player on the field right now who feel, oh, I feel like there's some really good touches coming out from it. it was that player right there, Jesko. That shot, unfortunately, not on target, but a lot of their approaches to the ball have been a soft first touch just to maintain a close distance behind the ball. Get an extra 50-50. Get an extra challenge on the ball so as to not give away that precious possession. Again, to SLU, look at Jesko maneuver their way through the air, offering an extra touch to Milk. Again, that shot not on target, but BSU continue to get their chances. And we are seeing a lot of confusion coming in from the BSU side, whether to control the ball, shoot it to the back of the net, or try making a two-man passing play. If they're able to get a hold of that, that goal lead could extend even further. But as of right now, SLU seem to be walking away with those defensive players. They need to work again to make it happen. But it's Jesko getting it past all three players as he goes high up in the air, gets the first, gets the 50 on the second, and it's a shot on target. I told you there was a player to watch, Flater. I called it Jesko making the magic happen. If there's ever a solo play in Rocket League that you could expect to find the night, well, there it was. And Jesko just hoping that is not the, the end of the magic tonight that the genie offered two more wishes. We will see. Still a minute 30 remaining. Unfortunately for SLU, they haven't gotten that first goal on the board quite yet. Not yet, but 90 seconds, Pyro. 90 seconds is a lot of time, especially coming in from a team that is known to shine in those last few minutes of the game. Let's find out at FL if SLU how what it takes to shine at their brightest. We got Gobbins on the ball. We're going to get it past one. The 50 is pretty good, but the second man is there to make the play. Milk takes it onto the sidewall. Opportunity for a ceiling shot denied by Turks' defense, who goes for another save, and Gobbins will need to put this one onto the sidewall. Unfortunately, BSU still cornered. BSU still trying to corner SLU, the, the SLU squad here, and Nimui with the pass is going to be doing just enough damage to put this one onto the two-goal lead. Yeah, I think SLU are feeling cornered right now. St. Lawrence University feel like they're working on reserves right now just to get to these defensive stops, just to get to these 50-50s on time. And you saw that shot from Milk just a little bit quicker. What Buffalo State are doing very well is not only these beautiful mechanical plays like we saw from Jesco, the flip resets from Milk, but also the speed 
on their play. Jesko escaping the bump opportunity on his defensive effort. Again, just displaying his extra speed on the ball. Game number two here, Pyro, you definitely need something going to game number three. Even a goal matters because you need that momentum shift, but it seems like BSU, you know, they have to, they already have down, they have written down the fate of this series. They know what they know what they want and they're aiming, they're working to reach towards it. It's a three-goal lead now here in game number two with SLU looking at no chances of scoring on the other side of the field. Mm. Love the picture you're painting there for SLU and then BSU just getting an extra goal it's like you're revisiting one of your favorite childhood books you, you know how the chapter ends but you still want to get into the drama of it you still want to see maybe what could happen what your imagination could decipher but one thing is true in this series it is that buffalo state university are the dominant team so far in this matchup and Flader, what sticks out to you about Buffalo State University? I mean, I caught out Jesco as that player to watch, but it does feel like everyone else from the team stepping up right now. And BSU, they're not just there for their individual plays. We see a lot of mechanics, sure, flying around in the air, making some powerful shots on target. That's not just what BSU is about. We see a lot of coordinated attacks coming in. They know when to rotate back. They know what are the limits of their mechanics and how they can exploit the other people's, the other opponents' limits. And BSU have been doing a wonderful job in reading the play and knowing where to be at all times. Right place, right time. Sometimes that is what it takes. And then when you look at the other side, St. Lawrence University, there were those moments where if they put the ball in the right place at the right time, magic would happen. They get that first goal in this series. I loved one of their counterattacks where they uh, opted for the outlet pass option and then had to give and go wide open to yeah. put a bang on the shot, but then the pass went wide, right? Those moments, those opportunities, they're absolutely there. We can see St. Lawrence, if they have the communication down pat, hit those shots in, they just got to connect. They just need that coordination to come through. So, like we said, long series, many chances available for St. Lawrence University. The show and to sport why they've got that 3-1 record. Game three is going to be another opportunity to do just that. There we go. Game number three, BSU currently up by two. And here, you know, if I'm being perfectly honest, in a best of seven series, if you're down by two, heading into the third game, getting that first goal can be the momentum shift that you need, can be the momentum breaker that you need here. And SLU, they're on the right track to make it happen. Turks are going to get that double top. It's just going to be followed up by Elmo, but Jess goes there for the save as he heads on right back on the offensive side. The flick doesn't come through. And it's just a bunch of 50s leading us into the blue corner. Picked up by Nemo. He's looking for a pass. A bit of an vicious one as well. Leaving BSU with a net to defend. And it seems like they won't be back in time. It's SLU getting the first goal. And Pyro, this is what this is what we were talking about. This what you wanted is to what SLU wanted. Exactly. I'm right there with you. If there was any moment that was the most important for this SLU team to show up. That was it right there. It's a quick counter, but it's also followed by some fantastic shots that they've been putting on. It feels like this team is amped up for this game. Amped up, yes, that's the word we're looking for. And it seems like aggression might be another word that needs to be added right there. Oh, too close to the second goal, unfortunately. The second man there for the save. Heading in back into the blue corner, we got an opportunity for Elmo to pick this one up, send it down center. Turk's going to be doing the exact same thing, but Jesko is on the ball. And when he goes for passes like these, it's only some worlds where you can see him being missing. You know what? I had a bad feeling that Buffalo State University, the scariest to watch them is when they're from behind. Because they know they need to score. They know that they need to commit their resources to the offensive side rather than, you know, hang on to the one or two goal leads that they've been used to. So, St. Lawrence University, yeah, a goal's fantastic, but now you're also asking more out of Buffalo State, and boy, were they able to show up there. Ooh, the ball's rolling around in the orange net here. Opportunity could be arising for SLU, granted they can pop on in and take advantage 
But unfortunately, it's Nimoy taking it onto the other side. Picked up by Elmo, getting it past two. All down to Jesco now, who's gone off the sidewall. Opportunity for a double is there. He's hit the bar. And Nimoy is going to do the exact same thing. Maybe the third man will have a different story. No, he doesn't. That is three bars hit in a row from the BSU side. I think Buffalo State University have to unglue the palm of their hand from their face there. That is just a moment where how does the ball not find the back of the net? The double tap, the follow, the second follow up. None of them hitting between the uprights and under the crossbar. So they get another chance at it with the ball around the corner. There's a light touch. Oh, making the defenders think twice about it off of the woodwork again. The ball bounces away. They can't buy a goal. Oh my god, another save, another clear coming in from the BSU side. We got Jesco on the ball here off the backboard, but Elmo, quick, takes it down center. Opportunity being picked up here by the BSU squad. Jesco on the ball, taking it down center. Opportunity for Milk, but he's, on the, he's facing the other direction. It's going to result in BSU starting back from square one. Square one it is. Gubbins. Oh boy, he was hounding that goal line, trying to find a bump, trying to find a demo, trying to get a defender out of the way, create the shot lane. Here's the connection though, intercepted nicely by Gubbins. Will he find the passer? No, he's gonna opt away from the ball. Allow SLU to continue that offensive pressure that does culminate in a goal. The lead is back for St. Lawrence. Lead us back, and this is what they wanted off the backboard. The pass connecting the shot finally going through here with a minute 40 seconds remaining. SLU are up by one. Now, here's the issue, right? That first goal that SLU scored, it felt like they awakened the beast of Buffalo State University. They rally back immediately with an answer. So, for St. Lawrence, this is great. Another lead, but you have to contain their offensive pressure. That is absolutely going to come in this final minute. This game is vital. And they have been able to work up a possession here, but oh, how quickly it can turn on them. A minute left here. See what BSU can do. Oh, that was a pretty close one. Fortunately, Namui could not make the shot on target. Opportunity for a pass down center taken away. And Turks is looking to send this one onto the back of the net. Opportunities missing here for the blue side. And of course, you know, against a team like BSU, when an insurance goal is absolutely necessary. Essel, you have to work twice as hard in order to even think about getting an insurance goal here. Oh boy, it does feel like SLU as well. Just trying to play survival mode. No, maybe they're thriving instead. A good bouncer from Elmo Fingers does get past one defender. Turks moving this across the width of the field. The pinch finding the midfield here. Good catch from Jesco. Putting a shot on target as well. Jesco will do it himself. He has done it before, he'll do it again. It's Jesco on the ball, putting a shot on target. 98 kph coming in from Jesco with 16 seconds remaining. We are all tied up here in game number three. Unreal effort, could it turn? into another goal in regulation time. Single digits on the clock now. St. Lawrence University have to kick this ball away. Elmo Fingers misses. Is there another shot taker? Jesco will not get to the ball quickly enough. It is Nemui to get a touch along with their opponent. Ball still alive. Turks has bumped into it. Ball was towards the net, but Milk gets a much needed save. Save has been made. The overtime feel has been set. Let's find out who's going to come out on top. It's going to be BSU or SLU here in game number three. Elmo Fingers. Put this down center. We got Nimoy on the, on the wall there looking to get this over to the other side. God. And prior, you know, you have to point out BSU's offense has been so resilient here. They're not just concentrated on one part of the field. They've got all the angles covered. We see them on the defense. We see them upfield as well. So it just goes to show how spread out this team can be. And you know, the caster's curse sometimes it's 
It just happens to be the case here. Nibui had the save, unfortunately, the communication being a little bit of an issue there. Finds the way and Turks gets the goal. There it is. Massive overtime goal for Turks as St. Lawrence University take a win in this series. And namely, Flater, St. Lawrence University, they hadn't scored a single goal this whole series. You're telling me they didn't just score this game. They also won it exactly the point in time for this team to wake up and battle back against Buffalo State University. I I'd say what I'm most impressed by later is the fact that SLU they had the win all the way up until 15 seconds left in the game with Jesco equalized again that should tear you down mentally that should just be devastating but look at how the players from SLU rallied back man that overtime a minute in Turks finding the double touch that's all you needed right that is all you need for every single game against BSU quick coordinated attacks you're not spending too much time on the offensive side and playing reactively is the way to go here could be listen SLU you got yourselves a win but you need three more best of seven can be long but they don't have to fully reverse sweep. That's the good news for them. Buffalo State University need to find their early series leading effort if they want to battle back and get themselves a win as well. So to game four, we will take it. St. Lawrence looking to work off of that momentum from their first win in the series. Here we go. Heading on into game number four here. Two to one being the current scoreline. SLU on the right track to make it 2-2. Just Jesco on the ball looking to get this pass down center. Elmo's there to take it away. He's at 50 on the second shot. Doesn't come through. Govins bumped away, but look at that. Turks, great position, right time to set this one up. But a few whiffs here and there does result them in setting up a bit of an offensive shot, which is cleared away from Milk. 30 seconds, a lot of back and forth here between these two teams and the opportunities are just coming knocking in. I want to see if Buffalo State University start to get their individual play openings like this one from Namui. Nice air dribble. Oh, making Elmo fingers jump right at it. Saving it away. But it does catalyze a possession. Some offense for them to work off of. Follow-up touch could be there. Turks able to knock that ball as well. Knock it away. Shot is going to rain right off the backboard there. As Nemui wants a follow. There it goes to the ceiling still as St. Lawrence University are caught up in their own third. Man, SLU struggling to get out of their own half. And, you know, you're running out of boost here. Would not want to spend much more time. Turks realizes that. Goes for the clear. But still a long way to go to get out of your own half. It's Milk putting in a shot on target. Followed up as well by Nemui. Unfortunately, could not make it accurate enough. However, this could have been it. Jesco going a little too wide there. Three minutes remaining here in this game. And we're still at a nil-nil scoreline. Love these passing play options, though. Namui wants to read Turks. It's not going to happen. No bats it to the side. Elmo fingers. It's going to go high. Out the way as well. And Milk already knew where that ball was going. Just couldn't get a significant amount of first touch there. Batted away to the side again. Namui from the corner. Could be the chance they were looking for. It will be Jesco. Bullet to the net. A bullet to the net, a bullet to the heart for the SLU side. You know, taking the first goal here was extremely crucial, but it seems like BSU have their number, and Jesco is going to go on taking that first goal. It's Jesco again and again. That is the player to beat right now. If you're St. Lawrence University, you have got to find a shotty the G that works against him, that works against them. This time it's Milk. Well, Milk putting in a shot on target and you know it was a bit of a team effort here coming in from Turks as well who redirected the ball into the back of the net. Two minutes and 40 seconds remaining here. Pyro, what are you expecting from SLU? What do they need to switch up in these last few moments to get this rolling? I really don't think they're 
playing poorly in this game. It's just they're cracking under the pressure right now. Their, their defensive rotations have got to get a little more cohesive. Uh, we've seen long-standing possessions from Buffalo State University and SLU. I mean, they just don't have an escape rope. They, they can't find a way to connect. Watch the transitions from Buffalo State University. When they transition to offense, they pass it out. They clear it out to a player that's ready to pick up the pass. But SLU, it's more individually based. And the ball stripped away from them just like that again and again. The pressure wears on until they get scored on. So we'll see. See if the communication lines up for some more cohesive transitions on their attacks offense. That one was decent. And Gubbins wants to keep it going. Yeah, two minutes left in this game here. Plenty of time for BSU to maintain this lead. While plenty of time for SLU to break this lead in half. Can they do it? Too close. But every single time not being able to make it happen to go lead though oh well when i was just talking about that two goal lead it's gonna be turned into one as gubbins is there to cut the lead in half and the current score line stands out one to two buffalo state cop play with their food a little bit there was a chip that landed right in the hands of saint lawrence and when you set it up on a silver platter you can't help but the grub away there so gubbins Elbow fingers, Turks. They're going to get their chance to stay in this game here. Still another one needed. Oh, and if that gets past Nemui, they've got a good chance at it. But there's the connections. I was looking for a great pass out to Gubbins, unfortunately. Not a whole lot of power on the touch. Mill can't get to it. What a ridiculous save, though, from Nemui. My God, what a play overall coming in from BSU. Trying to keep that defense running. Trying to keep it alive here. With only one goal difference. Coming in for BSU and the SLU squad. Can they put this one in? Not yet. But it is just half a minute remaining. So they have some time here. Gubbins <laughs> putting it in reverse just to keep it away. It lasts for now, but will it offer them a chance here? Elmo fingers denied there by Jesco. Drops back to the corner. Gubbins is going to have boost to deal with on this backboard. Is it enough? It does deny the shot, but will deny the follow. Milk up the crossbar. Jesco, where are you? Nowhere to be found on offense. Wanted to beat her back on the defense just to keep the reinforcements in line. Wasn't enough. Seems to be Nemoe with the touch that will be the last. Buffalo State University hold on to their lead and earn themselves match point match point here they go i mean looking at the effort that this team has been putting in well deserved so far six saves coming in on the bsu side slu spending so much time on the offense and even after that so many saves as well but unfortunately bsu just coming out that much more stronger and you love to face higher competition i mean slu sure it's a bit of a rough start but facing higher competition is what gets you higher in the league yeah, you know, I know we're gonna get a try and gonna try to get an interview with the the team that wins, right? I almost, you know, even if St. Lawrence do end up losing the series, which are not out of yet by any means. I kind of want to hear their perspective, you know. Is it that privilege to be able to play against an undefeated team that they're just happy to get a chance at? Or is it, you know, that they're hungry for more? I, I think this is the chance to put them on top, to bring another team to stoop down to their level, having lost only one match this season. Buffalo State University, though, still undefeated in this league. Of course, with two teams, Flater, that are so high in the standings right now they're expected to make playoffs as the top half of the league do but in terms of rankings this could be a big game that impacts that at the end of the day i think st lawrence university though they're down one to three in this series they still want a good shot at taking down buffalo state this could be it right this could be the closing nail that BSU have been looking for and they're, you know, starting us off with a bang off the post. The shot almost in. It's going to be Nemoy this. Picking this one up, sending it into the corner. Picked up by Trix. Oh my god, look at that. One corner to the other. Jessica couldn't maintain possession. 
But now he, there he is, it's Nemoy off the backboard, short opportunity for a pass, saved away by Elmo, could not save the second one, the third one, anybody of any one of these shots not making it into the back of the net, amazing defense coming in from SLU so far. Yeah, the SLU fourth man doing an especially great job. A lot of those shots off target for Buffalo State University. I mean, I get it. You know, I want all my shots to go top corner as well. But if the defenders are just sitting on the goal line, just get it under the crossbar. At some time, that is all you need. But Usegs on the scoreboard still with that lack of placement on the shot. Turks can't pick up that pass off the backboard as it's cleared by Jesco. Nemoy on the ball here looking for a pass down center. The pass is good, but the double commit is gonna get the clear once again. Turks sending it over to Elmo with an opportunity. Oh, look at that. The opportunity is there. It's Jesco on the ball, and I mean, there's nothing less that you'd expect from this man once he goes up into the air. Scary mechanics all the way through. It's so one of the simpler shots on target, and yet so fundamentally accurate. Comes out of the fundamentals at times. Truly really does for Jesco, who has refined them to a considerable state here. But it does still say more to me about the SLU defense. I mean, like you said, as good of a shot it was, as good as the aerials were, it is a bit simpler. And you want St. Lawrence University to be able to stop the few, the rare ones this game, that are on target. Unfortunately, they're just not able to put a hand up. So that resiliency. There's the defense right now for St. Lawrence University. Does need to find its way through into this game if they want to survive. Three minutes. SLU now or never. BSU one game away from finishing this one. It's Nemoy on the ball here. Elmo takes it onto the sidewall. We got plenty of boost to work with. Could not make contact yet. But the clear has been made. Nemoy. Looking to take possession, but just like that, snatched away and sending them right back onto the offense. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy! That was looking disastrous, and it certainly was for Buffalo State University. Elmo figures waiting for their time to shine. Well, there it is. Time to shine is there. The time to make that 50 go wild. Is there as well. Would you look at that. SLU bringing it right back. One all scoreline here in game number four. Once again, this is match point for BSU. All they need to do is one is win one more game in order to be the winners of this best of seven series. And it seems like Jesco, you know, he has the right idea with the 50 coming in from Turks. Denies him the opportunity to do so. Ball. Rolling around down mid, Turks picks this one up, Flick coming in from him into the top left corner, and it's Turks bringing in the heat for SLU as he goes up by one. Okay, so just every goal now from St. Lawrence is going to be a clip. Okay, sure, yeah, why, why not? Elmo Fingers, unreal double tap off the defender with the air dribble. Now it's Turks with a legendary Flick. I mean, the defense had to have their head on a swivel if they even wanted a chance at that shot well done to the offensive caliber of slu of course they've got to hope that's still enough against a buffalo state university team that feels just as explosive on offense turks here he is once again i mean this is a time to extend this lead right back and jesco has the right idea he didn't even let me finish my sentence he's like wait later I got this, okay? I see that we're down one goal. It doesn't matter. I am there with the most accurate shots. He just slides it to the bottom right corner. No big deal. And PSU have tied up the game. Yeah, Jesco's had a, a moment, I think, every game so far this series. What a player to watch. I'm more interested to the passing combination that was there, though, because I think it was Nemui with the pass towards the corner where Jesco actually turned out of the rotation away from the ball and into it for that shot. Um, I wonder if that passing call was made or if that just happened to land in the hands of Jesco. Either way, a talented player in his own regard who is going to put it past another defender. Can't flip towards it there. And Turks are now a 1v1. If they can get this touch on target, it could be lethal. Ooh. But Nemoe is going to pull it away. 
Oh, Nemo, he pulls us away and also sends it towards the blue net. Pyro, that was extremely scary, but Elmo manages to take the escape here. Sends it over to Gubbins, who's taking control for a little while, but Milk is there to take it right back. Just a lot of pinball action coming in here from both of these teams. Who comes out on top? We got Milk on the ball. Now, over to Elmo. We're going to get this pass down center. It's Nemo. -y. Jesco playing the patient game here, always scary when he does it, and it turns out to be brutal as Milk picks this one up with 20 seconds remaining, BSU up by one. I'll tell you what, if you had to put chips on one team or the other taking advantage here, it was gonna be Buffalo State. Not only with their undefeated record, but also the 11 shots they have in this game. Guess how many shots SLU have with their two goals? Two! Only two! I think that's gonna be an extra one there on that possession. Beth, guess what? They need more to stay alive in this series. They need this goal. Ooh. Milk's gonna turn it away. Govins has a chance at the ball, but Nemoe just a step quicker. Just a drive throttle more gubbins to the middle of the field milk still wants more maybe they'll get it but gubbins is under the ball and elmo fingers has the ability to dribble this out nemo he denies turks up gubbins with a tap and that ball still lofted into the air as turks looking for an option of gubbins in the midfield no it's turned away now by milk who can't get the boost but it's still colliding along the cars milk to the goal line and eventually to the ground buffalo State University continue their undefeated record. The undefeated record 5 0 here for a BSU. And, you know, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, Pyro Chesco, the man of the match. 510 points to his name, not because of all the mechanics, but because of this guy's positioning. He waited ever so patiently for the ball to come to him. He flew with it. He got the pass down center. He got the shot on target. And most importantly, he got the series win. They most certainly did. Yeah, Buffalo State University. I mean, Jesco, definitely a highlight candidate. You got to call out these teammates as well, though, that still made their chances count. Memoe and Milk, when they needed to be there, I feel like they truly were. So this is a well-rounded team. And, and Flater, I feel like that's what it takes to be successful in ECAC right now. Because, yeah, sure, the other players uh, got their moments as well. We saw that. Beautiful air dribble from Elmo Fingers. We saw a really nice flick from Turks. But you know what else we saw that game later? Plenty of double commits. Some lack of communications from St. Lawrence University. That stuff has to get sort of tied up, those loose ends, before they want to meet the caliber of Buffalo State. Man, BSU, Pyro. Once again, I have to point out the, the communication, the skill, everything. It was it was perfect. It was a beautiful coordinated attack coming in from BSU overall on the offensive side. And SLU, you know, you, when they pulled back that one game, it really did seem like we are here in a, for a bit of a comeback there. Unfortunately, could not pull it all the way through. But props to SLU for a wonderful performance of us, however. Yeah, both teams, congratulations on a solid effort there. But of course, Buffalo State University, congrats on your win. Now 5-0, and oh, an incredible job and well earned of course folks we're not quite done with the action here for esports you for ecac and all combined ecac continues with a week five overwatch two matchup that's between the university of albany and the university of north carolina greensboro casted by sam tox and twin salty so definitely not a match you folks are going to want to miss out on that's colton in the background doing everything that needs to be done shout out to you my man my co-caster flader doing an incredible job myself pyro j folks we'll see you next time of every week. And number two, wow, Seth Rollins really only wears one thing when he's not on the clock. And it's, I, I can't even defend myself, it's a comfortable outfit. Anyway, without further ado, let's jump into week number four and see what these players brought to the table to beat out their opponents and be victorious. 
Wake Forest was already up a game. There were four minutes left on the clock, and they just couldn't find that first point to take the lead and put them up 2-0 in the series. But in a final moment of success, Malone clears it from one coast to another and finds an open goal, giving Wake Forest the lead once again. These champ three and champ two is doing. I mean, seriously, look at Malone making advantages for himself. He wow. And he will put Wake Forest on the map. This game number five could just go their, their way. I just want to say Malone just said, I'm going to show you what a champ three can do. All right, buddy. On a control map in Overwatch, your team must capture 100% of a point to succeed. 99 just won't cut it. King Rock from Keene University was fully aware of that and didn't just find a death blossom. He found a full-blown death garden to keep his team alive. Sound barrier to go away as well, especially now that you have your own. It's going to be a little bit more breathing room because it looks like the one Okay, there we are. Now it's coming up big. This Reaper has bloomed. That was just gorgeous amount of patience. Coming. GVSU Blue found themselves up by five rounds, and it's always better to turn that five into a six. It's incredible, however, that this team doesn't always need all five. It can come down to just one player and how much they can really GVS do. An illusion delivers with efficiency. Three in a row, no time left, even if they had the chance at Orbital Strike out of the last it. This battle between Muskingum and St. Francis was insanely close. Only three players in a round, and there were one player left on both sides, both down to their final stock. Things were looking pretty strong for St. Francis, their Luigi only at 40%, but it was up to Splat to do anything but. There. Just keep him, keep, keep him off stage with that Zare. Oh! If that That's ball right here for Teo. If that block didn't, uh, if that block didn't disappear, I'm oh! No way! Oh! Just steps on the How steps on the on. pressure plate. A tale as old as time, Pace White versus Pace Gold, and Pace White's morale was through the roof as they won a fight. But little did they know, this was Lofi's world, and they wouldn't be living in it for much longer. Going in with the blade. Uh oh, oh, blade is out. Oh. It's hacked. It doesn't matter though. Slashes oh. away for two, looking for a third, oh. looking for four. Won't get it just yet on the blade. However, the slashing dash works out. Lofi's got three, looking for everybody else oh, on this team. Four. It's a white. The Inkling versus Ganondorf matchup is not very good for Ganondorf, but let's be honest, which matchups are? In this clip, we're going to be watching as JD from Fisher learns the hard way that you never really want to meet an Inkling off stage. Sooner, if you don't find that kill confirm or that kill or a bomb off stage like that, that bomb angle is so good today. Yeah, that bomb angle was beautiful. Week four of ECAC Rocket League was absolutely insane. CMU and FC were tied up zero to zero, but it was Gand who told FC. They shall not pass game number two. Side of FC, they've only got one player for a moment there. They're trying to recollect. They're trying to reposition. But how do you position around a pinpoint accurate shot like this? Gand goes crossbar down for the first goal. Adams in reverse. Backs the defense off with that. Whenever I'm on the mic for Valorant, you'll often hear the line, check your corners, repeated over and over and over again. And even with me not on the mic to tell them, I have a feeling this team may have learned that lesson. Nah, he's, he's gotta take the shot. Take it. Oh yeah, just... Sounds of teammates running on through, oh. and come on, dive! The 4K on a completely unaware trio, and it's 11 nothing right now. And those are the top eight moments we thought deserved just a little bit more time in the spotlight of week number four here at ECAC. Thank you all so much for watching. If you're interested in what ECAC has going on, we got something happening nearly every day of the week. So check us out right here. Editor, that's a challenge for you. Wink, wink. And folks, this has been all for me. Thank you all so much for watching. Enjoy this, and we've got plenty of weeks down the line. Can't wait to see what comes of them.
https colon slash slash twitter.com slash septolens. Don't put that in. I'll get in trouble. So that's that's worth it. That's worth it. Did I get too close to the camera on that one? A little bit too close. Should I should I oh should I back up a little bit? Okay, sorry about that. My bad. I've been awake for probably close to 32 hours. Like I have to like hold my keyboard like the normal way. Because if I do it, I feel like I have arthritis if I hold my keyboard like that. It blows my mind. I can never do that. Like this kid, this guy right here, he's got his keyboard like off at an angle. His isn't that extreme. There's a kid all the way down to the far end who has his keyboard all the way at like a horizontal. Yeah. That's really cool. They're gonna be at that table right over there. Public information? Oh, I don't know. But <laughs> this isn't live, so it doesn't matter. It's not live, but like you and I know. Yeah, we know. I'm not gonna tweet it. Awesome. What game do you play? Smash Bros. Who do you play? Is it embarrassing? Is it like Villager? Yeah. <laughs> is it Villager? Am I spot on? No, not oh not my god. Is it the Ice Climbers? No. Is it Game and Watch? No. Is it Pichu? No. Is it Wario? No. I can keep going. I think yeah, I can no name worries. every character in the game. I believe in you. Is it, did I say the Ice Climbers already? Yeah, you said them. Is no, it them? them? Is it them a second time? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, oh, is it one of the Lynx? Yes, it is. Is it Toon Link? It is. Oh, that is pretty embarrassing. Is that is rough. Who do you play? I'll give you $20 if you guess correctly right now. First try? First try. Give me a single hint. It's an obscure character. An obscure character. Not played very often. Is it We Fit Trainer? <laughs> oh my god! Oh my. I'm the interviewer for a reason, baby. I do what I do. I don't need the money. I appreciate it, though. I appreciate it. Hi. So Bowser Jr., We Fit, and I... <laughs> I forgot already. <laughs> Are you all lying to me? Am I being gaslit? No, 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 Bowser no, no, Jr., We Fit, up. and you told me already. Oh, uh, Toon Link. Yep. Where's my main support at? Bye. Who are we playing this weekend? Uh, a lot of Brig. A lot of Brig, really? Brig Lucio, probably. Brig Lucio, really? I shouldn't say that too loud. I don't want to give all your strategies. It's over under. What do you mean over under? Like, like, do we think we're going to podium? Do we think we're going to come in last place? Not last place. Not last place. Certainly not last what place. What about like fifth place? That's doable. Is that's doable? That's, that's winnable? Third place? There, there, mm, that's where that's where things get dicey. Place, that's very doable. Okay. First place. That's very doable. First place, very doable. Love it. That's the mindset. That's what he loves to hear. Yeah. Oh my God. Hold on. Cut the cameras. Well, who are you? Hello. Oh, that's Sarah. oh my God. I saw you earlier. I saw the back of your shirt. And I was like, I was like, I know that name. I know him. It's a quick play game. They they Q snipe each other at land. I thought it was a scrim. It's just unlucky. Are you actually a villager player? Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about villager being notably worse in Smash Ultimate than they were in Smash 4? Uh, I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know? You never played Smash 4? No. Oh, that's all right. Nobody, nobody's gonna hold that against you. Now, who do you play? I play Robin. Okay, wow. Did you know Robin has the lowest pick rate in the game? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Come on, the LEDs, it looks just like Samus. Huh? Do you disagree? I guess I can see. The Samus vibe. Show the controller to the camera. We're interviewing. This is recording, by the way. Surprise. Not my controller. Who do you play? I play Peach. We're at the Collegiate Esports Commissioner's Cup. Let's make some noise. Oh, and it's going to be jumped into it. It's going to judge. It's going to throw one, two, ten. He needs more. In the They're doing even more here. You've got to touch the point. Mr. College walks it in. Toy Boy is going to drop. Knife him. Right out front. Yeah. Three, oh, two, one. Running. Running. It is time for some more ECAC Overwatch 2. My name is Sam Tongs. Joining me, the ever-amazing Jesse Twin Salty. And now for our matchup today, we have the University of Albany going up against UNC Greensboro Genesis. This is Division B. So, so I mean, Jesse, we have so much to look forward to here. I would say we're going to see a lot more wacky comps tonight because we are in that, you know, diamond to plat division. These are not obviously, you know, GMs where they're going to be, you know, ridiculous and everything. But I think it does allow for a little more creativity in these compositions, more little more comfort picks. They're not going to be going straight meta all the time like we see all the time in the top divisions where it's like, okay, if we don't run meta, you're kind of screwing yourself yeah. here. You got a little bit more room to play with. And I think that's what's going to be most exciting about what's happening here and these coming out, you know, with these divisions, with these tiers. It mostly goes to what the players and the teams themselves feel most comfortable playing on and what they think that they can get the most usage out of, whether or not that is the meta. And the other exciting part about this too, you know, no contenders, no Overwatch League. So yeah. the meta is really kind of in that 
that that shape where you don't really know what it's going to be just yet. You have inklings, but there's no pro play to really confirm those biases. But our first map of the evening, and it's all going to be starting off on Oasis. And I think a really great way for our two teams to warm up, to prepare, and to poke and prod and figure it out. And you're right, Jesse, look at this. The wackiness is already ensuing. Yeah, we have the Rhine coming out from Albany, which grants we've seen the Rhine a little bit more as of late with those buffs going in. But you still, you got to be a little cautious when you play him. Because if your shield is broke, you are still just a sitting duck. Greensboro running more of a dive with light though on the ash still with no damage boost with now attack moons going over to that character for that short term uh invulnerability it's all going to be about what can we get out of this Kiriko? What can we get out of our support? Salt has the potential here, though, to really turn things back around with that anti-nade. Already on the high ground, Greensboro. That's the advantage that you get with Naderade on this D.Va. They can go back and forth, really put the pressure in from the high ground. The control point is about to unlock. There it is. Albany going to be the one sitting on top of it. Nick Dick being dangerously low, but you can see Zeta has to be that Reinhardt to get in their face. It becomes a lot more difficult, though, when you lose your shield. You're forced to play around the pillar. And for these two teams right now jesse is all just about the poke really no kills converting except for magic's got dangerously close and just pick the med pack just in time but there we have it the picks are coming in greensboro's patience is paying off especially with them gaining the high ground control right away albany were kind of just sitting right underneath like okay they have to wait for greensboro to drop or to make a mistake that's a Moran Greensboro. No mistakes to be had. They just jumped down and finished off a few. Zeta already going to be going off of the Reinhardt. Going over to the Ramacha, which I don't mind it. I still don't think it's the best counter pick here, but I think it could definitely still work. Now going over to this double hit scan look as well to try and play from a longer range. It tells us about what... I guess Naderade on this D.Va is able to do against this Ramatra. Getting into their face and getting out at a moment's notice. You don't really have to do that brawl type composition that Ramatras are good at. We're having this duel between the Cowboy and the Ninja. And it turns out Ninja's Jerkins just a little bit more powerful than the Six Piece. Backing away now and without their Cassidy, Albany is really kind of just at a standstill. They don't know how they want to really go at this. At this point, Ozana tries to go in. They just get pounded down. They have to use most of the block in the Nemesis form instead of using the Pummel just to make sure they can stay alive. Oh my gosh, and Greensboro is still... Uh, four ultimates. Self-destruct blade. Bob is already going to be expended in of course. Oh, right up in the air! Nick was enjoying us some high time, and Magic saw that as a perfect opportunity to take away their life, and so indeed they do. But in through all of this, did you see the power of that anti-nade from Salt? Completely put Greensboro on the back foot, and Albany now finally in control of the point, but took... 66% before they were able to get there. And you could argue Greensboro could have gone a little bit longer if Naderay decided to drop, but instead they're just going to escort Shadow Wolf away. And the Bionade is huge that time from Albany. No cleanse coming through from Attack Moon, but now they try and regain that high ground control. Oh, and it's already starting off insane as Magic's Bob's the Dragon Blade, and this dragon is roaring. Has already gotten two of the DPS, both of the DPS for Albany. Really, no one left here to fight. You have to hope that Zeta can do something with his Annihilation, but really, even if they do, the entire team is dead, and there's a self-destruct coming through. And Boom. this is just going all sorts of wrong for Greensboro. You try and use the I mean, for Albany, sorry. You know, Nick tries to use the Deadeye early on, and most of it gets deflected right back at him by Magix. They're able to finish up with the strike right after. They do only have the Katsuni Wrestler going into this fight. Volkson, gotta have this Bob get a lot of value just to touch that point and to build that Coalescence up, or just to try and get that neutral pick. You're gonna have to hope for something here. Volkson is gonna have a lot of pressure on them to get the most effectiveness out of this Bob, electing to do it right when Attack Moons pops the Kitsune Rush. Couple of headshots here, but for the moment, it seems like respect the Bob, just hide around the pillars. Don't give that Bob an opportunity to get any effectiveness out of it. Shadow Wolf does commit the immortality field. Nick is gonna take that out almost immediately. Still, it's looking like Albany on the back foot once more. Volkson, a clean headshot. Lops it right off between Light's face. Still though, at this point, you're gonna be immediately dove upon by Naderade, turning their attention back around. You get rid of the support. Only one that's left is Zeta inside of this overtime, and they're not gonna last for too much longer. This is gonna go all into favor of Greensboro. A perfect execution on how to control the high ground here over on Oasis Gardens. 
this was just great from the middle. Light oh had the time of their lives up there. They were just chilling. Same with Shadow Wolf. Naderade was there always for the peel. And Magix was constantly flanking the back line. And Albany just not have the peel from their tank with them being so stationary. It allowed Greensboro just to extend a lot of these plays out. And now going over to City Center. If Albany cannot make the adjustments needed, it's going to be the same thing over and over again. Yeah, and to talk a little bit about these two teams, about what they've been going through so far in this season, Albany is sitting at that 2-2. Greensboro is the 1-3, Jesse. They're the kind of the underdogs right now. And so to be able to stand up against Albany like this, an impressive showing from them. I will say UNC has definitely had a harder schedule. Yes, you know, they they have. lost to Ole Miss Red, who's 3-1. and one. They got swept by uh, UKY, who's 3-1. and one. But them going out here and having this great of a showing against a pretty decent Albany B squad is a great way to at least start off the map I mean, start off the map and start off the series. You can really think about it that Greensboro has been forged through the fire and flames and if they've, they've been through all of this, this is the chance to really show off what they are made of. If you're able to stand toe to toe with some of the best, you know, and continue to go throughout this league without nary a care in the world, that just really goes to show the power that you have as a team. That's a great way to start things off though for Albany Volkson blasting away this cowboy feeling very good about what they've just been able to accomplish here greensboro still has that potential to stall things out here and i think you know this is a this is the first time in a long time i've actually seen zarya zeta feeling confident maybe might be able to get something a little bit more out of it than what we've been seeing obviously able to go through the defense matrix of naderade the immortality field does have to be used make sure that they stay alive they do get the healing necessary to keep them going and actually greensboro where they had that initial loss has managed to right the ship and still show Albany that this is a team that you have to watch out for, that we are a composition that you really do have to watch out for here. And they just keep stalling and stalling. Now they're able to get a few picks to go their way as well. What a nice comeback there from Greensboro. I think where Albany went wrong, you get high ground control early and they just drop. They just drop out of nowhere. Like, why not try and use it? to your advantage especially with nick on the soge it's i don't know it's a little bit of a confusing pick i get it they wanted to try and confirm a few of those eliminations but the game all that time just didn't work out and here it's even getting worse for albany greensboro three ultimates online that kitsune rush and the combination of the dragon blade could continue to solve things out further and you can see that magics is setting themselves up hoping that nobody detects them and that they're going to get away with another gigantic dragon blade. No one. I think they I think they may have been found out. And if they haven't before, they definitely have been now. But they're kind of ignoring him. Nick, inside of this overclock, takes out the immortality field. But they're keeping an eye on Magix. Trying to draw this out. And beautiful for Magix to distract Nick inside of this overclock to where they don't really get anything out of it. We're going to get the Kitsune Rush. And we're going to have Salts popping the beat to try and counter against that. The... Self-destruct also goes through, but still so far holding on to this Dragon Blade. We're waiting. We know that this could be the perfect opportunity here for Magic to use it. Just has chosen not to. There it is. It's been bumped. What's going to be happening here? It's going to be Volks in the first one looking towards Nick. And so far, you're slicing off all of the heads. That's what we were looking for, Jesse. You, it was just the slightest little movement from him when we were spectating him when the Kitsune drop his. And Salt was like, I need to pop all. And at that point, you could tell he's like, yes, just do it. Because you just play the long game at that point. You send the self-destruct in, you get him split up. And yes, you can't use it with the Kitsune Rush. Probably how you want it to be. You draw out so many resources from Albany, they're able to confirm the kills. We're about to have some high ground action up here. Who's going, oh my gosh, Naderade ate the Graviton Surge. But still, folks, who was able to find one kill inside of that Deadeye. But what is all they're going to get before traded out by Magix? who's turning their attention almost immediately to the second target of Sneewee. Now the third, Nick goes down. This Magic's just dismantling Albany piece by piece. Magic's, oh, oh my, my word. This is just disgusting oh my word. from them. They are all over the place. The back line of Albany cannot live for more than a few seconds with the way they're playing right now. At this point, Albany, use Kitsune Rush to at least try and get in. But at that point, you just got to hope you can find those picks you crucially need. All right, here it is, the Kitsune Rush. Albany needs to make sure they get something out of it, but it's already going downhill almost immediately. Light is also a force to be reckoned with, and now Magic's doing their thing. It's all about Magic's on this Genji. Another one! They dash right on the salts, take them out! They're just turning their attention back over. They're unstoppable. Jesse, I think that's a pure 
term for what just happened here from Greensboro. Unstoppable. Two to zero on Oasis. Ridiculous from Greensboro. And again, this is not a composition you would think would work extremely well, but man are they making it work and this goes to the flexibility we were talking about you can see a lot more different looks in this lower division purely because you know we can see the genjis come out you know who are been waiting for this for a long time genji's not a horrible spot right now to be honest like he's in a spot where he can be countered if you work at it yeah. a certain way but if you don't counter him and he's popping off like that he can be extremely dangerous and now you we're going to midtown for round two which i think could definitely we're seeing a lot more genji i think especially I th I think with the so very dive heavy in second phase magics could be all over the place i'm more curious of what side they're going to want to pick over on midtown this could get a little dangerous though for albany if they don't make some swaps pretty quick i agree albany you see that they were having the ideas in their head how do we stand up to this diva let's try zarya let's see what zarya can do but then there was the genji the genji yeah. magics it was just and we saw it in that play of the game. It was it, it wasn't even just like dragon. It wasn't even a dragon blade play of the game. No, he was just throwing shurikens and getting kills. Like it, it, it just goes to show you right now what this meta is like. And I love it so much. We're in that flux right now where nothing is set in stone, where everything is all out in the open, and you're having these counter picks. We're we're playing the game of Overwatch, Jesse. We're playing yeah. Overwatch at its finest at its like at its peak in my opinion and that's what makes these off seasons from al from contenders from open division so much fun even though you know there is a few leaked scrims around from a certain uh la based team that have been kind of scrolling and you know teams have been you know looking at it to a degree of like what the meta would be i i some teams have slowly started moving that way anyway with a lot of the ball comps tracers slowly crept in which again is a curiosity when we're seeing the Genji as much. It just seems like Magic's more comfortable on it. So I want to see Albany maybe show off the Winston here. It counters out the yes. Genji a little bit more. And I think it, to a degree, it helps with the <laughs> counter dive when the Diva wants to go in. They're currently, oh. though, teasing the Rhine on the defense. No swaps, I believe, for either side. Volkson will continue on the Cassidy. And at least for now, Greensboro not wanting to go the Genji. Obviously, that could change. So Albany trying to play more long range with Zeta in the middle. And at least if they stick to what they are right now, their shield may not live for too much longer. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you, Jesse. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. That that Zeta shield is going to be like paper to what Greensboro has for us right now. They're going to have to contend with, first of all, Naderate on the Orisa. That long range poke damage is going to be a massacre on them. Then you throw in Magic's Sojourn. Then you throw in Lights. Junkrat it is just going all downhill from here. What I'm also going to be curious about is attack moons. How are they going to use that anti-nade? Because we know the power of this anti-nade in this meta. And for Albany, I like what they have. Oh. Uh, Ooh. I feel a lot might be swapping. Uh, well, we'll, we'll see. Uh, this, that, that's not the star you definitely want to the map. No, they're actually just standing on. Um, I would say the only thing with the bio nade from attack moons is that they don't have cleanse. And Siniwi yes. does. So that could change the impact of it just a little bit. The only thing that concerns me, though, with Albany's setup on the support lines is no Lucio with this Reinhardt. Oh, but gee, but listen, look at that. There it is, the anti-nades. It was beautiful. And Sneewee wasn't there in time to be able to throw out the cleansing Suzu, the protection Suzu. And so with Zeta all by themselves, quite literally was free real estate. It's Naderade to push forward once more, getting kill after kill. And this is going to be point A for Greensboro. Just a one little extension like that. And as you said, the speed is the difference there. It can't speed out. Greensboro speeds on in. And there's only so much Zeta is able to do at that point. You know, three people surrounding you. You got grenades coming in from light. It is not going to be a fun time at the office. They go over to the Orisa themselves. Just try and match the Orisa 1v1. A little bit more of a you know, denial on that aggression as well with the Javelin. I like it. I like and I like what Albany is doing. They're trying to adjust to what Greensboro has been throwing at them. Magic's a fully charged railgun shot, but for Albany, they get to live with their heads intact for now at the very least, but uh, not not with light blowing them all up. Starting a kill on Devolkson. Higher control though, still very much in favor of Albany, at least so far. There it is. Beautiful. It's back and forth though. Now Albany has lost their tank once more. 
with that, the sustainability and the presence that comes along with it. It's about to see the payload go through underneath. On the flip side, though, Greensboro has just lost their tank, and it's a lot longer of a walk back. Yeah, just a little bit. And Light is stuck in a very awkward spot right now. I already know exactly where they are on the Great Dane, just waiting to pounce on the Junkrat if they don't move. Well, Storm Arrows oh, no. will try and do the job. And wow, oh, they don't get oh. out. Hulkson's able to snipe them away just beforehand, but this fight will be a big one. I expect both teams to use a lot of ultimates at their disposal. Nyx probably used initially here just to create some space. Beautiful. Well, maybe not even needed. If you just able to land headshots like that, Magix has got to step up their game. I wouldn't be surprised if we might see them go back onto the Genji to try and put on, apply pressure onto Nick. But Albany has a treasure trove, quite literally, of ultimates on their side. Greensboro, not as fortunate, but working their way towards it. We do have the beat from Shadow Wolf to try and stall things out if need be. But really, I'm going to be expecting Nick to have to just pop the dragons right here while they're on the stairs. This could be huge. It is huge. It gets two Magics and Shadow Wolf. Now, attack Wolf. Attack Moon. Sorry. There's no one there with them. And so what happens? Nick. Nick is an archer. Oh, my God. Nick is it's like, okay, just we need to slowly bring this back. And hey, why even use ults when you can just hit the shots? And almost a team kill for them if they were able to pick off Naderade. But that's the initial fight you need. Just deny more time. That card has now re-entered the beginning of that tunnel where it's so difficult to get through. And now Greensboro needs to win at least two more fights. To try and at least get it all the way through over there at the Midtown Tunnel. Light has that rip tire, and this could potentially be an opening for Greensboro. They're definitely struggling so far on Midtown. That payload has now gone back under the bridge, but in the wrong direction from where Greensboro wants it. Albany, perfect ultimate discipline. Only needed the one Dragon Strike in order to win out in that fight. Now we're going to see Greensboro making their way up towards the high ground. They need to get Albany out of here. They need to be able to take this back. Here comes the Terra Surge, but no one to fall from that. Zeta inside of the anti nade and that's what we were talking about. That is Light using that Rip Tire. Now Naderade to go on a tear. Another kill for them. Really, just got to make sure you pick up the Stragglers, but Greensboro is able to make a precious time here. Zeta gets a, I don't know how to say, I don't want to say greedy, but I think a little ambitious to play up there. It's like, yes, it is a perfect spot for you to use the ult, but they just get burned. They get burned down immediately. They can't get it off. Ooh. Nick's just not missing, man. This is just ridiculous at this point. <gasps> Ooh, okay. Light has... If I was Light, I think I'd be one more Hanzo headshot from breaking my keyboard now. That has yeah. been... Yeah, it's just unbelievable what's been happening. So Magic's... The overclock is now in their pocket just waiting for a good opportunity and a moment to be able to use this it's going to be a little bit more difficult especially inside of that dead eye but volkson doesn't even need no single dead eye they do the damage that comes through from the immortality field takes out shadow wolf greensboro on the back foot once more we have a minute and 15 seconds greensboro there uh, we, we can definitely feel the pressure on them right now albany is just making sure it's taking greensboro an extremely long time just to set up these fights you know They've been getting ready to set up for 30, 40 seconds. They're going to have to wait a little bit longer as Light's taken out yet again. They have not even had to use Kitsune Rush, and they've already got that Dragon Strike back online. Albany, Nick. This is a this is a, definitely a Hanzo who knows what they're doing. This is the perfect area for them to use that Dragon Strike as well. Tight corridors, but it goes back down onto the ground. Zeta isolated once more, and Magic's popping off inside of the Overclock. Make that one, make that two. Not able to get any more than that, but really at this point, you've done all you can, and you're gonna continue to do even more than that. Now you're just hunting down the Stragglers. Magic's is up. Magic's is, Magic's is angry, and you can feel it. Stuck well, though. Yeah, stun, it will be taken out, but hey, second phase complete, add a little time left. And, you know, they get the nano there as well. So those shots don't even need to be fully charged to fully take somebody out. They will be able to get a few of these staggers as well as Anna should be able to get out and set up on this corner. But I would say a pretty decent defense there for Albany during second phase. You draw a lot of time out and Greensboro, not a lot of time to play with here. Banking on this Terra Surge or at least try and open it up for Light to get their own. I mean, with only a minute for Greensboro, Albany did a really good job there. And they're... 
They got all five ultimates on board. Here comes the dragons. Naderated just the right spot, but gets drawn right back in thanks to Zeta's Terra Surge. And that is everything they needed and then some. Only needed to commit two ultimates, went out in that team fight. Push Greensboro back away. Now it's less than 60 seconds on the clock. The pressure is on Jesse. Greensboro have to try and set something up. The question is, do you wait for the nano visor at this point? You could if you wanted to. It is definitely a bit of a risk, though. I would say they use visor here, maybe match it up with Terra Surge, and save that nano either for Naderay just to keep him up later on, or put it on the magic shit again. Oh, I'm looking where Volkson is. They have that dead eye. They're waiting for Greensboro to push forward just that little bit more, and then try to get as much out of it as they can. There it is, the high noon. But the Immortality Field keeps him alive for a little bit longer. The Terra Surge that Naderade was so far pushed forward to, no one could support them because of the Deadeye zoning by Volsin. Oh, now we have the Kitsune Rush. Sneewee. It's going to try and be this tactical visor with the Nano Boost. It comes in. Light is trying to hold off for dear life. Push forward against Zeta, but the Javelin spin is going to keep them alive for even longer. Now inside of this overclock, Magix is pushing forward, trying to push through the defenses of Albany, and it seems like they are going to be able to. Zeta now inside of this Nano Boost, but while this is happening, their entire backline is being destroyed by Magix. Magix fears nobody. They are just tearing it up in the back. The Diva now in line from Naderay just to try and stall this out a little bit longer. No ults for Greensboro. Albany will only have this Terra Surge, which could even just deny people contesting on this card. It's in overtime. Neither of these teams have an ultimate until Zeta gets their Terra Surge. And so Zeta, you really got to make sure this Terra Surge counts. The boldness is going to be there. The immortality field. But now it's also going to be the anti-nade. So we're back and forth. But no one was able to touch? No one was able to touch? Uh, yep. That's unfortunate. That hurts. Um, I think it's purely because, you know, I said it right beforehand. I didn't think it would go that way. Um, but Terra Surge can sometimes just be used as a zoning alt. And that time it was, hey, you know, Albany and Zeta goes in, uses the Terra Surge. They pay their life for it. But everybody's too busy, you know, trying to run out of the Terra Surge radius. Nobody thinks about, hey, you may have to run towards the Albany <laughs> yeah. backline so somebody is touching. And because of how long the overtime timer was going, I think it was almost a minute at that point. That uh, overtime was triggered. That timer just goes out just like that. Yeah, like a candle in the middle of a hurricane, Jesse, really is snuffed out almost immediately. Now, Albany, we really saw them come online in that last round. A really good performance versus what we saw on Oasis. Not that Oasis wasn't bad necessarily, but it was just Midtown is so much better. And we really got to talk about it. I think it really came down to what Nick was doing. And then also a little bit more cognizance of working together as a team, using ultimates appropriately. Greensboro, though, they have to make sure that Albany is not able to get to that 91.28 meters. Albany does not need to make it all the way. They just need to make it there. It's at least that easy, okay? Like, we don't have to finish this map. This is already a tricky map to finish. So you, you one less fight you need to completely win here for Albany, but basically, you gotta just complete the map. They're sticking to basically what they ran, and why not? When Nick's hitting the shots like they are, try and play the range game. Nader will try and deny it with the shield, but it'll be more shield break from Nick to try and open up that value. Yeah, th at the very least for Naderade, they can have that poke that you get from Sigma, but that shield is, <laughs> you know, we talked about how Reinhardt's shield is paper. Naderade's is just that little bit more. St okay, Magics. Beautiful, beautiful as always. Hit with the Javelin Spear back into the train, but it doesn't really matter. You, 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 you've done your job, and now they're continuing to go on forward. Zeta's going to be feeling their full fury now. This could be a rough spot for Albany as they either have to commit and just speed over to point. Well, I think that's the direction they're going to or try and take high ground through train. But seeing that Nick now over on the Symmetra, they should be just teleporting straight over to point to try and, you know, not deal with the constant pressure of going through choke. Yeah, just get over there as quick as you can. Here it is, the TP. Doesn't look like, it only looks like Nick was able to get through there and is all by themselves now. Not the situation you want to be in as a Symmetra where the rest of your team are still waiting to try and get there. Hit with the accretion rock. That was the Nader raid going up against Nick. Here's another fantastic anti-nade. Is it going to end now if it's his in Magix's hand? Well, I wouldn't expect anything different than that. Okay, the overclock. No, okay, there it is. There it is. Volkson now down. 
and Sneemi to use that Kitsune Rush. But I'm going to be honest, Jesse, I don't know about that one. I I don't mind it. But if you felt like it's still winnable. You know, Zeta is still there with Salt, so they could, they could stall long enough, open this up, and they're at least able to get one. I, if they weren't anti there, Salt could have thrown the Nano, and I think this fight would have been different, but instead, <gasps> Wait. they... What in the Wait. world? This is actually going back at home in his favor. Wait a minute. Yeah, it, it, it looks like it might actually be possible here. They're going to have full control of the site, of the point. They still have to wait for everyone to get in there. But you really got to keep an eye on light. This inside of this tactical visor, this nano visor. Oh my gosh. It's a light show is what this is right now. It got three kills. Zeta's not there to eat any of it with the javelin spin. They were the last one to die. They're not there to protect their team. And I will give credit to Salt. They almost hit the sleep, but almost not going to be close enough this time. And, and what a comeback there from Greensboro Light. They've had, I would say, a quieter map overall, especially on their offense. But this time around, saving the team and not putting Albany in a really tough spot. But they do have four ultimates to work with, so still a little bit of wiggle room. A lot of wiggle room, and they need to be wiggling. They need to be, they need to be jumping, is what they need to do, because it's a minute left on the clock. Albany needs to step up here and prevent Greensboro from taking another win, because a win here means that going into the next match, it'll be match point. The photon barrier from Nick to give them that little bit extra defense to get onto site. Naderate is not wasting any time. Is just gonna try and get rid of Volkson while they're in that dead eye, and I think that they were actually successful even through all of this. Shadow Wolf's beat that went down is not going to save them from the efforts of Zeta. They're still taking a massive amount of damage, and they've used the Terror Surge now. Really, you have to hope that with this Nano, they can do something here. But with Naderade now hitting that Gravitic Flux, Volkson is gonna be feeling the full power of gravity, and Greensboro holds against all of the ultimates of Albany. That accretion from Naderade saves them, I think, this point. Because Volkson thought they were safe behind the Photon Barrier, but they're not. It just goes away as that accretion goes through, and their whole plane just unravels in front of them. Oh, boy. All right. You have to go over to the ball. Magix is going to make sure this does end now. It has to end now here in overtime. But so far, none of the shots have been able to connect. Nick, unfortunately for them, has been a little quiet this go around. Zeta is not rolling anywhere any longer. And you can see that the kill feed is lighting up all for Greensboro. Taking Midtown 2-0 to zero now in that scoreline. Man, Albany's going to be kicking themselves at that because they were so close of able to capture first point. I think at that point, maybe slowly goes back into their favor. You know, Nick had a great defense. You know, the Dragon Strike here, they're able to light up the shots for two more. Nick just couldn't reciprocate and re replicate that same response and that same kind of output over on the offense. And he was a lot of the reason why they held there for as long as they did. So the fact that he was not as hot as he was, I think, hurt them a little. But yeah, that accretion near the end. Oh, my goodness. You can tell Volkswagen was like, man, I'm fine. You know, I'm chilling. And he, if he does have that photon bear for another second. I think he at least gets two picks. But the fact that it goes away, the accretion hits legit as the wall is fading away. And at that point, you know, the Sigma able to stay alive. They build a Gravitic Flux. They pick off a few with that. And it just, you can tell Albany is just like, man, what more can we try and do to win this? Because Greensboro just had the answer every time. They had the answer almost every single time. Overwatch, really, when it comes down to it, at those moments... It, it, sometimes a timing game. It, it really is. Yeah. Sometimes the timing just works out so perfectly in your favor. It was chef's kiss. And once again, Greensboro showing that, that, uh, showing that they are a team to be reckoned with. And I mean, going on to our next map, potentially what could be the final one here? Albany staring down the sights of defeat. And for Greensboro, staring at a potential another victory that they can put into their pocket. The next map of Havana is going to decide everything here. And it, 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 I, I, I mean, I'm on the edge of my seat right now. I I will say this. For Albany, they've been wanting to run the double hit scan slash sniper look the whole night. And if you're going to run it, Havana is the map to do it. Or one of the best maps. They're only behind Circuit now, which is like sniper central. So I don't... I'm a little optimistic here for Albany because the Hansa should be... The Cassidy can definitely give value. I would love maybe... Ash 
or Sojourn instead. I'm just not sure what their hero pool is looking like. And that's secondary DPS slot. But I think it should at least go into their favor a little bit more than the previous two maps who have been a lot more, you know, dive heavy. Just, you know, at the roots of the map. So it's a possibility here for Albany to try and turn it around, force us a map four. But they just, they got to be more consistent with the picks. You know, you can't count on Nick hitting headshots at the beginning of every engagement just to keep you in this. Yeah, and I think, too, something that might also be working against Albany at times is the, I guess, isolationism that we see occasionally, yeah. especially from Zeta, Ready. separated from the team. And really, at that point, it's free real estate for Greensboro. They collapse on top of you because they want to get this tank off the field. And once you lose your tank, you really have to hope that you can either get their tank or you can back out with not losing too many members and not staggering out too much more. Greensboro, interesting from them, though. It's, it, it, it's Naderade hovering the Doomfist. I, I would be... I'd, I'd have a smile, though, I think, if Naderade decides to go with it. All right, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Oh, I had a feeling away. it wasn't going to stick for uh, for too long. Albany will be going the double sniper look, but it won't It won't be Nick on the Hanzo. Volkson will actually take over the Hanzo role. Nick, over and it'll be almost, at least for a DPS, a full mirror matchup. Everything else is a little bit scrambled around. Oh, it's a slight advantage for Greensboro with having that shield, but Albany have all the oh! positioning. Oh! <laughs> they got all the positioning and they got all the aim too. Because Nick is coming back with a vengeance. Oh, man. Lice could be feeling that in the morning. They're looking for more heads, but Magix is going to stop that right almost immediately too. This will just turn into Sniper Central, I think. This entire map. I'm scared. I'm truly scared right now. <laughs> Okay, all right. Now with the loss of Zeta, Albany, there's not really much more they can do at this point. Oh, did Magix just get another Hanzo headshot? Yes, they did. Magic, like, yeah, Nick, you know, congrats on the Hanzo play last time around. It's my turn, at least for a little bit. They're already 70% strike where they will probably use as soon as they launch it here just to separate out the Albany squad. And, and, and I mean, Albany has to contest this payload, right? Okay, Nick, you're still showing up, you're still showing out, and you're still showing what Shadow Wolf is capable of. All right, well, you know, Magic's gonna put that right back down to the ground. And just like you said it, Jesse, once Magic has those dragons out, they come, and against all odds, they actually get the pick here. We're gonna see if Volkson can do what their teammate was able to on this Hanzo, but being pursued by Magic's, it's a little bit dicey, but they do come up with the kill. And Albany holds at that 0.72 meters. Able just to squeak the touch in less than a meter before it would have been captured. And now Greensboro have to make a swap light off of the Widow now going on to the Soldier. And probably just to mess with Zeta a little bit more. Build up that charge off the shield and then try and send that real gun shot over to wherever Nick or Volkson is positioned up. And all, because of the amount of ults used there from Greensboro, this might just be more of, hey, we'll try and use Gravitic Flux, but it might be more of just a building ult fight. Yo, Nick is playing very dangerously, and Light hasn't been able to use any of this Sojourn. I mean, good lord for Volks in here. Uh, it's, it's Albany. They're playing it just so well right now. It's because Volkson's, you know, sitting back there, back right. Nick is, well, now Nick is above them over by the signage. So it's so many different angles to so Greensboro have to look. And when you look at the, one of them, the other one's shooting you right in the back. No more worry about an immortality field either. <laughs> we're just gonna they just, they're just, yeah, they're just going to go right to where Volkson is sitting in that little balcony. And mess with them a little bit with gravity. Get rid of them. Now you don't have to worry about it. It's the Kitsune Rush, a coalescence into it as well. Oh, but it seems like this coalescence is going to come up much bigger too, especially with that Earth Shatter. Albany, where they were suffering at the beginning of this round, Jesse, has turned things back into their hands. What a shatter. As soon as they see Naderade drop the shield, it's like, all right, I know I got two seconds to launch this thing if needed and just able to throw it down and... Now, Attack Moon's going over to the Mercy just to try and give Light a little bit more of a pocket to build up with up that overclock. They just can't afford to get picked off early. It's a good recognition from Naderay to get over onto the D.Va to contest these snipers, but look at Volkson. He's just already set up back here. 
has the Dragon Strike if need be. Ooh, Magix has one of their own and two. They took down Nick. The intersecting dragons, but no one to fall from it. At the very least, you create yourself a lot of space. You kept Greensboro on that payload. They can't really move forward from that. It's gonna be the overclock from Light. They had to do it inside of the opposing Kitsune Rush. So far though, they get to stay alive. Zeta to try, try and create some space, try and create some pressure. But all the pressure is being taken away from them because Magix has decided to go sicko mode. Even hit with a stick, now hit with a shatter too. You can tell that these tanks, Jesse, hate these Hanzos. Oh yeah, it's just like, yeah, no, I need, I know I need to take them out. And when in doubt, Magix, they trust. They're even able to get the res off as well. I don't think the Miracle Stall is coming in from Albany this time around. Volkson's just going to try and back up. Salts as well. And it was a valiant effort, to be fair, from Albany. But this time around, Greensboro able to keep the map on going. At the very least, Albany can say they took it into overtime. But what they can't yeah. say is that Nick still has a head. Because Magic is just shooting it off every time. All right, now you're going to see Naderade go right up onto the high ground, push them off, and prevent Volksen from doing anything. Now with this high ground control, Volksen has to back up, play towards back stairs. Not going to have as many sight lines as they would have if they had full bridge control, and that gives Magical the sight lines that they need to try and get this opening pick. Ooh, Magics. I'm scared. Oh, and they have another really good position to use this Dragon Strike if they so choose. The loss of attack moves though, Greensboro is gonna have to be on the back foot. A lot more dangerous for them to want to sustain up here and want to continue this fight. Thankfully though, Shadow Wolf is still on the case. Things have been evened out a little bit more, especially with Light. Let's see what this, let's see what this Dragon Strike is gonna do. It's gonna get one and you force Zeta into a corner, isolated from the rest of the team, but still alive they are. And it's gonna be their Moira to keep them there for this a little bit longer using the Harmony Orb. Still this high ground and on top of that, the Mercy Boost. Oh no. Oh no. Yeah, this could get bad here. Immortality forced early. Now it's gonna be another Dragon Strike. This Coalescence keeping their tank alive and took out the Immortality Field as well. We have 60 seconds left on the clock to self-destruct to go through, maybe to be able to kill. But Sneewee is now a DPS ult, a, 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 a DPS support. It's still back and forth. The picks that they were able to make that he got, Magix is completely undoing. Magix is like, if I need to carry this myself, I can and I will. The Deadeye was a decent idea from Nick, just gets caught right before the skulls drop up and Shadow Wolf able to survive another day. There was nowhere. Salt didn't even have time to teleport out of there before Attack Moons wants to stand up to them and take out their mirror. Zeta was only able to take out Shadow Wolf, but that is not going to stop Greensboro from taking point B. They're pushing it almost OT every time throughout this map, but they're at least able to keep it going yet again. And now this is going to be Light and Magic's Playhouse. There's so many different side angles. Nick, honestly, at the disadvantage here, not as much range. You know, they do have that short-term burst with the Helix Rockets if they need to try and finish off one of these DPS here from Greensboro with Magic. Already has that Dragon Strike. Going to try and use it again here to separate like they did over in the second phase. Maybe even be able to come up with a kill too. It's been kind of nuts for them. They have an inkling too that two members are sitting right there thanks to that sonar arrow. Could throw forth the dragons but decides to hold on to it. Now Salt's using that Kitsune rush. They've lost Sneewi. But for Nick, they get to feel a little bit more confident about that. Is Light going to get something out of this overclock? They don't really need to. They can just put pressure. They can just apply pressure. They don't really need to get picks. They can just make Albany scared. They're just trying to make Zeta so uncomfortable they can't use the Shatter. They keep looking for it, but every time they try and go for it, they're afraid that they're going to get burned down before they can even use it. Oh, here it is. The dragons going through the bridge. There's no... Uh, there's nothing coming back from it from Greensboro, and now Shadow Wolf trying to use the Amplification Matrix is going to be completely denied from that by the efforts of Salts. These Kirikos are really coming up big. You're going to see Zeta having to back away. No more shield. They still have the Earth Shatter in their pocket, but the Kitsune Rush from Greensboro is going to be used. Now it's, now we're going to have the Earth Shatter? You're only going to get magics inside of that. And still, Naderade on the case the entire time. Ooh. But Volkson's Dragons might turn things back around here. Yeah, self-destruct creates a little bit of space, but it doesn't get any kills, but at least the UNC backline's still alive here for this OT. Oh my 
gosh. Bulks in. That's a really good opener. You get rid of the Kiriko. And now Shadow Wolf has to try and keep the entire team alive by themselves through a Kitsune Rush inside of Overtime. Now it's the Coalescence on top of that. Albany is more than happy to use all of these ultimates and save the payload from going all of the way inside of this Overtime. Well, we've seen this happen before, Jesse. We saw this happen on Midtown. Albany is still going to have a tough road ahead of them. They can't think of it as we need to finish this map. We just, they got to take it one round at a time because it almost felt like they were looking too far ahead over on Midtown. They're always afraid to use that extra ultimate just to finish off that first point. When in reality, they never got to future points because of that fact. So it is definitely a possibility here for Albany. They're playing a lot better. I think this is the best they've looked all night. It is just going to be a matter of, hey, can we avoid getting picked off by Magic early? <laughs> yeah. And well, it seems like that's like a third of these fight openings is Magic's. Or great, to be fair, Volkson's finding a few as well. But a lot of time it is Magic's just finding that opening pick and setting Greensboro up extremely well. But if you can avoid them and you can try and just burst down and punish Naderade a little bit more like Zeta's been punished tonight, I think they have a real good shot of forcing us over to a map four. That's what we're hoping for here. It's all or nothing for Albany on this attack for them. 83.86. Once again, they don't have to go all of the way. But what we want to see from Albany is that recognition, that ideation. Okay, we we it doesn't matter if we, you know, get all the way if we can't get the first round, if we can't get the first point. So that is what we're going to need to be seeing. We're going to need to be seeing bold, bold moves from them. You know, we saw it on their defense. Like, they almost held through first phase. It was just at the very end, Greensboro was able to poke on through. Oh, hey, that's a good way. Go. First thing done. Now a res goes through. Can you do it again? Okay, not able to do it. This is just the sniper duel. And I think Magic's not eager to take another fight like that. Don't blame them. Oh, you can't blame them whatsoever, especially after Nick pops your head in the first second. Well, Devin Volks can do it right again a few seconds later. Four Magics <laughs> getting hit by the Wombo combo of the Sniper duos, Nick and Volkson. They know, they know that Magics has been a thorn in their side and realizing this is so vital to their success. Nick also getting the headshot onto Light. Now for Volkson, it's going to be the high ground control. They really want to get Shadow Wolf out of here. They want to get that kill and they're doing it. Jesse, they are doing it. Now Magics is back on the field. Lops Nick's head, oh my God. Showing Volkson the business end of that too. The payload is still being contested, and it's all... Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. It is... Oh, my gosh. That is the value of Magics on this team. They always are looking for those picks that have the aim for it. And as soon as you think, oh, no, we got this. Like, they may throw in the Ryan back again, but we got this fight. Magics just comes around, able to pick up three. And very similar it's to Albany's defense at the very last second, able to stall it out. And now Albany needs to do it all over again. Ooh, the infrared side. Magix is also going to be boosted. I think this is also what really helps Magix out as well, being damage boosted by attack moons. They just have to make sure they don't get their head shot through by Nick or Volkson. The infrared runs out. Now it's... Oh, my God. How did... No oh. way, Magix. No way. Magic, Magic, you can tell. Magix is angry. Magix is very angry. They're getting their revenge. They hit the aim trainer before this, that is for sure. And at this point for Albany, it's okay, what is the plan? Because you have almost all these ultimates. How do you want to use them? Light's halfway to their first bomb after swapping on over. They have the ant matrix early if they want to power it with Naderade as well. Oh my God. There it is again. There it is again. Magic yep. is not missing. <laughs> They, they, they've entered that flow state, and even better for Greensboro, they completely deny Zeta's Earth Shatter. This is just continuing to go more and more and more in Greensboro favor. Oh, you really do have to make sure. Oh, no way. There is just no way, Jesse. There is no way. This just isn't fair. Oh, my God. This is this is not fair, Sam. Magix is doing everything he needs just to make sure Greensboro, they will not fall to one and four. They're looking more and more to evening it up at two and three. This is just crazy. You know, we talked about it earlier. You got to take out Magic and get this first pick, oh! but it's easier said than done. It's just Kovacs now. It's it's Aim Labs. This is all just circles to them. Finally, though, Nick gets the kill. It's undone. 
It's 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 this is just pain in his purest form. Oh, Nick does it again though. What magic was in the air? The Kitsune Rush is also used. But Naderade is going to stall things out inside of that Earth Shatter. And it's going to be a lot better than what Albany has shown forth. It's only 30 seconds now, though. It's only 30 seconds, Jesse. And it's pretty much been the Magic's headshot show for this round. Albany put so much into that as well. They will only have Vulcan, Vulcan's Fire and Dragon Strike here in this fight. Zeta does switch over to the Winston just to put a little more pressure on the Magic's in light. As it yeah, will be, to. be the Bob to try and contest early on here to try and make sure UNC can stall this out for as long as they can. You have to. You got, you got to do what you can. These dragons are going to have to get some kills here. And for Zeta, they took so much damage. But now Bob is going to stall things out massively. It's going to give just that little bit more for Albany here. It's actually going to come up for, yeah, big on their favor. Volkson goes down. Bob is just proving to be too much. For them, <laughs> did Magic just like do a flyby? Was that a literal flyby onto Nick? I don't even believe it anymore. This is not fair. And now they're going to hunt down Sneewee. They're already dead. It's already over, Magic. There you have it. UNC Greensboro. Genesis is going to take this series 3-0 to zero on Havana. That's not even fair. Like, I, he legit hooked up. He's like, yep, hi, bye. All right, GG's, man. That was... That was just ridiculous from them. And I have to say, Albany, their defense has looked decent for the most part tonight. It's just when they were trying to be on the offensive end, especially, you know, on Midtown and on Havana, they just could never create the space that was needed. It was always the DPS line of UNC Greensboro, like, hey, you're not getting this space. And they had no real way of trying to contest it. They went to Winston at the very end and it had the right idea. But then all of a sudden you have the Rhine hitting back to peel for their widow, which is definitely not usual. But hey, it worked out for Greensboro. Yeah. That is that's a great matchup for them. A nice little 3 0 sweep. Indeed so. And that just goes ahead and proves to you that they are a team to be reckoned with. And another win on the board for them, bringing them to that 2 3 line. Uh, unfortunately, though, we are not going to have any interviews, so that is it for myself and Jesse. Still, though, don't go anywhere because we have Collegiate League of Legends up next. It is going to be Mountain West, Seelow, Round 9, San Diego State University versus San Jose University with our casters, J Turbo and Rare Adam. You guys are, everyone is going to be in for a treat, and I know that we here had a really great time, so don't go anywhere. We will be right back with a whole set of new casters, a whole new game. Statistics thing. Yeah. It's maybe. maybe. <laughs> this is a death match, and I think they're all in the same one. They're all on Icebox. Are they, oh, they, are they all in the same death match? Maybe. Who knows? I feel like none of them can hear me. I want to like approach somebody, but no one, no one can hear. They all have both their headphones on. What's up? How do we think we're doing? I think we're doing pretty good. Yeah. What's, what's your kitty? Uh, we're looking at ten and six right now. Oh, hey, that's third, dude. That's better than I expected. Who's who's bottom frag right now? I want to go talk to them. Yeah, Ian. Hey, how do we think we're doing so far? Uh, you know, it could be better. Could be better. You're one of those rough days. Well, you know. Let's go find more people to harass. Yeah. Where's, Bo where's Boise State? Who's your favorite to play? Oh, right now, it's got to be either Chamber or Breach. Man. What country is Cypher from? Oh, dude. Um, it's Moroccan, right? It is Morocco. Oh, my God. I don't think anyone is going to get that. Oh, you're good. You're good. <laughs> All right. See you later. Let's go harass Boise State more. Who is this? What school is this? Boise? This is Boise. Oh, man, that's okay. Boise still got really good odds. A large bagel, one of their tank players, Nerdy Bird, they're off tank, both of them not here. A little bit scary, for being honest. Getting warmed up, getting ready to cast some players. No, cannot cast, interview. Change of mindset, change of mindset. Words. No, but last words until we until we come back. Oh, okay. Because we're leaving. Enjoy. Oh, that was good, that was good. Anything from you? How are you doing, Polly? Awesome, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Welcome everybody here to the top five plays of the week from eSports. You Klutschke here to help you bring those five plays and we got one from each game lined up. Let's start with play number five and this one takes us to Rocket League where the Bulldogs of Louisiana Tech and the SUNY Poly Wildcats squaring off. But for the Bulldogs, they show us why the saying goes teamwork makes the dream work with insane passes and a goal to end it. The options have to go and recover defensively because that's a big long clear. 
And while the long clear can either catalyze an Ooh. offense or bring into situations like this, Jazz leaps up for the shot, knocks it home. Now the Wildcats were able to take a game off the Bulldogs, but in the end, Louisiana Tech would go on to win the series 4-1. to one. Coming in at number four is from League of Legends, and it's the Army West Point Black Knights and the Lethbridge College Kodiaks playing in a USA versus Canada game on the Rift. But down two people mid-game, it's looking kind of like the Black Knights had a challenging fight coming up in top lane. But then again, the Army isn't called tough for nothing. By the way, now a 3v1 into another 3v1. This is this is Army West Point just uh, just doing doing the duty list, right? That is. Almost a full ace. Uh, yeah, the minions will help him out. That is an there ace. Now, that was in game number one, and Army West Point would go on to win the entire series two to nothing. Let's go to number three now in Overwatch 2 action, where the Great Danes of Albany and the Bulls of South Florida squaring off. First map on Oasis, and things started to look good for South Florida to flip the point. Unfortunately for them, one player was hitting shots, and one player was showing why Doomfist has Doom in his name getting two picks although that comes out right back bob is out of the floor ski gets two ski gets two this is just an annihilating fracture here from ski it's unbelievable the fight continues on and it looks like it's going to be a fight win here for albany albany would go ahead and take that game and take on the sweep as they would defeat south florida three to nothing two spots left on the countdown and coming in at number two is super smash bros sauce from the fisher falcons taking on neo joe from the st thomas aquinas spartans it's mario taking on the pokemon trainer with the squirtle out but don't let sauce start cooking or they could lay the smackdown on you sauce there's a couple of mario players kind of making waves right now but it's about what sauce is doing oh! right now to neo no! joe he's saucing him up oh my mercy what a forward end. fisher would go ahead and take that fight take that win and take the series two to nothing and the number one play belonging to valorant the demon deacons of wake forest have a one to nothing lead up on the brian bulldogs heading to icebox but Wake Forest down six to four. Spike planted on B, and it's a 1v3 situation favoring the Bulldogs. Luckily for the Demon Deacons, this is one of the rounds that Conrad decided to play the hero. Are they just gonna leave this? Are they playing for Hunter's Fury potentially? They are. And there's the shot from Aimbot, though. This is gonna be extremely dangerous. He's gonna be able to find him. Does he have time? Now that match would go on to map number three, and Conrad would also get an ace on that last map. But it wasn't enough as Brian would win the series two to one. And that's it for the top five of the week from Esports U. We'll see you back out there for even more games. And until next time, this is Clutch Key from Esports U signing off. And there's so many other jobs as, as well that that's can right. translate out of this experience in Esports the the only path is not just as a player um, i think all of us are representative of jobs in esports but it, it it mirrors traditional sports in pretty much the same way you've got you know broadcasters you've got production people you've got marketing and sales and um, now nil and and things like that but um, really esports is kind of a great accelerator accelerator uh, for a lot of new businesses that are coming up in the metaverse and Web3, and there's a lot of new technology that is going to be needed. And so these, these STEM students that are also esports athletes are really the, the future workforce and leaders of tomorrow. And, you know, us as well as all of our brand partners that we work with really recognize this. And I think that's really, you know, a key driver of why brands are in this space. They want to be part of building that future workforce and leadership and shaping it and supporting it. So, yeah, it's 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 very, it's been a very interesting space to watch. And we, we offer such a big, uh, you know, we offer such a big counterpart to traditional sports also, because. When it's a counterpart, but it's also the same, is what I'm trying to say. Because it, it, when you're traditional sports and they're done after their two a day workout and they're done after their practice scrim, they're coming home to play Call of Duty and relax and put their feet up and get a drink and play video games. It grows their brain, problem solving skills, uh, and, and their hand eye coordination while they're home. Hand eye coordination, if you're a football player, massive skill, massive skill. So mm -hmm. um, it helps build those things while they're off the field. And then for us, vice versa, if you're an esports athlete, one of the th errors I had growing up when I was competing in esports is that I was not active enough. I, I played sports, I competed a little bit, but I wasn't active enough truly when I look at it. So 
that's one area that esports players can learn from in terms of activity and physical and the marrying of both. People say, oh, sports and esports, video games. Not really. We're just kind of the tech industry's competitive uh, form of um, competition as to where traditional sports are more physical hands-on. So I believe in the marrying of these two sectors and that they actually live together while also being counterparts. Well, I think I think then to speak to something about marrying, right, from traditional to esports, um, that to me speaks to this whole new thing, at least, again, from you guys, right, you guys have more traditional sports background, right, Paul, leave Mike, um, and all that. But I think let's talk NIL then, because I think that's something that I think is really interesting, That at least when I heard about it, right, of what we're trying to do with, you know, esports athletes, schools, programs in general, um, because it wasn't something you would think normally, right? You could understand, right, football player on the field, star quarterback. It makes sense, right? The guy is somebody that everybody knows on campus, whether you're, you know, whether you're on the team, off the team, or you're just going to the school. It makes sense. But I think, you know, nowadays it's it's not as common or people don't think that they could be somebody that their name is out there, right? Or that they know they're known, right? As, as we're growing the space, as we're, we're putting this together, it almost feels really interesting that, you know, star your star entry, you know, your star entry in Valorant or your, your star forward on Rocket League, right? Whatever the case might be, now they can have NIL deals. It's a, it's a thing out yeah. there. And, and I think, I don't know, maybe, Mike, you want to start off? But yeah, like, yeah, yeah I think, yeah, thank you for teeing that up. So uh, I was talking for too long. I, uh, I forgot to bring NIL into the mix. So it's a common occurrence, a occupational hazard. So I would say that, uh, so NIL for, for, I'm sure most of you watching understand what it is, but NIL stands for name, image, and likeness. Name, image, and likeness, that term has been utilized to describe the transition of traditional student athletes, NCAA athletes, and their ability to monetize their name, image, and likeness. It went live July 1st, 2021, and it has continued over the course of the last 14, nearly 14 months now. Uh, it's an interesting term because it's been co-opted to describe the NCAA's approach to student athletes being able to make endorsement money or uh, be able to monetize any part of their name, image, and likeness, but it's been around forever, right? We've had athletes endorsing brands for over 100 years. Babe Ruth of the New York Yankees was endorsing brands 100 years ago, and it has continued onward from baseball cards all the way through now where we have lots of different integrations of how uh, influencers can monetize their followings. So what I would say on the traditional side is it's still a very young space. There are a lot of stories out there regarding NIL that tend to focus on the negative or how out of control, I put in air quotes, it has gotten. But there is still a burgeoning marketplace for many more student athletes that are involved. About 17% of NCAA athletes are currently involved in NIL, but 65% more than that want to get involved and are curious how to get started. On the flip side, brands are challenged with a few different things in the space. There are 10,000 professional athletes in the United States. Once July 1st, 2021 hit, and you dump every NCAA athlete into that space, that's another half million. So brands that maybe didn't have a dedicated athlete strategy when there were 10,000, now have 500,000 plus that 10,000 to figure out how to activate who they are. That's a lot. I understand brands hesitancy in some instances, but I can tell you that companies like us are on a daily basis educating brands and student athletes We're at the Collegiate Sports Commissioner's Cup. Let's make some noise. Oh, and it's going to be good. The scorer judges go for one, two, ten. He needs more. In the They're doing oh. even more here. You've got to touch the point. Central College walks it in. Joy Boy is going to drop. Knife him. Right out front. Yeah. Three, oh, two, one. Right. Johnny.
Welcome to the Mountain West as we've got some League of Legends action. We've got San Diego State up against San Jose, two of the juggernauts of this conference. And I'm Jay Turbo, joined alongside Rare Adam for the action this evening. Yeah, super excited to see what these two teams have in store. One versus three sort of in the standings right now. There's sort of a circle at the top about who's beating who and everyone's beating each other and it's just a big mess up at the top among the top four and five teams so uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how this series turns out it's definitely going to be one that is competitive i'm excited to see what these two teams have in store yes same here i i, I wrote it down it was like so san jose beats hawaii but they lose to utah and then san diego beats utah but they lose to hawaii and i think at some time earlier san uh, san jose and uh, sdsu ran into like UNLV and so then there's some questions about those other teams in the top five right but overall we've got a lot of teams that can beat each other but no one who's at that definitive top we heard last week from Utah themselves that they feel like they're right at the top they're feeling really good I think that they're winning the head-to-head -head, but San Jose and San Diego all of them are competing for that top spot they're all close to being locked in for playoffs which is top four for this conference so now it's about seeding and lining yourselves up for uh, for that playoff tournament to try and make the national championship yeah, and I think especially when we talked about this last week as well, you know, coming out of Mountain West Conference, you're going to have, you know, not a whole lot of expectations from these other conferences. If you can prove yourself at this level and you can show that you're coming out as a very strong team, you can make one of those, you know, crazy runs up to the top. We saw that last year in CLO with Converse coming out of the Peach Belt Conference, what the C-rated conference, I mm -hmm. think they said it was. And they go all the way to top four. And now people are starting to look at some of these smaller conferences and they're like, Hmm, yeah, that team, they're actually pretty good. You know, maybe we should put them up a little bit here or, you know, not taking conferences exactly at face value. I mean, there's a couple of those feature conferences even this year that are going to get a couple of looks of teams that are quite good. But nonetheless, we're in a draft. Look at this. We're already here. Yeah, already. These teams are flying through. Got the Kindred and Silas taken away. I'm going to say from Tabula Rasa mostly and the Ash taken off the table from Pass Me the John. It's pretty contested, I think, among the ADCs and supports for both of these teams. So, Already interesting to see that competition, but so much jungle focus against Tabula Rasa, and it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Tabula Rasa, the highest rated player in this lobby specifically, might be the highest rated player in the entire conference as well. You know, did reach Challenger last season. So obviously there's going to be a big target on Tabula Rasa there if they can sort of take his champions off of the board as well. But San Jose State overall, you know, they're a very diverse team in terms of their ranks you know there's some highlights there's some people who are a little bit lower in the ranks on the opposite side though san diego state everyone right around that d1 to master tier rating there so you know it's a little bit more consistent across the board will that lead to success or will it lead to specific areas just getting targeted a little bit heavier we'll have to see how that turns out because it's always interesting with some of these teams that you know if they don't have all of the backing in the world from the school you just get what you get in that sense and sometimes that leads to you having you know five master players sometimes that leads to you having a challenger jungler and a gold mid layer for some cases that's not the case on sjs for this case but nonetheless that is something that does happen in some of these uh CLL teams yeah ex exactly and, and making the most of what you have is always really good is i i don't think i've ever seen this jungle matchup before jarvin into wave loop classic uh, just both of these teams keeping it very, very clean, getting some aggression for their junglers. And, I mean, we heard from Kimo's looking at that. And uh, they've both been picked up. Yeah, and I think that with these jungle picks that have come through, you know, it's... It's sort of a throwback a little bit, you know? We're sort of getting the return of stuff like Jarvan, the return of stuff like Graves, uh, moving back towards it as sort of farming and ganking junglers in that sense as well as opposed to just the tanks of old but you know with these eddie carries picked up already you know that the solution getting picked means they're looking at something like a nami for soda on the opposite side meanwhile for devourer on the side of san diego state you know hovering that caitlin looking for one of those power combos as well caitlin luck still incredibly strong you see it at the highest level still you know there's these preset combos we talked about this last week you get your preset combos and you can just put them in there and say hey bot lane this is your strong combo this is what you're going to pick and you need to try and win the lane off of that you know that was just the normal mac and cheese it was the rest of it that ended up throwing in that nutmeg we've looked up other spices and other recipes <laughs> for this week don't you worry exactly and for anyone who wasn't around last week we found out that from even the greatest of sources that nutmeg can be found in your mac and cheese martha stewart approved for it so we went through trying to find some extra spice but uh, we won't we won't bring that up until these teams bring it to us as i'm expecting the lucian nami to get locked in and so far this is a very bland but very safe and stable draft 
Yeah, and you saw the slight hover where Braum there. You know, Lucian Braum was sort of a combo of old when Braum mm -hmm. was just incredibly strong. Now Braum's sort of like, yeah, I can play it, but you can just play Lucian Nami instead. You know, it's it's one of those ideas that, you know, in a vacuum, Lucian Braum should work, but Lucian Nami is just better mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And I think especially in this current meta where bot lane is sort of the prime focus, AD carries are super duper strong right now. Uh, junglers are basically like, okay, I'm going to gank bot, and then I'm going to gank bot, and then I'm going to gank bot again, and then whoever is the better AD carry wins. You know, that's that's the meta right now. You kind of want to just make sure you have as much laning prowess as possible. Exactly. And both of these teams having such a high priority on that early lane focus, I'm expecting something explosive. If you weren't here last week, every single game, we had a level three fight in the bot lane. So maybe we'll get some of that same levels of excitement here. Both of these teams wanting to get aggressive early on and get those advantages. But now focus being put towards the top side on the band table and the mid lane with Syndra Jax and Jace taken away. Yeah, and that Jace there is most likely a mid lane ban, actually. Tomogoku plays a lot of that Jace in the mid lane. Very confident on that. You know, their champion pool is very much suited for the top lane, but instead they've sort of moved into this mid lane here. So there are some champions that can translate over stuff like the Jace, like the Akali, stuff like that can potentially pop up in that mid lane. Whether it would be blind picked or not is yet to be determined. But, you know, with this top lane pool being so wide open here with only one ban on either side with that Jackson and Cho'Gath, I'm curious to see what Cole ends up picking up for themselves because it can really define what you want to sort of play to in that sense. Because currently I think they're just going through the top lane tab and scrolling through and just hovering every single champion. But, you know, <laughs> If it's something like a Malphite, if you're just trying to play that big old tank on the top side, at the very least, you have engaged, right? You just press R and there you go. That's how you start your team fights. Yeah, it's one click, one button. Just get that unstoppable force. It'll certainly help out. Now, of course, there's the Cataclysm on the other side. So both of these teams already having those go buttons, so to say, for their team. San Diego probably wanting to round out with something a little tankier in the top side. No, Piao, uh, Ka King, they'd like to play some carries, so could see that kind of direction. And we get both with the Nasus. And uh, <laughs> Adam, I can tell you've got some, some thoughts to be had, and that might be some of the cinnamon on your roast chicken that we were talking about earlier <laughs> that we'd need to hold on to for when these teams bring up the spice in the draft. Yeah, and this is a really interesting choice from Piao here because it's a pick that showed up I have to say Season 7 Worlds, it showed up very briefly there for yes. one reason. It was picked into Maokai, just because these tanks can't do anything to Nasus in the early game. You don't have solo kill pressure unless you're going full AP Malphite, which is, I want to just say, not a very good choice if you are the side of SJSU here. But nonetheless, you're going to have that engaged tool, you're going to have that option at level 6, but before then, when Nasus is not strong... Nasus just gets the free stack in that lane. You're able to harass down with your Spirit Fire as well. And, you know, Nasus has received some significant buffs to make him a little bit better towards the later game. Specifically, Wither is just so strong at shutting down champions like Graves and Lucian. So in that sense, you know, this Malphite can go in on you, but then if the Graves and the Lucian are just stuck behind because they're effectively stunned and they have, like, two, like, negative attack speed, point two attack speed, that's what I want to say, yeah. Um, <laughs> then they just can't do anything in these fights, and they're just sort of removed from play. And I think that can provide a way for this Victor from Torley or this, you know, Caitlyn Lux combo to just sort of free fire for a little bit longer. It's the counter engage to something like the Graves who wants to sort of get up close. The Akali is going to be a little bit harder to lock down, but the Lucian definitely can just be removed from a fight with 1W. Yeah, there's no point and click CC for that Akali, so I think that's going to be a great uh, piece of counterplay for Tom Goku throughout this game. It has some good backline access, but... Yeah, the more that you talk about this Nasus, the more I really like it, just because of how linear the damage profile is for San Jose State, right? You have these two heavy auto attackers and some burst that's going to come through from the mid laner, right? And sure, Akali, she can dance around a fight and get plenty going, but being able to just wither down a Lucian, get rid of that attack speed, make him pretty much useless to try and step up as both of these uh, champs are pretty short range ADCs. So you get in range of that wither, you're going to get caught by a binding, you're going to get hit by the cataclysm, or you're just going to get hit with the cane and have no HP. I don't care if you build a mortal shield boat graves, you're still going to just die from the 1k stack Nasus. Yeah, and I think that we're going to have to keep an eye on how this Nasus stacks as well, because you know, there are some games where you can get to a thousand stacks and it's great and everything, but I think a big misconception about Nasus in general is that Nasus is a late game carry. Like, Nasus is not that good in the late game. You get to a certain point where no matter if you have 
be wither slow no matter if you have all of this uh these stacks put up you still need to get into melee range and that's the issue with a lot of melee carries when they get into the late game you have to try and assassinate someone but if you just get kited out you're gonna be in trouble and realistically once the likes of this lucian are able to get to three items they're able to pick up a qss they're able to get serral does it's gonna be a lot harder for a cow to just walk forward wither them and then smack them down with the cane they're gonna have to start to look for these teleport flanks i'm curious to see if they take the ghost as well to sort of find these flanks a little bit quicker and that's going to be really the key to success, I think, for the side of SDIC, because in terms of their team comp, it is quite literally your standard roast chicken. Everything is to plan, except for that Nasus. That Nasus is the X factor that can really change how this draft sort of performs. You could realistically have just picked something like a Gnar on that top side. You could have picked something that just beats... You could have picked Camille in that sense as well, yeah. or any of those champions that are just good at taking down tanks and still have that dive threat but you opt for something a little bit different because you want to play towards a little bit of a different play style you want to have that wither to slow down tabula rasa if you can't execute on that if your nasus is just getting cut down at the beginning of the fight then you're basically just playing a 4v5 in that situation so it is the dichotomy of nasus either the, the dog will eat or um be eaten I have nothing else for that yeah. one. Yeah, the soul it's a dog eat dog world. Exactly. <laughs> like you're you're either on top or you're getting shut down. And one other point I am gonna say is that we're gonna have to watch the stacking, but I also think we're gonna have to watch how San Diego State transitions their game plan too, right? Because I think that there's this very clear focus on the early game with this Caitlyn Lux bot lane and the Jarvan, but that 15 minute transition, if this Caitlyn doesn't get ahead and she hits her weak spot when this Lucian is gonna be spiking, are San Diego gonna be ready for that adjustment? Are they going to be able to make sure that this Nasus is still farming up and he's still applying side lane pressure when San Jose have such a team fighting skirmish heavy comp that they want to be grouped up for? So that's another point I really want to watch for San Diego because while it sounds easy, just keep your Nasus on the side lane, very easy for that pressure to amount in uh, nothing or to mistime it with your team and just wind up completely out of position. And I think to that point as well, you know, the reason why you have sort of these set bot lane combos is because they are strong in the early game and they are still you know, serviceable come the later stages of the game. Specifically, though, you know, Lucian Dami is going to be more serviceable, almost you know, carrying the team through that mid game, whereas Caitlyn Nux will become that carry come the late game as well. So there's that mid game trough that we've talked about multiple times with Caitlyn. Lucian sort of just has a downward trajectory, but it takes a little bit longer for that to come online. And it really just depends on how T is able to keep up with strike money, is able to keep up in items and everything, because realistically, Caitlyn at three items can match up with a Lucian at four items. But if a Lucian has four items and the Caitlyn's still sort of struggling to find that rapid fire cannon or something along those lines, that is where you can start to mark your claim and everything. So for SJSU, you know, it's a more standard at team comp. It is something where you know you just think of a team you can ask chat gpt let's say and you say here make me a team comp on patch 13.4 they're gonna say okay let's pick a tank on the top side of the map how about malphite very easy to play in the jungle we will pick someone who can scale and farm here's graves assassin ap in the mid lane there's a collie and now a strong bot lane duo lucian nami there you go it's, it's literally <laughs> chat gpt made that on the flip side though you know chat gpt had a bad day it was like you know what i don't really want to step up with this you know i'm gonna spice it up i'm gonna throw them up yeah pick the dog on the top side and we'll just have to find out if sdsu have that dog in them or if we're gonna be looking for the dog yeah it, i'm i'm really intrigued and also uh sort of back to the point of san jose striking in this mid game i think their entire team spikes really hard in that mid game around the two items right you're seeing Kali like uh wants to hit two items lucian really spiking once that muramana is fully stacked up and there's that mid game trough for the caitlin but as well the victor gonna spike at two items as far as being able to clear waves he's not gonna be the the team fighting menace that you're used to seeing he's not gonna be straight out of arcane just creating explosions out of nowhere he's gonna need a little time a little study in the lab to get there but it's a stabilization point that's also what sds you're gonna have to watch out for dog is still just the kicker for me is that it's that extra little bit it's that extra little bit of spice that you need the extra ingredient that secret recipe your grandma is always like this is world famous it's just like what is it and it's just like that well that's the thing it's a secret it can't ever be told found out today it's actually nasus uh r4 or b4 and that's what makes the the secret recipe that's what it is you're gonna find it in the cookbook go there tonight i'll you'll you'll confirm it 100 percent yeah, I mean, sometimes the meta is made before the meta is even created. That's what we were talking about. You know, they're not making the mac and cheese. We didn't think it was meta, but it was meta 20 years ago when the meta didn't even exist. You know, people didn't even <laughs> think that it was a thing. And yeah. Sometimes that's just what happens. And I, and I think that this is sort of a callback to that. You know, it is something that was picked 
once at Worlds in Season 7. How I remember, who knows? You know, it's, it's one of those games where you're just like, yeah, Khan picked Nasus. And, and this is, it's just a very similar matchup in that regard. So, I mean, if that is our litmus test, Khan destroyed Fnatic with it. You know, it was just massive in that mid game, was able to get to that point. Since then, you know, Nasus hasn't gotten a whole lot of plays, gotten more play support, if anything, <laughs> yeah. because of, you know, just slowing someone down 95%. Wow, good. it's pretty good at taking down some 80 carries. But in that same vein, you know, if you're able to pull it off, if you're able to make it work, you just show that you have that idea on the meta and that you can sort of take advantage of a champion like Malphite when it's picked blind. Because then game two comes around, and if SDS were to come out on top here, now you have to start to consider, hey, if we just pick a big dumb rock on the top side of the map, they're going to pick the dog, they're going to do the exact same thing to us. We're either going to have to ban it, or we're going to have to consider other things. And then furthermore, you can still pick this tank, and then there's a bunch of other counters. You know, there's the traditional Nar, there's the Camille, there's other stuff that you still have to worry about. So uh, just throwing this one out here in game one is intriguing, because you could just pick the Camille and say, okay, we want to save Nasus for later. But they opt to go this route already, shows that they're very confident in their draft, and uh, they want to they wanna knock them down a peg. Yeah, I, I think so. This reminds me a lot of, like, chess videos where, like, this position has been reached once before, and then they name, like, some random game. But then it, it's like you see Gotham ch just in the corner screaming, and it's just like, and then they pick the Nasus! And the last time we saw this, gone decimated Fnatic! And that's what's going through my head right now. I hope San Diego State are having that kind of mentality that they're really excited. They're just like, oh my gosh, we got the Gigantus brain. We, we know the matchup we're gonna go two points into e level four he's never gonna see it coming we're gonna go for the early emacs into the just stacking who knows what kind of route they're gonna go but still very very exciting beyond that i think we've, we've touched on pretty much everything else as far as bot lanes we've seen these bot lanes we've seen this exact matchup plenty of times the victor and the akali in the mid lane as well very standard, just Victor tries to farm, Akali tries to aggro, you see who comes out on top. And of course, Graves, Jarvan, we had like an entire year dedicated to this jungle matchup, I want to say, like, what, season 10, season 11? It's like just Jarvan and Graves. So. Yeah, it was it was a lot of the same stuff over and over again, and that's, that's what's piqued my interest as well. Um, we'll just have to find out what they end up going with here and just like that, we're going to be getting into the game, John. This is going to be an interesting <laughs> game here, of course. Uh, Nasus is going to be on all of our minds. And, of course, as is expected, a nice little view of the wildlife here on Summoner's Rift. Yes, getting a wildlife tour. This time, it's from Ibram, who's graduated from the Sam School of Observing. Gives us a little nature documentary to go with our League of Legends. Huge shout out. I just love getting to see the duck at the start of the games. I've missed this gotta love all of the animals all of the little wildlife there's so many little details that are added onto summoner's rift and it just makes the game that much better yeah i'm honestly going to be interested to see how this early game plays out as well overall you know you can see where these two teams are sort of setting up already interesting to see tabio la Rasa sort of hanging out around mid here i think they want to try and get a deep ward somewhere into the enemy jungle but Kimo's going to be right there to sort of reply to that and very interested to see how that'll all play out this level one is always going to be interesting as well because Graves loves to invade and Jarvan loves to gank. So in this situation, if Kimo is on the same side of the jungle as the Graves, the Graves can go for that invade and just sort of pull the wool over Kimo's eyes. But in the same sense, you know, Jarvan wants to start red buff. It's going to start red and might just look mid for a gank level two. Granted, ganking for a victor early on, as you said, not just going to create explosions out of anywhere. Going to need a little bit more assistance there as uh, Cole on that top side of the map. Taking a little bit of a dance. Gotta take a little dance. A little dance break for fun start the game before you have to treat it like war against your opponents and some goku actually already stepping up dropping an early ward to try and track down emo like that early awareness is we are seeing that red start from both junglers and reads that they might want to just pick it up and look towards some early ganks is already has the heads up gets rid of this ward Gets an extra, you know, 10 gold as well. Gets a little bit of experience. But now you can see Kimo just going to start to walk right into the enemy jungle. Instead of the Graves going for the early invade, will Kimo go for it? No, seems like they've got other plans. And uh, I think Soda sniffs this one out a little bit. Oh, my. The <laughs> flag and drag with the flash actually doesn't go through. So not sure who that works out for more. Still forcing out the flash from Soda. But this time, not level three. We can't have a fight in the bot lane. That's the problem. 
Yeah, you know, they, they went a little bit too early. They jumped the gun. They weren't expecting that to happen, but John, oh my Remind goodness. me that level two spike for Caitlyn Lux. It's first blood for the Luxes. We're a little bit off. Couldn't go level one, but you got to go level two. And honestly, really well played by John and Devour over there. You know, they were just able to take advantage of the fact that Kimo came bot, missed the flag and drag, said, hey, burn their flashy, punish it right away. Really good start to this lane. And uh, that's sort of the main thing to be worried about with uh, Lucian Nami. You know, your level two is very good as well, but so is theirs. And if they hit it first, if they're pushing that wave, it's going to be trouble. But Tabula Rasa, here they come. Oh, uh, it's a 2v2. Seems like Pass Me the John wanted to try and just get a kill here onto T instead. It's Devourer trying to kite out of the alcove, uh -oh. but round and round comes Soda to bring in some support. And it will be Devourer oh. falling. The stun lands, but there's no additional follow-up. So just one kill eventually traded in the bot side as Seal spots out Kimo. Just a little poke and a little awareness, but that'll be all. Yeah, just trying to spot out exactly where Kimo is as well. Get a little bit of an idea. Knows that the Jarvan's going to be looking for a gank. And realistically, you know, Malphite's going to be a very difficult champion to get. Malphite has trouble getting away from a champion like Jarvan in that early game, especially if the Nasus has that wither. You know, even though it's not as big of a slow, it's not your 95% slow quite yet. It's still going to be annoying. You're going to probably have to burn your flash on that top side. And uh, Seal wants to hold that for as long as possible. Meanwhile, mid lane. Absolutely nothing is happening. It's just a farm fest, and what do we expect? You know, it's Victor. Victor just wants the farm. Range versus melee, but in the bot side, it's level three. We got a fight as Ooh. Tabula Rasa looks to be the X Factors. Flash away from T. <gasps> Soda goes down to the headshot. So far, it's just a one for one. Devour walks on out. This big wave's gonna shove into T. Doesn't miss a thing. Once again. It's even on paper, but it seems like San Jose a little bit ahead in this bot lane. Oh, maybe not after missing that cannon. And, you know, in this situation as well, Devourer is going to get that whole wave pushed up as well. It's not going to be the worst case scenario. Yes, you are trading kills back and forth. Yes, it is bloody, but look at where all the gold is going. It's going into the bot lane on the side of SDSU. On SJ's side here, it's all going into this grave. So whether that works out for Tabula Rasa or not, we'll yet to be determined. But Tongoku setting it up. Flash out. And there's the finish. Tom Goki takes a tower shot, but there's not enough damage dealt. Three coming up for one cleanup. And now on the top side, seeing what, you know, just two tanks do, ignore each other, just hit the wing. And I mean, Tao's not in the greatest of shapes right now in terms of the health. Granted, still has that health potion there. The main thing is that Seal doesn't have that mana to really fight back. So it's just base damages and auto attacks that are getting traded back and forth. But interestingly enough, this Nasus hasn't really been able to farm as well as I think we've expected them to. And that might just be because of the constant harass of those cheese wheels coming down. Granted, still doesn't have flash. So that was burned at some point in time on that top side of the map. Not sure if there was any sort of intervention from anywhere else. Might've been Kimo walking up there as well, but nonetheless, that is a key summoner to take down. And if you can try and find a timer to get up there before seals level six, it's going to be pretty nice to try and push this tempo on the top side of the map, try and give Piao just those extra little bit of stacks there. And we can get a check on those stacks right now. I know it's early on. Piao's not going to have too many of those. We should be able to see exactly how well they've been stacking it up. Yeah, hopefully we'll get a peek. And Piao is, well, a little bit behind on farm, about 15 at this point. So we do get a peek at the gold overall. Again, slight leads, but of course, Tabula Rasa significantly ahead of Kimo. And I think that is the biggest point to watch. And of course, the mid lane, that one kill difference, gonna help out Tom Goku quite a lot. Yeah, and you can see he got that plus 12 there. That was a change, what, two, three seasons ago? Everyone was freaking out about it. Oh my goodness, Nasus is gonna be so good. And then no one played Nasus after that. But nonetheless, good to get those stacks up. You know, about 100 there at six minutes. Uh, usually what you're looking to see out in Nasus in terms of solo queue stats is like you want to get 200, 250 stacks by 10 minutes, and then you can go like 300 stacks a minute or so. Uh, we'll see if that's the case this time around. It's gonna be a little bit challenging, but maybe a little bit of fighting on this bottom side. Dragon is getting started. Oh my. Oh, Kimo just hopped right in. Doesn't land the flag and drag, and that puts, puts him in an awkward spot, but so is Soda, wrong side of the wall, as a huge binding on a Tom Goku slows this fight down. Pass me the John, still going down. Kills going over to Devourer, who's trying to kite out against Tabula Rasa, but T still left untouched. Able to walk on forward. It's even so far. Kimo dives back in. The extra auto's enough, and now T has to try and run away. No dash available but no damage present quite yet. A little faster 
barely escaping, oh. decides to try and take the kill. Instead, it's Chemo and SDSU come out on top of a scrappy fight. Yeah, just barely coming out on top at that, you know, by the slimmest of margins. The Devourer just able to eat a little bit more there. Gets a couple of kills there as well. So, going to be feeling quite good about themselves. Chemo cleaning up just to make sure that the Caitlyn stays alive. But, yeah, you look at where all this gold is going. It's going on to Sakali. It's going on to Tabula Rasa. So, all this gold is getting funneled into Caitlyn is going to be a detriment directly to T on the opposite side. It's in a thousand gold lead here, which is rather significant. This Caitlyn's going to start to build towards her mythic a little bit earlier. She already has those tier two boots, but everywhere else on the map is going to start to skew a little bit more towards SJ. So if you look at this top side of the map specifically, this Malphite and his Graves are going to have a lot better time versus this Nasus, at least for the time being. We'll see how long that lasts, though, because now with the Sheen coming through, that means that on the top side, this Nasus gets a lot more uh, freedom to just stack up because, you know, they have that extra little bit of damage. It's a little bit easier to execute those minions and you can manage the wave a little bit easier as well. Absolutely, is oh. purely just getting caught from the roam. Ensemble Force enough and seal will grab that kill. A little bit of a zoom in, gonna push this wave out, look towards the Herald. So good work on the map from San Jose. Yeah, really good rotation over. And uh, you no, know, if you can't make a play in your own lane because there's a Nasus who can just gain 300 health when he presses his ultimate, go to the mid lane. Purely still trying to scale up, trying to make it work. And while they were able to get a decent amount of that hex core fragments uh, going for themselves off of getting the kill, getting a couple of cysts, it's still going to be a while before this victor really comes online. Granted, building towards that Leandre's, knowing that there's going to be a little bit of beef on the opposite side with Tabula Rasa going for the core drinker means that they need that more consistent damage. And you no, know, the victor will get there in due time, but for the time being, it's just a little bit of a tough situation against some Goku who can just sort of walk in there, use those base damages early to just sort of bully out this victor. But junglers taking a peep at each other. I don't think they're going to go for anything too crazy quite yet. Yeah, looks like a holding pattern for mid laners so far, but with the reset taken by Seal earlier, it opens the door for SDSU to just pick up this Herald. So good recognition that with San Jose not taking it, they just snatched it up themselves and pick up an objective. Yeah, good for them to get that in the inventory as well, because if you're playing for this early game, you want to sort of push the temple a little bit. They could just drop this down mid and potentially rotate over to this dragon, but I think they might be a little bit too late. Tabula Rasa already over there starting that one up, and yeah, it's not even going to be a contest. So first dragon going the opposite way. A trade of objectives. The main thing that I always like to point out, though, is yes, you got an early Rift Herald, but Rift Herald is only a potential to get more objectives off of it, whereas dragon is guaranteed stats for the rest of the game. So sometimes those Rift Heralds end up just getting wasted. You toss it down and it doesn't make it to the tower where it only gets one plate, or you toss it down after plates are done. Kimo just needs to make sure that they find a fight on the back end of it, drop it down, and potentially get two or more plates to make it really worth it at the end of the day. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that this bot lane is probably the next point where after the early action, it seems uh, San Jose, they're they're done fighting now that there's such an advantage for Devourer. I've been managing the wave pretty well, too, so of course, got to keep that in mind is now they're a little too far forward. Kimo is sitting in wait. Doesn't seem like he's going to opt to pull the trigger here. And it's just going to be farm fest here in the bot side. So San Jose they've managed to hold on and actually just itemizing straight towards the mythic leaves uh, them and devour on pretty even footing. Yeah, relatively even footing for now. Of course, if we look at the gold, we might see that you no know, devourer's got a little bit more in the inventory as well. 11 minutes in, 222 stacks. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, it actually directly going for that mythic might just pay off. I think T might be able to finish that up at the same time as Devourer, which is interesting. Granted, Caitlyn did just get a buy. Yeah, it's not the completed mythic yet. So interesting. This is going to make for a potentially an explosive bot lane fight. Piao just being a little bit annoying for Tabula Rasa there. Nonetheless, we'll have to see how that fight actually plays out because now you can see the Jarvan on that bottom side. Just going to probably drop down that Rift Herald and guarantee a couple plates for that Caitlyn so that she can get to that Mythic, knowing full well that he might be coming back to lane with that little, little bit of extra. Yeah, his first plate's going to go down. They're going to try and get a second. So this Herald get that tower real, real low. And indeed, not quite finding the final one. Binding going wide. Man, Soda's just, ooh, ooh. oh my gosh, almost dying right off the rip. Airy, not quite enough damage. So uh, Soda almost put on the menu this time, though. Not going to be an issue, but Chemo still waiting in the 
comes out, it's just going to have to be giving up this turret unless T has a death wish. Is... We'll use the culling instead to clear the wave. Oh. That will be hopefully enough, but that mythic advantage passed me the John just barely alive. Tom Goku is here, so now it's a 3v3 technically, but one member very low and a nice use of the cataclysm to disengage. No one goes down. Yeah, pass me the John saying, pass me the band-aids there. Are gonna have to try and get out of there alive. Just barely. I think single digit HP for a brief moment there. Almost able to finish it up with T, but I think just lost vision. Ooh, that was a risky back as well for John. But now all these plates are just getting flipped back the opposite way. And this is the interesting part about that Rift Herald play. Yes, you're almost able to take down that entire tower, but overstaying a little bit too long, greeting for that extra plate means that you're giving over two plates back. And now all of a sudden this game just getting evened back up despite the potential of that Rift Herald. It ends up being a little bit of an overstep. And now this game might actually start to skew a little bit more towards SJSU's favor because of those extra stats they got from that Ocean Dragon. Yeah, but I mean... If we're talking about a difference in stats and a difference between these teams just being the Ocean Drake, I mean, it's a real statement, I think, to how close these teams are, especially relative to the conference as a whole, right? 200 gold separating these two teams, both of them having one neutral objective. Well, now Soda might ruin the symmetry. Is I was going to say, we're even on kills as well, even on towers. So, even on plates. I even think. on plates. I mean, like, look at these guys. They're giving us such perfect symmetry. I gotta double check about how many plates are on that mid lane as well, because uh, that bot tower is about to fall. But look at this. Oh, wait. It's a ghost committed. If he gets in wither range, that's probably gonna be it. Oh. Does land the wither. One E. There's the chomp down. Plus 12 for Pow. That's a first kill for the dog barking up in the top lane. 312 stacks there as well, so starting to get those underway. And now with that Divine Sunder, most likely going to be going for a little bit more of that ability haste as well. We'll just start to be able to eat down this Malphite. Slowly but surely, the rock will crumble. Now might even possibly take that tower down. It was really interesting to see that Seal went for that play. I think they were trying to get that last plate before it expired, but it ended up overstaying, and I don't even think they got the plate, so it ends up being a complete negative play. The flash down, the ultimate down, you get chased down by Piao. Now, all of a sudden, this top lane going to look a lot more scary, intimidating for the Rock. Oh, Soda. Oh, Soda's just dead. Nothing else to be said. Jarvan locked his sights down and grabbed Soda. And now turret's down. Cataclysm dropped. T barely able to dash out one extra with that Gale Force, proving to be enough. And Tom Goku getting chunked out very low as well. So this little wrecking ball in the mid lane for San Diego doing so much work just one kill but now in great position to pick up this dra dragon uh, now they're gonna start to trade these objectives back you know there's a rift child spawning in a little bit we'll find out if tabula rasa opts to go to that side of the map as well to potentially trade the objectives back the opposite way but once again guaranteed stats versus a potential for a tower or something like that might not always be the best case scenario especially when it's not first tower in this situation so it's going to be even less value with hex gates now popping up on the rift these rotations are going to start to get a little bit crazy here as well. Always curious to see how these play out. I think Hexdrift is probably my favorite one, just because there's so many, like, odd rotations and odd flanks you can get. All of a sudden, this Nasus doesn't always have to, you know, teleport behind them. You can just take a, you know, take a tunnel, and all of a sudden, you're ghosting behind the enemy team. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, man. I was going to add a point, but now won't be, wouldn't be able to reach it as Devourer is potentially just getting dove down. Instead, it's T who's caught too far forward. Oh. Soda took the damage from that final spark. It seemed it was enough. A ton of damage is hitting in one fell swoop. So bot lane just falling immediately for San Jose. Yeah, the tower damage just ramps up so quickly. John, though, oh, should be able to get Trying out. Oh, walk. No. oh, no. No band-aids are going to be enough for that one, and neither for Devourers. We just get a back and forth. They just trade bot lanes for a little bit of side lane pressure as Curly doing more work on the bot side. Yeah, Curly just doing what they can. Still in this Victor, trying to scale up slowly but surely, going to be building up all that extra... Oomph you get? All the augments. Yeah, that's what they are. <laughs> building all of those I up like over oomph. time with <laughs> more... Is it is more oomph. You know, you do more damage, you get more utility, you get a lot of stuff out of those. So, you know... This slowly but surely is going to start to build up building towards that shadow flame but yeah a little bit of mispositioning coming through from devourer there Not the best of situations to give an akali an extra kill where realistically it should have just been the one should have just been john going down 
nonetheless, it's just you keeping it close, keeping it interesting here. We did this before, Steel. It didn't work out in your favor. Gotta be careful. Yeah, I had a jungler, but wasn't ready for a chemo to come around as well. It'll be a rampage now for the King of Demacia as the Hex Gate used to escape. You said you wanted to see some creativity. See how the teams use them? Tabula Rasa using it for a very sneaky escape. Yeah, and it's just the wither that came down, so it wasn't any damage. But meanwhile, mid lane, chemo has the Cataclysm still. I'm not going to pull the trigger. Oh, not quite. Seems Sodas found themselves inside rumbling of that cataclysm a few too many times ops to back up but i'm gonna tell you something so the hex gates right that's what we know that they're called right well yeah. at usf there's a caster his name's david aka cooley live and uh, he liked to call them the whoopty wopty gates for all of the wackiness that they bring to the rift and uh it seems that <laughs> you're gonna need uh, some real wackiness to escape that one as soda Gets caught on the wrong side of the wall, and will just fall. Yeah, it is good that we had that play happen, so it can take me an extra 20 seconds to understand the whoop de wop -de gates. Yes. And getting a nice view of that. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted your I'm thoughts on it, because I felt, yeah. I, I was just wondering, like, what are the thoughts? There are no thoughts. He's just stunned speechless by this new, uh, Casting tech is passing the John oh. getting hit with some Akali tech. The in and out from Tom Goku for a second does go very low, has to escape out. So far, just one falling for SDSU. Tom Goku is still quite low. Seal trying to create a little space, and Soda still not around. Both teams just dancing around, and it seems that Piao wants to walk up and say, I've been oh. top lane all game, but you know what happens when Anasis joins the team? He starts rolling over it. Looking for Tom Goku to start. So does the first to fall once again. Back to back deaths for the team. And then a shutdown onto Tom Goku. The ultimate ends, but Kimo and Devourer are still trying to kite. T staying alive. And the ultimate from Tabula Rasa wiping a new slate onto the King of Demacia as Piao working his way forward. Tabula uh -oh. staying alive for so long, but the dog reigns supreme as Seal caught in the wither will eventually go down, binding for good measure. And Piao, what a, the big dog on campus. Oh my goodness. And Piao just shows up and says, yep, there's a reason why the last part of my name is King because I am the king of the top lane. Comes through, eats all those souls for breakfast, lunch, and dinner there. Incredible play coming through from the Nasus. Able to just find so much value. Tom Goku's teleporting in. Not sure if I want to see that Akali go in on that. Do not press the E button again. Yeah, just going to back out from there. <laughs> Ends up being a little bit of a wasted summoner, but yeah, Piao sitting at 507 stacks now has been an absolute menace. Just stacking it up. I always ask, what's that dog doing? That dog stacking. It's doing it real well at this point. Two completed items, lots of ability haste. More fighting to come, but essentially. Ooh. Uh oh. D just trying to escape the callings oh. drop, but there's so much damage at range. Lux doing Lux things. Smite to secure the kill. And Kimo adds another kill to their name. Seal might want to keep this fight going. The Herald dropped for a distraction and to make sure it gets out. Tom Goku being spaced out for the moment. Tidal Wave being used as the trigger to go in, but there's so little damage. Cataclysm onto Seal. Kimo just trying to work his way down, and Tom Goku no backline access as Tabula Rasa still working on a couple Ooh. carries. Seal gets a few, but there's few. Too many members of SDSU running on forward as Tabula Rasa will get shut down. And it's just Soda who escapes this time. Dies at the start and end of the sequence last fight. And this time, the only to escape. Yeah, Soda's had a tough time of things here. I mean, the Nami is always sort of that difficult part of the Lucian Nami lane. You know, you're always giving to T in every situation. But even then, you know, this Lucian hasn't been able to pick up a lot of those kills, and we talked about it from the get-go. Tabula Rasa, the one to pick up a lot of that gold on those bot lane exchanges. Meanwhile, you know, it's T trying to get towards those... Went for the Lucidity Boots, actually, building towards the Navori in this situation, trying to make something out of nothing in a lot of situations. Now, you know, your Caitlyn's got that Infinity Edge. She's able to provide a lot more damage. She has that additional range to sort of be able to extend out these fights a little bit longer. There's an ass just walking you down, quite literally strutting his stuff there. Stacking stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks. 
you're going to be feeling pretty lost if you are this Lucian, because if you don't have that flash, if you don't have that dash, if you don't have that Gale Force, you are getting chased down, and you are going to get taken down like the dog you are. Yeah, and, and this Baron is just gone. That reset from T just coming at the worst timing. No one on San Jose State knows this is going down, but SDSU, they're just rushing it. Tabula Rasa might try and take a peek. Not even gonna get that as the Baron falls as the Blue Ward comes down. And SDSU have finally broken this game open. Yeah, they've opened it up incredibly so as well. And I think a lot of that comes off of, you know, even in some of those fights, Curly was able to get a decent amount of kill participation, able to stack that up, got to two items as well now. So all of a sudden, this Victor is going to start to be a threat. We talked about how, you know, Nasus isn't the craziest late game carry. Nasus is at almost three items here, still in sort of mid game mode here, looking at the opposition there. It's two items maximum on some of these members, you know, just finished the Navori on this Lucian as well. But the Nami, the Akali are just kind of behind the curve a little bit here in terms of their itemization. They don't have tools to survive against Piao here now starting to take a reset already level 15 in this game finishing up that third item this nasus is large and in charge that he is and we were worried in champ select that this you know 15 to 25 minute period could be when sdsu are weak if they don't get ahead and if this caitlin lux doesn't start um doing some work and if this nasus might get shut down and instead it's right when this nasus is spiked chemo has just been so strong on the Jarvan all game. And now it's given space for Kyorly to come into their element. This initially two and O oh, Graves just not doing a ton. Of course, this 2v1 easily won by the mid jungle duo, but sacrificing defending your mid lane tier two as Kimo will walk up. The final spark will secure oh. the space. Seal goes in with the unstoppable force, but the damage is still boxed out. Devourer doesn't even care about the rock and just runs right on past. It's Kimo will finish up the kill. Some Goku, though, he's here. He's trying to find the back line. Has the flank. Dives on in. Drops the shroud. But here comes the dog. Tom Goku trying to do what they can. Managed to escape with one. Tabula Rasa coming back around the fight. But there's the Nasus. Still just getting everyone low. No one quite ready to go down to the cane. And somehow they all survive. And Piao is left with no kills to their name. Instead, we're going to keep going. Teleport dropped by Cure Lee. Soda going to go down. Seol getting slowed up. Has to flash away from the gravity well. And the Inhib Tower will eventually fall. This inhibitor looks soon to fall as well. Only Devour and Soda falling in that entire exchange. I think T might have gone down as well. But still, very, very back and forth. And it's SDSU coming out with the inhib. Yeah, and I think a major factor of that is Tom Goku sort of has the sauce to get away from Piao in a lot of these situations. You just sit in the shroud. You sit in the shroud for four seconds, and Piao just sits there and ultimate and is like, well, I'm doing damage to you in my circle, but that's about it. Uh, th I think that's the main way that they can sort of avoid these fights, but that's the main thing about Nasus is that you can just sort of kite around. There's so much mobility available still. Yes, Tabula Rasa was forced to burn the flash. Yes, Seal got sort of caught out at the end forced to flash out as well yes t has three dashes to get away from everything in a lot of these situations but it's once those are all expended if you're able to find these long extended fights the nasa is going to still get a lot of value and i think even still you know it prevents a tom goku from just going in directly to the back lane going for the jugular in a lot of these situations as far as the sort of accept that they got a, a cut on the arm they gotta accept that their execution was like wasn't perfect it was like okay out of 10 you know maybe like a six out of 10 execution you know it's, it's, it's all about those perfect executions but when those ex perfect executions can't be perfect because of the situation notably a dog in your face mm -hmm. you know you, you just gotta accept with what you get and i mean akali got out alive and i think that's the best that she could have asked for yeah c's get degrees and okay yeah. out of 10 gets the job done you stay alive at least for the time being but the, these are college students come on we we know you know oh yeah of course, I just graduated. You're still in uh, school, so we, we get it. We're here for all the players. We're, we're on the same mentality, have those late nights, those moments where you're just trying to keep it going. But SDSU are having no problems. It's just going to be a clean dragon take. Not much San Jose State can try to do here. It does look like they're going to try and get a little counterplay on the top side, though, and I do like this decision. At the very least, keep getting something back. And I think it, it's just about sort of getting vision around this Baron. Granted, it's a little early for that, you know, a minute and a half until that one spawns. 
going to be able to take down a tier 2 on the top side as well. So at the very least, they're still keeping it going. They're trying to continue to push any sort of advantage that they can. And now Pao's in a really rough situation. This is not a situation that Nasus wants to be in with multiple members closing in. Look, here comes Kimo. Yeah, but the thing is, he just stays alive oh. for so long. Soda taking one slap from the cane will wind up falling, but Tom Goku has set the trap and just goes into the back. But Devourer picks up the kill instead. And now Piao is saying, I'm not stuck in here with you. You're stuck in here with me. But with the back line so low, with uh -oh. T still being full health, it seems both sides have just sort of said, we're going to walk away from this one. Yeah, honestly great response from SDSU to rotate multiple members over. Yes, that backline was deathly low just because of Tom Goku trying to get in there, but yeah, Soda had no chance there. Basically, the dog said, I want sushi for dinner tonight. Cut him up. Three chops there. You know, most sushi chefs, they do take a, a very precise chops in that situation. This isn't the situation. The dog just wants to eat. Just chop it in half. Yep, this is manageable. I'm gonna eat it up. Yeah, gets the soul for it. 768 stacks. That's that's quite good. We talked about, you know, 300 stacks per minute after, you know, your initial 200 there. Pretty much on pace there. I think uh, our friend Kalka King has been paying attention to some old Trick to G videos of that situation. Yeah, but doing real well. Keeping it going in the side lane. And, of course, once you pass, like, the 700, uh, 800 range, squishies are just paper thin to you at that point. They're two-shottable. And yeah. the rest of the On team. that note, how much health does Soda have? Probably like 1,400. Yeah, well, we'll check because the, it quite literally could just be a two shot. Yeah, I, I think and it's not crit. No. Crit Nasus is always the funny one. Oh, oh, 1,700, actually more than I expected. Okay. But yeah, there's like those crit Nasus ones where it's like Dusk Blade and then Infinity Edge and they just knock them down. It's like, oh, well, there's your support going. You have the no disappearing dog. That. Just going in and out of the shadows. That, that's basically what Tom Goku does, but you know, has a shroud for it. If the dog could do that too, that would be. Uh, quite a sequence of events. How do Russell's in trouble? Yeah, use the dash to get over. Short cooldown, so no problem. Kimo <laughs> slaps the Baron <laughs> once for good measure and then walks away. But in the meantime, a, couple a few too many members were brought over, Ooh. and that's going to be objective bounty picked up. Seal does teleport, so there is that Malphite up and ready to rumble. Does just walk Ooh. into the team. Is taking a chunk of damage, but still pretty tanky. Brought down to half health. Actually, with the Chaos Storm dropped as well, oh. that might be the go button as everyone follows the rock, and it's not going to be enough off the outset. Tom Goku shut down in the back line, and it's all falling apart for this fight no. that San Jose chose to take. The ADCs are all together. Piao picked up a kill on the back side. Tabula Rasa surviving forever. Eventually does get taken down. It's a triple for Devourer, and it looks like SDSU are looking at the base. Yeah, they might just try and end here. The Nasus full health. Surprise, surprise, when your passive says, Nasus gains 10% life skill, you're going to be able to heal up pretty quickly, especially when your Qs are doing that much damage. And now it seems as if they want to end off that game. 864 stacks. That is a big dog. Hey, Turbo, I gotta ask you, what the dog doing? Because that dog has been stacking, been eating well. Just end the game. He's ending the game. That's what the dog is doing. Everyone's gonna run out, but there should just be a couple hits from the cane. Piao gonna get the last one. Plus 50, plus 6, plus everything. As we were maybe a little worried out of Champ Select, said it was a little spice. But boy, did it show up, and it made the difference that game. Yeah, just the right amount of spice. You know, they didn't overdo the cinnamon and the chicken this time around. It worked out like a charm. And honestly, I think that Piao just showed that they know how to play that matchup. You know, we were worried in the early game, just looking at it, saying, oh, the Nasus is down 15 farm. Hmm, this isn't right. You know, the Nasus isn't really getting off the ground. The Malphite was able to roam mid. Might be a little bit testy there. But nonetheless, you know, once they were able to come alive, they got that one kill on the Malphite. They got the Divine Sunder. They were able to get to that Frozen Heart. They joined one fight. They get three kills, and it's over. It just felt like the game snowballed so far out of control at that point. And honestly, props to SDSU for just sort of sticking to the game plan and preventing the Spartans from sort of fighting back in that regard. You know, in the movie 300, they all hold the line. They're able to hold, hold, hold the situation. Unfortunately, they were beat by a dog. That dog was 
really fed. So <laughs> with with good reason, the 300 did fall. Yeah, he's looking a little bit more like Cerberus than a house pet. So he was really stepping up. Didn't quite have three heads, but could definitely get a triple kill if everyone lined up up as it was a big showing out of the dog great start for sdsu as they look to take the current number one in the league down a peg as we'll be right back with game number two operations you can get involved in and how to utilize your followings or if you don't have to or want to be a social media star are there ways in which you can monetize it now i know i described that under the umbrella of the ncaa but i see it as being no different in esports, I think there are massive opportunities for people with followings to be able to use that and connect with brands. I think a company like us can help you to do that. And then beyond that, we can make sure that those transactions are safe for you. I think there are opportunities, not just at the individual competitor level, but at the program level to have a sponsorship go to that. I'm sure some of you out there listening and watching already have deals like that in place, but I think we can continue to enhance augment those deals and make them more comprehensive and make them uh, first of all i think product deals are perfectly fine but i think we can get beyond that and grow some of these deals to a greater extent Pauly, thoughts on that yeah um you know you what you said is right so i'll put it in for layman's terms here for just the esports players because i talked to so many of our yeah. athletes that compete in our cecc series that are currently still in college and basically what what, what when mike blue says nil what he's referring to is just sim very simple. If a brand or any sort of anyone wants to use your school's name, name or your name or your brand or anything with you, there is a deal for you that can be put in place, whether it's product deal, whether it's a paid endorsement, you can, whether you're a macro influencer or whether you're a micro influencer, you can be paid for your services. So uh, most of the people, when I talk to them, most of the, I won't say people, college athletes, they are, uh, you know, intimidated by the word. They don't really know what it means. They've never done anything with it before. And that's what it means. Any single time a brand or anyone at all wants to use your name or do a, a deal with you or do so, some sort of activation with you or your school, that's basically what the layman's terms, the NIL uh, meaning comes from. And uh, it, it's evolving in this space. There are so many brands that want to associate with micro and macro influencers uh, and just get people involved with their products or their services. So all of you, you know, collegiate athletes out there that are competing in esports, uh, very uh, keep. Not only are we trying to broker those deals, but also keep your eyes, ears open, and don't be shy or or scared to take these deals because that's what I've heard the most is that most of the time they're just scared to take them. They don't know what they are. They don't know if they're locking themselves into some agreement or terms that they're like going to give their name away or something too. So uh, this is a really important space and it's how you're all going to physically make money and build your brands along with company brands. So it's really important to learn. And my, my advice is to just get your feet wet. Don't worry about shying away, read the contracts and take some of these deals because growing your own brand is the future of what our, our industry is going to be in my opinion. Exactly. And if you follow in the, in the pro space, um, you'll see that uh, the pro teams are not only focusing on competitive play, but a lot of them are focusing on their brand and, and their cultural importance in the space. And so, you know, one of the things that we do also is help athletes build their brand, build their following. And that's part of what Pauly and Kyler are doing on their side when we do this behind the scenes training. And so, you know, building your brand, this is the creator economy. Uh, anybody and everybody can be anything they want to be. And so we just really want to be the conduit that supports that across the board. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. With that said, thank you, everyone, for, I think, for great insights in terms of for any of you that were watching this and maybe had questions about, you know, what is eSports U? What is CSMG? Who are they? What are they doing? What are our plans, right? Well, you know, we, we, we know we kind of tried to make a bigger splash in the spring and we're excited to bring more stuff with you guys for the next year. But I think maybe as we close out here, I know we're, we're slowly approaching on time then, but maybe let's go around the room with everyone here of just what's one thing that we're all excited for for this next upcoming year. I know we touched on our plans and a lot of things, but if anyone had to speak, if you had to speak to just one thing, of just what has you excited for for us as a company, for us as the collegiate or college esports space, right? Uh, what's one thing that has all of you guys excited? And maybe we'll start with Mike since our expert. Well, 
Welcome back, as we just saw dog to get ahead. They brought out the Nasus. Susan, if you're from the Dark Ages when we refer to Sazen, Susan, Nasus as just their name in reverse, gave it the Ekans treatment from Pokemon. But now we're back, and it's on San Jose to try and figure out an answer. Yeah, and I think that a lot of that map, that wow, a lot of that map, man, I'm really just <laughs> Valorant filled at this one. A lot of that game was just... Uh, the Akali wasn't allowed to be a true West Coaster, you know, was sort of stuck in Virginia in that situation because she could not get in and out to save her life in those situations, was stuck just trying to stay alive in the shroud and unfortunately <laughs> didn't work out quite as well. And you know, if, if you just if you just want your burger, you know, if you just want something animal style, unfortunately <laughs> the animal you got was the dog. My goodness, that Nasus was going animal style all over them. Yeah, honestly, they were... <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I had in and out for the first time like a month ago actually fantastic it was great it's they really are what they say they brought the animal style and, and yeah it was just too much going on too many animals on the side of san diego state there's only a little fish flopping around for san jose so they were stuck at the sushi bar and it was an all you can eat for piao and now looking at the start Caitlyn taking off the table, a lot of focus against Devourer and Tabula Rasa in the band. Yeah, and this checks out. I mean, SDS, you don't have to change anything. I mean, they didn't even change sides at that point. You know, they have the agency to just sit there and say, hey, listen, you can you can redraft the exact same comp. We're going to figure something else out. And in this situation, they take that Jarvan off the board and they say, hey, you know what? There's a tier list here. Jarvan's up near the top of there. You know who's right down there next to him? Wukong. Wukong's still a great champion. Didn't really get a whole lot of changes. Still really annoying to deal with. So just put it on. Give it to Chemo there. You still have your team fight start. Exactly. And could see just the Graves picked up once again for San Jose. I was going to say, once again, matchup we've totally 100% never seen before. The Wukong and the Graves, both very strong. Both going to like that Black Cleaver update and those buffs moving forward for these bruisers. And now the Draven. Okay. He said, I, uh, I wasn't aggro enough on the Lucian Nami. Give me the Draven. Give me the axes. And I think this is a really smart call here because the Lucian Nami is still up and available. If they don't pick it up, it's just going to be Draven Pike going the opposite way or something incredibly aggressive on this bottom side of the map. I think this is going to give T and Soda potentially more agency. You can pick Draven Nami as well if they don't opt to go for that. So there's multiple different avenues for T to get a little bit more agency on that bottom side of the map. And, you know, in this situation, now you can get mad at your jungle if they're like, yeah, I'm going to take this kill. They're going to say, hey, Tabula Rasa, come down here, but don't take the kills. Give it to me because he gets so much more gold. And Draven is one of those champions that can just snowball out of control so so quickly if left unattended there this is an interesting combo if it does come through though varus plus oh my okay. gosh in, in my ash. head i was thinking varus ash i was thinking it i didn't say anything because i was just like there's no way they're just gonna go for the carrier bot lane and they did they grabbed it i doubt that they're gonna put carrier on the varus not carrier of course pass me the john carrier's not in this game that would be i think there'd be some import rules against that there would, but, there'd be a lot of rules around. Yeah, that. there'd be a lot of rules. Um, but we are gonna see the Varus Ash in the bot lane. So I'm excited. We've got the go buttons. We've got the press R they die into the Draven Thresh, into the you get hooked once, you're gonna die. Yeah, it's the press R die at level six from the side of S D S D S U. I I called that I was gonna mix up these letters <laughs> at some point, but on SJSU side here. It's literally a, a level one you die situation in a lot of these cases. You know, you have to play towards range here. And in this situation as well, I'm worried if the Varus doesn't opt to go for something like a lethality build here because you have to play full distance away from this bot lane. You know, once again, multi-season throwback here. It's like season seven, season eight. Back in the heyday of League YouTube, you used to see these Vincent Draven videos, the dude from China, right? He would just mm -hmm. go and he'd get like a pentakill at level one. And at yep. seven minutes, he'd have like four items and he'd be just sitting in the base. He'd always have the duel with the Thresh, just be pulling people out. You know, the Thresh would have like 18 deaths at the end of it from diving the fountain. But the Draven would have like 50 kills or something. And everyone's yep. just like, man, I don't even want to play this game anymore. And that's, that's the situation here. You need to respect the Draven Thresh here. And... You know, just going through the rest of the bands, a bunch of solo lane bands, whatever. We want to talk about the bot lane. That's what matters in Jackson's yeah. event, too. I was gonna say, they, they, they did ban the dog, so San Jose <laughs> putting some respect on it, <laughs> getting rid of it, saying, get out of my game. I don't want to see it. 
not allowed. He's been sent to the pound. So very unfortunate, very, very sad. Someone go please adopt him now. But San Diego responding to Jax with a victor. So actually it's gonna be the Ori. It's pretty similar play style, both big team fighters, but San Diego State, there are a lot of very, very good team fighting ultimates. And oh, we get the Fiora as well for some extra healing, for some extra dueling power on top. And I, and I really like this pickup here from the Fiora because uh, it's technically it's a skill matchup, but realistically, we saw what Piao was able to do on that top side of the map. And I mean, I say technically a skill matchup because yes, Jackson hold that Counter-Strike for as long as possible, but a lot of the situations, you know, you can only hold it for so long. The repost eventually the longer you hold it yourself, the more likely it is that you're able to get a stun in return. So it's mm -hmm. one of those situations where you have to switch up the timing a lot if you're still on this top side of the map as well. But the thing is, you also have to make sure you're not always just jump strike, immediately counter striking, and you have to try and switch up those patterns there. It's the conditioning, you know, the dog may have been benched, but we still can use those same, you know, ideas. Pavlov came through it, you know, you walk up to the dog too many times, he's gonna start to kill you with those siphoning strikes. This situation, you keep jumping in on the Fiora, eventually she's gonna repost you every single time. So I like this pickup on the opposite side of the map, and I like how SDSU in this situation, they've drafted themselves a really nice 4-1 comp. They've got this pick mm -hmm. potential here with the Bears, with the Ash, with the Wukong, the Ori. They all work together really well with their ultimates. Fiora can just, you know, go to the top side she can take like eight towers on her own she can just do whatever she wants and so long as she's able to get the tools to survive against the victor against the jacks against possibly both of them at once you're going to be in a really good situation meanwhile the flip side it's all about that bot lane. it is all yeah. about the draven thresh there's a reason why we spent so long talking about it even through that second phase of bands because it is such an x factor for the side of sjsu here yeah, exactly. Where for San Diego, they drafted a very utility heavy bot lane where press R, they will always be useful champions. It doesn't matter how far behind they may fall, how many times you die, Enchanted Crystal Arrow is always useful. But the thing is, it's going to start mattering if it's going to be T picking up those kills. It's going to start mattering if you're constantly getting hooked out by this Thresh and you're maybe seeing this victor come down get a couple assists no kills of course you got to feed those over to the draven let him get that adoration but still I, this san jose team can snowball very very effectively and it feels like that's sort of the difference right where san diego they've got streamlined team focus team fighting and really composition whereas san jose they want to get ahead and they want to stay ahead yeah, and it's really just the, about a difference of styles as well. You know, this bot lane effectively for Devour and John is, you know, play safe. Just mm -hmm. play safe. They're effectively just admitting that they're going to sack this lane. You know, in a lot of situations, you still have that sort of laning power in uh, the Ash and the Veras in terms of your poke and everything, but you don't really have the kill switch in that regard. Meanwhile, on the flip side, Tien and Soda, they, their kill switch is on, and it's more so about if you can turn it off in some regard. And it's going to be really difficult to do that, even uh, as the Varus Ash, because you just don't have any way to you know, kill them a whole lot in that lane. It's all about the poke. It's all about if T overplays in that situation. So a lot of this bot lane hinges on whether T stays alive or falls down, and that's going to be the difficult situation of it. It all falls on one member, well, two members as well, Soda landing hooks and all that. And you're just going to have to try and play towards your top side of the map. But of course, we know that Fiora is not going to be the most amazing champion before an item, an item and a mm -hmm. half. Oriana versus Victor. We talk about matchups that we've seen a lot of. I think this is probably like the most played mid matchup after a certain elo, I think, at a certain point, just because it's it's two of the safest mid laners. It's two mages. You get exactly what you get with those champions. You farm till six, and then you farm some more, and then you farm some more, and then you press R and T fights. Yeah, exactly. It's like the it's like the Queen's Gambit of League, where everyone at the highest level just understands it in and out, and they just play it whenever they need to play safe and make sure that they're not going to lose on the spot and not go for anything risky. And I think that's a pretty good place for both of these mid laners. I think Tom Goku definitely wanted to make a lot of those plays last game and got really really close in a lot of spots but i think because the margins were so fine and because some of those fights hinged on did akali land that one ability did we get that extra tiny pinch of damage was it that last auto needed now you've just got a ton of damage coming through with this victor he can make that difference he can stay even with the oriana you're not worrying about that lane and of course the later this goes you can contest the Varus with that poke but I'm also just going to be watching for Kimo because last game they were such a playmaker on the Jarvan and now on the Wukong, they want to do the same thing. Yeah, and I think that's 
what it's going to come down to is if Tabula Rasa can sort of match and take control of the jungle tempo this game as well because uh, in a lot of ways last game the early game was very good from Tabula Rasa but eventually it got to a point where they sort of got underfed or they just didn't have as much opportunity and I think that's what it came down to it was just opportunity cost that was available for Tabula Rasa because there was a dog running at you you can't really fight if you're just going to get withered and you're going to get slowed for 90 percent you're going to get your attack speed you know sent into a factor of four at that point you really just need to make sure that you're taking the fights early here as tabula rasa and just taking advantage of what your champion is best at yeah exactly taking advantage of what you can do what you know you can do and not trying to overplay that hand and i think overplaying is going to be the real point for san jose because i think we saw some moments last game right like seal on the top side up against piao trying to get that last plate it's a moment of overplaying a little bit where you think you're a little stronger than you are and i think we could look to that moment as the point that the tempo dis definitively started to shift towards san diego state and i think this game we're going to see a similar moment probably right around 15 minutes unless T just starts popping off on the Draven. That's always a yeah. possibility. You get one or two kills. You find yourself up five kills worth of gold. I mean, just yesterday I was playing a game with some buddies. My friend was playing Draven in the bot lane. He got his first kill and he cashed in for 900. Like, th there's just some absurd gold amounts that you can wind up just sitting on. And you get that one cash in and suddenly the game's broken open. Yeah, and I think it also comes down to... This is completely off topic, but also what skin the Draven uses. Because, you know, there's some Draven nope, that's skins true. that are it's just like, they do more more damage than others. Like, I think the biggest thing is Han Samo, whenever he plays Draven, he always uses Soul Reaver Draven, yep. which is like the EU West Draven special <laughs> in a lot of senses. Like, the ones that are going to, like, be really toxic in Solo Q, they use Gladiator Draven. Yep. And I think, I I'm trying to think, like, if you use Draven Draven, you're, you don't actually play Draven. That's the one where you're like, yeah, you don't actually play that champion. So it really comes down to what T ops to go for in terms of the like, skin here. Uh, I think debonair draven and like mecha kingdoms draven um, those are going to be some pretty good chances at getting a carry performance uh if we see base draven i'm not going to be happy you know what draven <laughs> has a lot of really good skills so you know you, you gotta step it up in that regard as well but mm -hmm. all jokes aside about that uh, i think that it really just hinges on this draven in a lot of ways and if this draven can't get off the ground or if this draven you know loses hundreds of stacks off of a, a mistimed death or something uh, the game plan sort of falls apart for the side of sjsu so they've sort of built themselves up a house of cards uh, you know they live in a glass house right now and they can throw their axes but the thing is as soon as a rock gets thrown the opposite way as soon as a monkey comes barreling down through the door your glass house is going to fall your house of cards is going to crumble in on itself and it's going to be a little bit more challenging but you still have that late game possibility with the graves the victor the jacks they've got some agency so we'll have to see how it plays out agency play it's an agency play guys 100 percent calculated agency plays gonna have to come through as now we're getting in and we get to see another side of the rift as our wildlife tour continues thanks to our observer ibram of course and ibram always a pleasure to work with as well provides us a nice glimpse of the wildlife last game we got the duck we got the frog and we also got the dog this time i got the deer and there's a monkey on the rift as well it's Draven. Oh my. No, no. <laughs> oh no! They cast their curse No! Oh man. You said you didn't want to see Draven Draven. And uh. Draven Draven's. It's the skin that, like, non Draven players use. It's also, like, honestly, it's. it's an, I understand it's an April Fool skin, but it's just, like, it's ugly. <laughs> like, inherently, Draven is, like, his face is on everything, right? Like, his passive is just his face. Yeah. <laughs> it's. And he's like, it, it's, it, I don't know. Dra Draven's like, assuming Draven is not a, a significantly older gentleman, he's got a lot of wrinkles. This is not shaming or I mean, I like, feel he, like he's got a lot of wrinkles. I feel right? like being an executioner ages you quite a bit. But I guess he yeah, likes well, You it, can so choose your job, know. right? I mean, he Darius doesn't I guess have he that did, many he, wrinkles. Yeah, that's true. And uh, I will say, Draven did choose his job, which is, I think, the scarier part. But also, he's he's paired alongside Deep Sea Thresh, so I'm wondering, do you have, like, a similar tier list for, like, the Thresh skins of the world as to, like, what we're looking at? Uh, to be fair, yeah. I mean, I mean, Deep Sea Thresh is, like, your OG Thresh skin. Like, if you play League in, like, Season 4 or something, you have Deep Sea Thresh, and that's sort of, like, your, your go-to skin in that sense. Um, the thing is, like, a lot of Thresh's skins are just really good as well. I think, like, one of the ones that's kind of, like, Mez Steel Dragon Thresh, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, like, no one uses that skin anyway, so you're, you're pretty much in the clear. 
Soda should be landing some nasty hooks, though. You know, it's deep sea thresh. You know, you're deep sea fishing. Surely you're going to land some hooks, right? I I'm pretty exactly. sure that's just another caster curse. So, you know, I might be uh, two for two here. Yeah, I mean, th there's no fish on the other side. So, you're going to have to wonder if, if maybe that comes into play. There's no Nami pickup. Maybe that was why uh, Passing John didn't want to pick up the Nami, knowing that there'd be that, uh, that synergy with the deep sea thresh coming through. The anti-synergy, I guess I should say, is... This lane going, I think, about as we expected. Poke attempted, slight wave control for SDSU uh, level two with the poke, but now Tabula Rasa level three. Kimo is here though, so I think both sides just have to be wary about this 2v2 potential. Tom Goku going up to level three should end any other shenanigans though. Yeah, and that's, I mean, it was set to be a wet noodle fight anyways, just between the two mid laners who have, like, no damage at this point. You know, there's a little bit of damage being traded back and forth, but it's mostly Tom Goku just getting that first strike proc whenever it's off of cooldown. It really doesn't really have a whole lot to deal with the Victor in the early games. I think it's slightly Victor favored early and slightly uh, Oriana favored in the middle, and then it goes back, but... It really just depends on how this bot lane goes. Like the, the rest of the map, there might, there's probably going to be some fighting between top laners here. We know what Piao wants to do. Oh, absolutely. Is those weak points coming mm -hmm. up? And man, Seal worse for wear. Going to have to t TP very early into the lane. Is once again we've got Snooze Fast bot lane. Maybe they're listening to NPR late at night, just keeping it calm, keeping it collected. Chill stream beats to listen to, something like that, you know. Yeah. NPR Jazz, NPR Jazz Hour, gotta love it. Showing my old man bones. I mean, I mean, I don't know if Draven would like. We That's talked true. about Draven how Draven is somewhat old, but I think he's the kind of guy who listens to like hard style at 3 a.m. Like yeah. he, he's going hard until he sleeps. No, absolutely. I'm thinking more like the Varus and the Ash are the ones who are popping like smooth Jazz Hour. And Draven is just sort of stuck listening to it because this because they have a really <laughs> nice speaker system, <laughs> so it just like goes across the other way, and it's like he's trying to he's try, he's just like listening. He's like doom doom doom, and then Jazz Kenny G coming from the other house, and he's just like <laughs> I don't know how to handle this. I don't know how to respond to this. So he just sort of keeps trying to do what he does, but it doesn't work out. <laughs> I feel like Thresh would also be down for smooth jazz. Oh, absolutely. I mean. Uh, Spirit Blossom Thresh, his, it literally plays lo-fi. Like, his dance plays lo-fi. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I think that Draven's just stuck in a world of bad musical taste. Of course, <laughs> according to Draven. But, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he'll have to cope with it for the time being. At the very least, you know, he's stacking up his adoration. He's uh, flexing his narcissism there. And you know, there's going to be a couple of stacks to keep in mind here. Victor's got stacks. Draven's got stacks. And uh, yeah, that's, that's all the stacks in the game. Yeah. Stacks on stacks on stacks, and no Nasus. No Nasus. Unfortunate. Savage. No Vigar. None of our infinite scaling champions. And no Senna. No, no Senna. Scion. No Cho'Gath. Yeah. The infinite stacks team. And the that one story of... Uh, it was like a team where they queued into each other and like held a lobby hostage because they were just two opposite ends of infinite scaling. Oh, yeah. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, the Senna just, like, was one-shotting people from 1,400 range away. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my. I finally got a fight. Level 6 up for Tom Goku. Kiorli trying to walk away. And will just barely be able to do it. No flash needed. Nothing extra at all. So we see our first bout of action of this first five minutes. And just be Kiorli trying to absorb this XP so as not to fall too far behind. Yeah, and... The victor hit level six first. I mean, was able to get a cheetah recall off. So really didn't want to teleport back to the lane and now just needs to be a little bit cautious here. Is at risk of potentially getting no if they don't know where everyone else is. But instead, it's just going over to this dragon. And yeah, so the low, low five beats from Thresh. He's got his AirPods in. He can't hear all the rest <laughs> of the music going on. That's exactly what's happening here. Yeah, yeah, he's got his AirPods it's just, in. It's still a vibe for most of these people, but at the very least... You know, Draven's getting those stacks up. It's just if he can cash out. And that is the biggest what-if scenario in this situation. The rest of the map, yeah, you can get kills everywhere. Might get a kill here. Nope. Back it off. Nope. False alarm. Again, we've had, we've had a couple false alarms already here. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to say, though, I guess in defense of uh, SJSU's bot lane, Get it. I mean, of course, you want any cash in that you can get, but also it gets that much more valuable. So trying not to take any risks when you don't have... 
uh, that advantage and potentially losing all that progress, I think is also a, another way to think about this lane. But I also think that if T is, is having that mentality, then he is definitely sharing AirPods with Soda here and is not just listening to the heavy go, 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 do music that Draven's got to be bumping. I mean, granted, if you're listening to music in like hard style in one ear and lo-fi in the other ear, you're gonna you're gonna get a headache at that point. I yeah, feel. Yeah, you will. You will. Yeah. Oh. As uh, oh, Seal jumps away. <laughs> Kimo comes in, gets the kill, oh. and there's not much else to it. Is now T does cash in, plenty for it. As around the back side had some shenanigans from Tom Goku, but I think exactly where you wanted those kills is where they were delivered for each team. Yeah, I mean, great play from Kimo on the top side, baiting everything out. Tabula Rasa is here. Piao needs to be careful. Yeah, Piao, I don't that think that. that you can get away with this. There is still the grand challenge, but there's just no HP to work with. Oh. Once again, overplay for the plate. Kyorly flash away and barely survives. And what a... From the mid laner twice now, Kyorly just untouchable. Yeah, and Kyorly bought Corrupting Potion, and... I don't know if you've kept up with like how many people are taking corrupting potion. No one takes it. It is not very good right now. And somehow, some way, some reason, Curly picks it up, and it ends up paying off there. You know, getting that extra little bit of HP regen there, getting those uh, stacks going, might have ended up being the difference maker there. There was a minion auto I was a little bit worried about as well in that situation. But yeah, still a relatively slow start to this game, all things considered, especially after last game where you know. There just was fights and then fights and then it just kept going and they kept going longer and the dog showed up and you know everything started to just crumble away it felt like for sjsu this time around it's a little bit more manageable in that regard and you know the draven getting the kill already is just contributing it to that gold lead you look at the itemization on this bottom side and no oh, draven's going for sort of the garage sale for now but likely to go something like essence reaver bloodthirster one of the really cool things about draven right now is that draven doesn't really like to go for a mythic first item or get second item mm -hmm. or the third item you know just builds all these items builds a whole bunch of damage and then says okay i am here to play and then it's gonna hit you with three axes and you're dead yeah he's he's a stat check he rolls up and he's just like do you have enough resistances one two three and you're dead and i'm expecting that might happen to devour pass me the john as we continue but of course they do have some range to play with don't quite have that double ulti combo that we were hyping up in champ select but john will be there soon and right now tabula rasa stealing away a little blue buff out of the sdsu jungle so overall little leads being picked up for san jose and i think that's how they want to play especially knowing that this would take them out of the top two to put them with two losses alongside Hawaii and San Diego State, leaving Utah the uncontested first seed. So, of course, there's that element to, to think about. So this cautious play certainly looking good for San Jose. Seal, a yeah, little too cool. far forward. Actually, the Grand Challenge just gets dropped. Those true health chunks might be enough. Flash away, flash forward, no ward hop. A little oh. heal, but there's a minion hop instead. And Piao stymied once again. Kimo trying to clean up, and he's too far away. Yeah, and just barely messing out on that. I think if Pao was able to get, I think he might have just barely missed out on one of the vitals there somewhere. Mm -hmm. They were able to get that fourth vital a little bit earlier, might have played out in their favor, but now arrow going down. Oh, I don't know about this. It's a bait in oh. for Tabula Ross as John tries to run away. There's not much else to be done, Ooh. and a second kill getting deposited into T's bank account. Yeah, the alley oop there as well. Tommy Larasa holding that last auto attack, saying, okay, T, there you go. Making up for last game where T did not get a kill. Oh, we got two in this lane, and you can see, you know, just the, the garage sale of items building towards an Essence Reaver, eventually possibly a Bloodthirst or whatever T so desires. They've got a lot of gold to work with now. And Kimo lurking, stalking their prey. Will oh. they pull the trigger, though? Oh, waiting on the timing. There's the trigger and the Cyclone. Purely will be the one to claim that kill and the second Cyclone just for fun. It's like a little dance. Yeah, you get two of them. It's amazing. You're able to just pop that twice. And, you know, instead of Soda going fishing in that situation, it was the Wukong. Kimo just dove right in there. Picked off Tabula Rasa with a little bit of help. And now over to this dragon now. This is going to be SDSU picking it up. So once again, splitting these first two dragons, very similar situation to last game. Granted, 
even though the kills are still relatively close, it's that Draven that is really being the difference maker here already. Now, that's an Essence Reaver picked up very early on. And yes, there is a Yomu's Ghostblade on the opposite side, but you look at the components, you look at the rest of the build coming through from this Draven. He is going to be very happy walking away with uh, this lead that they've got right oh. now. Yeah, 1,500 gold is the difference between these two teams. 1,500 gold is the difference between the two ADCs. It is perfectly as expected. At least for SJSU, SDSU, they don't want to get this Draven any further ahead. Yeah, I uh, audibly groaned because that is disgusting. That is exactly where Draven wants to be, and that's never where you want to see him if you're against him is now Piao. Gonna get a couple more of those vitals this time oh. around. Seal just trying to hop around the wave. Will oh. drop the stun and post in this household as Piao will pick that one up. Now on the butt side, T just gets the minion. Don't expect there to be too much. No enchanted crystal arrow, so no way to pull the trigger for SDSU. And one thing I will point out though about T, and this comes as possibly the right play but also a very risky one at that to heal instead of cleanse there is yeah. two very scary ultimates on the opposite side that can absolutely decimate you if you aren't prepared for that the ash arrow the various chains you have to be careful of that not taking cleanse in the situation shows yes that they've got the ego to sort of go up and make sure that they're not going to get hit by any of that stuff but also it provides us a little bit of a warning for the rest of SJSU, because if that Draven gets caught out, there's no escaping it. You're gonna need some sort of Mikhail's or a you know, QSS or something to bail you out of jail. But even then, it's still gonna be challenging because that combo can just lead to death, especially considering there's knockups that can follow it up. You can't cleanse those out, Soda. Oh, but there is an arrow around Ooh. as the chains are dropped. The sidestep for a second, and it is Devourer picking up the start. Going very, very low is no arrow anymore but Kimo uh -oh. is here he's hungry for a shutdown and this Draven will be soon to fall smite to pick up the kill as he gets cash like it's a baron for that extra gold and what a response on the bot side yeah, great play honestly you know it's an overstep from Soto wait here oh seems the fighting doesn't stop as Kyorly's here the shockwave goes wide off of Tom Goku's flash Still plenty of speed for the moment, as now Kimo is here. They're separated, though, and Cyclone is present. Curly trying to play over the wall, just out of range. Tabula Rasa still going low. Oh, oh gets the kill. Divine Sunderer healing, doing plenty in this effective 2v1. As Tom Goku barely survives, gets the extra hit, and it's a one for one. Yeah, and honestly, surprising amount of damage coming through from Kimo there. Didn't go for the Black Cleaver first, as potentially we were expecting. Went for the Divine Sunderer. On the flip side, Tabula Rasa, instead of going Gore Drinker, goes Yomu, so a little bit of mix and match here. Oh boy, more fighting. Oh, and Soda does opt to go in, but realizes there's a little too much damage as three Blight stacks and you're done. Soda goes fishing, but only caught themselves. Yeah, unfortunate situation. Followed through on that chain as well after getting the hook. And I'm not 100% sure if that was the correct play. You know, they came through, they were already stunned, weren't really able to flay anyone back. Forced to use that flash, might have just been a misclick as well, but uh, ended up going fishing, caught a big fish, and instead of pulling the fish out of the water, you got pulled in. Yeah, got pulled all the way in. Not with deep sea fishing. Sometimes there's some huge fish that you just can't quite fight against. Seems this time it's going to snowball towards this Herald, but SJSU are here. Seal hops in straight onto the back line, gets a stun up onto two. There's not enough damage to follow up, and now no mana for Seal either after popping the ultimate, so we'll just have to walk it out. T is bot side, so there's no real point of strength here for San Jose. An attempted Ooh. steal doesn't get taken. Kimo be happy to grab it. Oh, that was funny between the top lane and the jungler there from SDSU. Yeah, you know, it's it's always those situations where it's like, I want it, I want it, no, 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 I want it, nope, nope, you take it, okay, nope, and then you just play. I like to think it's like a no you, there. no you, no you. Yeah, they, they, they're playing hot potato with it. You know, they, they don't, they don't want to be the first to take it. They don't want to be the one to say, yeah, I want it. Like, oh, no, you take it, you take it. And then someone's like, oh, okay, fine, I'll take it. <laughs> you know, you don't want to end up with those situations where the repair just gets left. And that happens, like, a lot. It happens a decent amount in pro. Yeah. You've seen it a couple times where it's like, huh? 
You know, you gotta pick it up right after. Mm -hmm. It's not like old Rift Herald buff, like season six Rift Herald buff, where it gave you like extra damage for like 20 minutes. Oh my gosh. What? what? That, that buff <laughs> was ridiculous. That was, they that, gave that you was a like... mini Baron on one player, and that's back when Banner of Command was in the Ooh. game, but Enchanted Crystal Arrow is still in the game, and Soda is gonna be its victim once again as Piao King gets the grand oh. challenge, gets a little healing for everyone, as oh, Tabula Rasa just chunked out. And no stats, blank canvas. It's going to be a dragon picked up for SDSU. And that's the power of this lethality Varus in this team comp specifically. Last time around, Tabula Rasa went for something that was a little bit tankier, had a little bit more beef behind it. Granted, it doesn't really matter into the blight stacks of the Varus, but now you don't even have those tanky stats. You know, you're just getting killed by the base damage of the Q. You're getting killed by the blight stacks. You're getting killed by everything there. Is able to get out alive, but even still, Carol mid. It's going to be a decent push, potentially. Not sure if it's going to get a second charge, but look at this. They're opening up the map. So he doesn't have a whole lot of mana, though. Has to be careful. Also doesn't have flash. Piao is looking for this one. Yeah, and again, as you said, no mana, no flash. Just a blast plant. Manages to hop Ooh. over, but it's right oh. in to another couple of enemies. And actually, this oh. might be a bit of an extended fight. Tongoku's already ghosted. Tabula Ross is trying to chase down Kimo, but there's the arrow. And once again, does okay. lots of work as the shockwave oh, as well. Tongoku. Good lantern to escape. Tom Goku now no ghost. Has to just walk away. Gravity Well does the job. And no one else goes down besides Seal. And it just looked a little bit gritty once again from Seal, pushing up a little bit too far. Yes, there was other members lurking around, potentially able to answer that play, but just a little bit too far. Didn't have enough mana to get out of that situation. And even though you've got those extended blast plants and everything goes right into the waiting arms of the monkey king there able to spin to win clean that one up as well and now you know this oriana who had a really difficult time in lane all of a sudden she's stacking up that rod of ages a little bit of a different build normally you still see you know the ludens and leandries just because you get that uh, extra little bit of oomph in lane and everything you have that lost chapter to sort of keep you topped up but in this situation it's going for a little bit more of a scaling build you know we used to see this build row into Nashers or Conqueror Oriana or something crazy. Power of Evil was always the one to pull out this wacky Oriana tech. This time around, it's just the Roa for now. Mm -hmm. If it ends up being Nashers, uh, I will be very confused, but we will we will wait until that happens. I will not try and attribute anything negative to Kiorly and their Oriana builds until it happens, in which case then I will attribute <laughs> to that build. Uh, no, this, this just looks like Oriana of old. You go Roa... You have Seraphs in your back pocket. You get Rabadons. Now you can add in a Shadow Flame because it's the year 2023. On the other side, similar story for Victor. No longer going to row a build. It's not what it used to be. There's better options in this day and age. So far, SDSU, they've done well to bring Arrow? this back. Arrow <laughs> almost landing on to Tom Goku. So some, some fun awareness coming out from SDSU. They're very willing uh, to cross map. And, you know, they were just trying to play a little bit of uh, tic-tac-bow, you know, just announced for the Olympics. Unfortunately, there was only one person playing archery there. And, you know, I, I guess that's where the skill comes in. Sometimes you just miss. And if you miss the board, you don't get to put your tick or your tack or your toe. Or your bow. You don't get anything. Tom Goku gets away from it. <laughs> and now we've seen bot lanes fully transition to the mid lane side lanes, opposite handling from each control mage. So realistically, oh. as you said, the fighting is going to be around these bot lanes. So far, absolutely is. Is Those two kills in the cheaper build devour first to two items, expecting T to be able to grab that Bloodthirster after their next back. Went back to reset and then didn't, so just in a holding pattern for now. Objectives, Baron recently spawned, and a minute 30 to go, and that'll be sole point for SDSU. Stun Goku, popping a little poke onto Pal. Yeah, and then Tom Goku might not want to take a super extended fight here, especially since the Riposte is really easy to telegraph against something like a Victor, but still, you can just play that range, play for the laser every single time, and... Uh, overall, Pal is not going to be super happy about it. Interesting build choice, though, going for the Ravenous Hydra early on here. One of those items that was super popular at the beginning of the season, not so much now just because of how many stacks it loses. The stacks it loses and the non scaling army damage. Oh boy, here's a Oh item. boy, and the big ultis from the bot lane have already been spent, but somehow they oh. escape, and there's a shockwave as well to bring two members low, is actually the arrow held on to for just a moment, nearly turns it around as T cashes in once again. Seal falls as well. 
Piao King trying to run away, but here comes Tom Goku. There's a bunch of squishies in the back, and a Victor who's happy to capitalize. That's a quick stun off the repost, but the rest of the fight is all falling for San Jose as they look towards the Baron. A great fight for SJSU there. They're able to find four kills. The Curly. Oh, it's a little bit of a dive. Curly stays alive. Dumb Goku, he misses the timing. Oh, no. And the shutdown comes through. An ace for the SJSU mid laner. Baron to boot. And they have broken this game wide open. Yeah, and it's almost an overextension, a recommitment on that enchanted crystal arrow that just went so, so wrong. T able to pick up a kill there. Finally able to cash back in there. And they've been stacking up, you know, without any sort of kill participation for a solid five, six minutes there. So that's a good amount of gold coming back the opposite way. We actually checked the Draven Pass so we can see how much gold they've sort of picked up just off of that as well. And we'll get a better indication of how much of that is just Draven doing Draven things. Oh, there, there's a good indication. 3,500 gold. They didn't have that before that fight, and they're, they're feeling pretty good about it now. And that should just be a mythic picked up. And now this dragon fight, they might just try and re-aggress on this. Yeah, it looks like it is no steal away. Two dragons apiece as the fight goes the way so far of San Diego with Seal first to fall, but still got to watch T and Tom Goku, the damage dealers of San Jose. The Spartans are trying to walk forward. They're all getting slowed down. Hawkshot for a little more vision. Oh as there's the hook that's the go button as soda will be the one to pick up that kill little trade of support so far just a walk away from san jose but they do get the drink it's an extra kill going back the opposite way to sdsu i believe so they're able to sort of take away some of those barons and i mean especially on seal it's good to take that away but now it's just going to be chumgoku sitting in the side lane you sort of just trade out the potential of fighting the zero five jacks and now you got to face the three and zero victor um maybe you would have preferred to keep the baron on seal and take it away from Tom goku instead but nonetheless Good effort from SDSU to at least try and find them, catch them without a reset there. Specifically, Draven wasn't able to reset off the back of Baron there, so was still working on two items. Didn't have as much damage as potentially expected. But now with an Infinity Edge in the pocket as the arrow misses once again. Tic Tac Bow, that game must be real hard because no one's been landing anything. Uh, you know, now three items. Going to be really scary, and oh my. Oh, this is just a Fiora in a side lane all alone. Last auto gets the shut down back. On to Tom Goku, so that's a big Baron to take away, as well as a big chunk of change for this Fiora, as now we try and kite against Tabula Rasa. No grand challenge means this fight is not looking too great, and with T on the way, this extended kite will be put to an end. Just needs a couple of those IE autos and another cash in for T. Might as well get a little bit more money in that bank account there especially when you're taking down that fiora it means a little bit more because you're taking away those ravenous hydra stacks as well but this draven five one and one has all of a sudden exploded onto the scene and you know draven normally seen as one of those champions that is really really good early game and starts to fall off later on to the game unless you're able to get a whole bunch of kills like this draven has and now you're just running around with a 600 health uh, shield at all times because of bloodthirster because of overheal you are feeling incredible if you are t in this game and still no mythic so uh, still a lot of potential here oh my Oh, it's Jax catching out. Lonely Varus is Devourer going to walk away. Gets picked up by the ultimate. And Seal Ooh. gets dragged back in. And seems there's the re-engage with the Cyclone. T, though, still untouched. Just going to try and walk away. Leave Soda to die. It's unfortunate. As that will be a double kill for Chemo. Now it's just a couple damage dealers. Don't get too over-aggressive there. Chemo is... We'll just be SDSU backing off here in San Jose. Baron has expired. They've lost that advantage, but still feeling pretty good about the game. And I mean, now this gold difference is just purely on the Draven, I think. You know, there's so much gold to be had there. And uh, Piao is basically saying, listen, I know what my job is this game. I know what the win condition is. It is to sit in this side lane and push for dear life. Arrow. Tic Tac Bow. Arrow. Oh, Aww. man. That's why it's an Olympic sport. It's hard. <laughs> exactly exactly it's, it's too tough for us I mean, mere we're, mortals we, we've seen like the mid-range ash arrows which are good yeah just like these yeah. long range ones you know after so, like it, it can be so strong if you can land it if you land it you get a kill mm -hmm. but, you know some of these ash arrows haven't been exactly on the money also something very interesting to note um the ash opted to go for a far side alteration as opposed to the sweeper yeah, so that's so a little interesting. Yeah, there's a little bit less vision control there as we get a little bit of a pause. 
Yeah. Normally like it uh, was a tech. Oh, yeah. I was gonna say I think it was just a tech issue from Seal, just a little disconnect. So just just so y'all at home know, working on that. Hopefully that will be quickly resolved. But back to the vision control. Yeah, it's it's interesting to not see the Ash go for a sweeper. At least no one really going for the sweeper in that regard as well. Yes, Umbral Glaive is not as strong of an item. Yes, you're most likely still going to build that on the Ash, but uh, to not have that agency to just sort of check yourself before you go into a bush or something it, it is a little bit interesting in that sense as well and i mean yes you're going to basically have three far sites going at all times but you already have one on the ferris so an interesting choice we'll see if it ends up paying out and maybe it's just you know you don't you need that to check some of these objectives in extra time it, it seems like a little bit of a loose argument there as well because you've got the hawk shots just save yeah, your that's hawk what shots I, for yeah objectives. to me i'm just like you already got the hawk shots so that's you like having a blue like trinket that. built into your kit but i guess the the counterpoint is that you're never going to have this Ash really checking space for the first time on their own. So maybe that's it where there's just never a spot that you really want that scanner. You'd rather just have a control ward at that point that you can throw over a wall and have a little extra distance with. But I don't know. I'm not in the minds of these players. I don't play this game at that high a level. I just, uh, it's, it, I think it's just a, a choice of what do you want to go for? And I think so long as you have the Emerald Glaive, you're still getting some of that. And we could also see a scanner picked up by maybe the Fiora later in the game if they really are finding themselves needing it. So there's there's still options. Yeah, and I think Fiora should be going for the scanner anyways at this point, mm -hmm. just because they're able to, you know, if they're teleporting in and they want to sort of clear out their flanks or if they're looking for a flank as well, you want to sort of go off that regard as well. And we actually do have the scoreboard pulled up thank you to our producer for that colton uh we get to sort of see that you know it's one sweeper right now it's only on the wukong so they're relying mm -hmm. on the wukong to clear out all that vision and that's a lot of vision to clear out that is a lot that you have to deal with because there's all the thresh wards you know there's draven wards there's jack sword's not really as big of a deal but you've got a lot of things that you do have to keep in mind when setting up for these objectives and only having one sweeper sometimes you aren't able to cover as much distance you know especially when you get to this level of play people are spreading out their wards where they're like okay it's going to take them more than 10 seconds to get from this ward to that ward to that ward you spreading them out so you can't clear it all in one scanner and until that umbral wave comes through if it comes through at all in that situation mm -hmm. uh th then you'll get a little bit more in your uh, back pocket in terms of clearing it out but until then you know you're still sort of worse for wear on this ash in terms of clearing out vision and honestly why not just go for the scanner you get more vision score and Big number makes me happy. Makes you happy. Makes everyone happy. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Big number equals good good vibes. Big number equals equals fun. As we saw last game, the NASA's big number, big stacks, big dog moves. It was a very, very good time. As now that we've got a little bit of an interlude, I know everyone at home is just dying to know. Where did we get the cinnamon oven roasted chicken from for our spice questions? And it's because. We were raiding those cookbooks once again, and uh, uh, constantly, constantly, we are surprised by what gets put together by the mystical mind, the mystical mind of Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart is incredible. I mean, the, the fact that you put her and Snoop Dogg on a show and one of them has been to jail and is not the dog. <laughs> now, that's, that's the funniest thing to me. Martha Stewart's been to jail. And it's like, you know, <laughs> she sort of like lives up to that now. And she's like, yo, you know what? Yeah, I've been to jail, all that sort of stuff. And then she, she puts cinnamon on her chicken. Like, I mean, apparently, you, maybe that's why she went to jail. Maybe she was on her chicken. And that's Food crime. Chicken. <laughs> you know, at, at that point, maybe that's the case. But I mean, she's so well respected and everything. It's all because you know we got we got too spicy last week. You know last exactly. week there was there was some too spicy much. moves. We'll, we'll keep it a stack. There was some spicy plays, some spicy picks coming out. We got a little bit of spice. This game, no, little. there's no spice. It, like the, the the Draven Thresh, yeah, you know it's, it's it, there's fun. kill lanes. It's fun, it's fun, but it's not the spice. The spice no. is like when you pick just when you pick Seraphine someone a bot lane and you say, okay, yep, yeah, here you go, Akshan. There you go. There's your spice. <laughs> but you know, I, it's it's all about you just gotta keep it. I mean, you gotta keep a little bit of spice in there, you know. You exactly. put, you make your food. Flavor. You gotta put your salt and pepper, but then you gotta add a little bit more. If you just add salt and pepper to everything, you're gonna be eating everything. Else. Yeah, this is good. You're gonna get a six out of ten. You're gonna get an okay out of ten. You're gonna get your C's, get degrees, food. But you know, if you want to really impress, if you want to step up and beyond, if you really want to be, you know, the Riz Master, the Master Chef, all that sort of stuff, you gotta put more than just salt and pepper in your food. Yeah, that's why, maybe... we, that's why we introduced you to not making exactly. in the uh, mac and cheese. 
exactly. Nutmeg in your mac and cheese. It'll blow them away, whoever whoever you're looking to court. But also you, you go through your TikTok and you just see like constant microwave ramen hacks where it's like, how many ways can I cheat the already cheat food? How many ways can I like figure out how to use a soft egg and peanut butter in my meals? <laughs> Yeah, how many ways can I disappoint my palate today? You know, it's 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 all these hacks that like they are great if you're looking to like just get anything and you're just like, okay, I want to have a four out of ten calories because it is three. I need something, otherwise I'm gonna fall asleep. Seal's back awake though. That's good. Yeah, that is good. Technical issue resolved, so no issues on that front. I'm gonna be able to pick up three cannons too that'll that'll wake any top laner up oh yeah that, that's great and i mean john hey you know what here's why they didn't get the scanner because they just hit the plants and it scans <laughs> it for them that's what it is it just clears the wards who needs True. umbral glaive on this map it's uh it's exactly it is that extra fun and freaky chem tech so we're gonna see the clouds gonna see that the, those extra plants coming through but T's just, he's so big. He's going for the LDR next. Don't even need a mythic. You just need big items. You, you can just go mythic last item, and that's the thing. You, you have so many options at that point. If you're really feeling that you're not doing enough damage to that front line, you can switch to Kraken Slayer. If you need more survivability, go Shield Bow. If you just want to cut through more of their armor, if they start to stack that, you go Eclipse. If they don't have armor, you go Prowler's Claw. Prowler's Claw Draven is just one of the, one of the builds of all time. It is... Yeah, it, it sounds like device. certainly a build. Like, where, where did you good. see this hidden tech? No, no, it's just the idea that you can go any of the lethality mythics or you can go any of the ADC oh, mythics yeah. with the well, Draven. Yeah, just yeah, because yeah. you get so much off of armor pen to begin with. You know, saw before, you know, when Yomus gave you attack speed, it was just Yomus rush on Draven or stuff. You used to just go Bloodthirster first. So, mm -hmm. you know, Draven is one of those items, or one of those oh. champions. Oh, one of those champs, and it will also be Tabula Ross who snatches Whoa. up the Baron. His first kill, not going to be Soda. It's going to be purely fallen quick, and so much damage already Whoa. dealt to the back line. The entire bot side of the map has been taken off the table for SDSU. As up top side, a little cleanup onto Kimo and Piao trying to give some counterplay, but it's a triple for the victor. T's on a rampage, and the Baron is on the map. Yeah, and Draven is a champion. We'll put it that way. They did exactly what that champion does, which is just cut them down in their tracks. I mean, Shirley stepped up a little bit far to try and steal that away or give some sort of combo with the Wukong and ends up just getting like four or five auto attacks and the victor's able to clean it up afterwards. Same goes for Devour at the end. This wasn't able to chase it down, but now Piao in a precarious situation. Yeah. I, oh, Ooh. Ash Arrow, Tic Tac Bow. We got Tic -tac another one to land. So that's two so far from range. Does look like Piao King's trying to box them in for the respawns, but overall, I think you're going to be not in a great spot if you try to take that fight, especially with that axe just doing 500, 1,200 to the chickens. Come on, they have a family. Well, I mean, T's looking to set up the recipe. You know, you got to get your, true. your uh, chickens ready, you know, if you're going to make that cinnamon chicken. Granted, it was for roast chicken, so, yeah. you know, you, you don't need to butcher it too much. Nope. There are other techniques that you can use for it, some of which are... Maybe that's why, because yeah. the thing is he does so much damage, it's one fell swoop, so it's not even like he's butchering it, because he doesn't need multiple strikes. It's just one clean hit. You can throw it in the oven, get some of that cinnamon, some ginger, some cumin, spice it up in there, get him roasting. Yeah, I guess. I mean, the thing is, sometimes you like to get some... You have to spice the inside... I'm trying to think, like if you're if you're gonna just cut it open in one swoop, where would you want to cut it? Because you don't want to have like shards of chicken no, no, you, spine you, or anything. You decapitate the chicken and then you break it down later after you've taken it home. I guess. And then now it seems that San Jose are trying to break down the rest of SDSU as John might be the first to fall. Arrow right onto Tabula Rasa. Ooh. Not a ton of follow-up synergy. Big hit onto the graves down. from that one arrow. Soda gonna walk it out. Oh. Now Piao King trying to re-engage off the shockwave, but the damage is on the left side. Seal coming through. Piao still not able to lock Ooh. down Tabula Rasa. We'll eventually find that Graves is now the walk away. Seal's doing too much work. He's a Jax in the late game with a Draven to boot. Yeah. And now 
Sure, there's that shutdown, but it's still SD or SJSU firmly in control, despite that being a little messier than they might have wanted. Yeah, and actually the main thing to point out is T is the only one left of the Baron, so that was against the Baron, but nonetheless, this Draven is just so massive at this point. Look at this shield that he's carrying around. It's ridiculous. Jesus. It's absolutely massive. There's not much that can be done. There is the arrow up. Just need one more minion auto to hit that inhibitor. It seems that they don't want to do it. Seal says, I'll do it myself. The minions aren't looking like minions today. Walk away from the rest of SJSU. They are looking and feeling real pretty. Pretty significant gold lead, but of course we're so late into the game that it's really just a matter of what do your breakpoints look like. Oh my gosh, and I just noticed. Pass me the John. He wants to play Tic Tac Bow so badly. Picked up the Axiom Arc. Yeah, and it would be really nice to have that Axiom Arc to you know, toss out arrows as much as possible if they hit more often in these situations. Nonetheless, you know, it, it's not the easiest thing to land, and there is some decent movement abilities to dodge away from it. Uh, but still, it's it just seemed like a little bit of a last gasp to try and find some sort of value on this Ash, because unfortunately for John, they've had a little bit of trouble just staying alive or finding as much value in these fights. Yes, they have those 12 assists. But yes, Ash is just an assist machine. You press W on someone, 15 seconds later, they die and you get an assist for it. And it just it isn't enough damage to deal with T. And in this situation, potentially, it could have been an angle to go for something like the Mandate a little bit earlier. But it just seems like you know, T, pass me the John. They're just saying, you know, Mythic items are overrated. We'll get them later. And that's exactly what T did. They picked up the Immortal Shield, though. So now that shield is going to be even more ridiculous. As if Super shield. Draven needed another shield to deal with. The only good thing is that it wasn't a Mountain Soul. Because it was a Mountain Soul. Oh, my God. There would be more shields. The Draven would just be walking around with a thousand extra effective HP, and I would not be happy. No, that's terrifying. That that feels like it violates some convention. The Draven convention. <laughs> oh. Exactly, because he has to be a glass cannon in order to truly be playing Draven. As what instead, is it is SDSU though. They're grouped Ooh. as five. No map control. They just walked on in because they saw that T was playing too far forward on the bot side. And they give themselves a ton of counterplay, just taking away two inhibs. Yeah, they, t they take the two inhibs, trading that away for the soul, which, I mean, they weren't going to really try and contest anyways, but now yeah. this is trouble. Look at this fight teleports coming in. Exactly, as they are boxed in, and that soul will be helping out quite a bit on top of everything else. The only hope is you get an immediate pick onto some oh. damage, but instead it's Devourer who's just having to run away as Curly already having dropped the ultimate. There's no more damage. The attempted kite away. It looks like Piao might just want to try and Ow. end it here with the wave. A few extra autos Ow. from Devour and past me. The John as well as with those slows. Ow. There's a chance here. He's looking for the back door. T is around and it will be thwarted. Curly tries to come up with something as well. Instead, it will Ooh. just be the long walk back down already. Tom Goku's at the other base. So this will likely be the game ending with a solo laner alone, but it's for SJSU this time, not for San Diego State. As the last couple autos onto the Nexus will come through, everyone else will run down. It's all Piao just trying to run away. There's nothing else to do. The king has been made. The Nexus exposed. Kimo respawns, sure, and Piao King will try and fight this one out. Tabula Rasa kiting the best of his ability, does get stunned up for a second. There's not quite oh, enough as Kimo did slow it down oh. against Tom Goku, but T is oh, here, arrow. does not get stunned. Tic Tac Toe goes wide one more time, and SJSU even up the kills, even up the series. That was one of the endings of all time. That was, they, they were base racing, but not really. Like it was just sort of like, hey, it's your turn to go for it. Yeah, okay, you got that. Okay, now it's my turn. Oh, Wukong's <laughs> back up. No, 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 no. I, I insist you can try and end the game there. So yeah, an interesting ending to that one. SJSU, they win the game. I mean, they, they tie up the series and they are able to take this Draven and make it shine in a lot of ways. You know, full mm -hmm. build at the end of the game. T had an incredible performance overall. Just a, a confusing, perplexing game overall. So, uh, yeah, definitely one of those games where 
there's not really a whole lot of explanation for how that one sort of ended up but just the, the comp the gold difference was a little bit too much yeah i think that played very well to start by san jose they were able to slow the game down when needed to speed it up when they were ahead and eventually just reached that breaking point with t to take us to game number three as sdsu now have to try and find an answer san jose try to After yet another year of us doing a round of events, I'm excited that more schools will understand exactly what we're doing with our regional uh, events and culminating in CECC and getting more schools involved. Uh, I think schools will be more excited to compete in our events because we've established it over the course of a year. And, and I welcome any and all conversations with getting people involved. I, I think for me, I'm most excited about like the schools and conferences Mike. that's that's amazing and that's so exciting i'm also excited about the brands that we're starting to be able to get involved in this in our uh commissioner's cup in last may we had over 14 brands blue chip brands participating in our event barbasol microsoft cdw morgan stanley new street Air Force. Um, and so I think brands are, are really starting to get excited about being involved in college esports. And we're offering them a platform that not only gives them, you know, a big event, a big yearly event, but also uh, regular daily programming where they can have exposure in, in front of this audience. Um, that they, they want to build affinity for with, with their brand. So I'm super excited about seeing the brands get on board and, and help grow the space along with us. A rising tide lifts all boats. And I think that's probably one of our, our mottos here at CSMG and Esports U. We're growing our brand, but at the same time, we're also really growing the college esports space as a whole. And that's our goal for it to be a healthy ecosystem for all parties involved. Yeah, uh, I, I, I agree there. And uh, I guess for me, uh, obviously always, you know, seeing the collegiate esports space elevate, um, uh, coming from a, a competing, this didn't exist when I was competing. And just to see it now in literally within the last five years, probably really come to fruition and start just blossomed out of nowhere and now becoming a space and seeing everyone, schools, players, uh, productions, companies all elevate together it has been really, really nice to see. But if I was the most excited for one thing, it would probably be uh, the city where we're going to land for CEC uh, CC23. Um, I'm really excited to know where we're going to be. There's a lot of great cities. I mean, I, I personally would love for it to come to New York, despite whether we got a positive bid or not. I wanted to come to New York, but uh, I just think the atmosphere – uh, in New York, when you throw an event here, it's just super magical, um, especially in the summertime. And But either way, I'm really excited to see where it lands. Tons of great cities, tons of great opportunities. And um, yeah, who knows? And, and I think that's going to be the most exciting uh, process for me. Absolutely. Um, I won't speak to anything. I think I, I, I'm i filling Paulie's job in this one because Paulie's more a panelist than this one. So, <laughs> um, you know, normally, normally Paulie's the host. And I, I don't know. I think I, I'm, me personally, I'll just say something real quick. I'm just excited to keep telling your stories. If you're a student, if you're a program, um, let me know. Let us, you know, reach out to us. We just ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to tell your story. And I think that's what has me most excited because now I think we're getting to a point where people know us. People, I hope you guys trust us. And, you know, um, and we just want to keep keep expanding and growing the space. So with that, uh, Polly, I won't make you do the weird thing where you got to toss to yourself. <laughs> unless, unless you want to do that. I don't know. Actually, you, you, yeah, you might yeah. have a few way of doing this. They are, All right. Let's yeah. test it. Yeah. Okay. All right. How do you how do you want to throw throw it yourself here? <laughs> well, that's gonna conclude here the future of collegiate with S uh, CSMG and esports. You thank you so much to Angela, Mike Blewett, and Kyler Tandel for hosting our panel. And now back to myself for the day three of the CSMG uh, Coaches and Directors Summit 2022. 
What is going on, everybody? And welcome to the ECAC Top Plays of the Week. I am Seth Dillens, and I'm super excited to walk through these with you so you can see all of the great moments we are getting out of collegiate esports. One of my favorite things about these seasons is as they go on, as the years continue to pass, the skill ceiling just gets higher and higher, and the teams get better and better. Starting things off in Week 1 and 2, these teams came out the gate swinging. Let's take a look at what they were ready to bring out in these early weeks. Valorant is a game all about risk versus reward, and Sin from NYIT wanted to show us just how much he was willing to risk to get that great reward of a round win. Sort of force to pop off, maybe get a little bit more sniper play, but these direct tight angles make it tough. You have Axorus that actually gets a wall bang headshot onto Prime. Oh, that timing on the paranoia works so well. Yo, give it, give it up for the util, bro. Sin's gonna pick up three into the site. The lurk on its way from the chamber, but unless you're going to spam through this box, you're not getting anything done, and Panda won't even let him get that far. Super Smash Brothers Ultimate is a game that can be decided in milliseconds, and Waka, one of the best players from SUNY Canton A Squad, wanted to show us just what they can do with only a second and a single stock on the board. Lucina. Sledge option going to be charging for Smash going a little early. They're not quite getting what you want. Drop shield after first hit, and pick, getting hit by the kick. High percent. There is the stun into Claw. That clock will oh. be charged for a lot longer. Oh my goodness, that's a forwarder into stage with the stage fight and then upping immediately after. What a sick. One point in Rocket League can never make a team feel comfortable, but Driftsy wanted to show us that not only was he going to pick the pace up, but he wasn't going to let his team down. Defensive test with flying colors, though they couldn't get out. And that is the important part at the moment. Clears a must. Welcome back, as we have made it to game number three. Mountain West does not disappoint with series. Both games have been pretty good. We've gotten to see both squads pull out a signature pick. The Nasus in game one, the Draven in game two, and now on to game number three. And I think biggest thing to look at is just the difference between the two games. I mean, in SJSU's win, it was sort of a slow start to everything they yeah. let the draven sort of develop it bloomed up there you know they let the spices marinate a little bit they got to know each other they became buddy buddy and then the explosion of flavor came down and the other one it was it was messy from the beginning it was just fighting 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 and then all of a sudden the dog came down and said okay you know what it's time to put the cinnamon in there let's get this done no time to marinate you're getting in the oven we're baking <laughs> you at 350 for 45 minutes and you're gonna get cooked yeah and that's exactly what happened he sat in the oven he was just holding on for a second then he says boom flavor time and brings down the cane and there's not much else to say but of course we saw the nasus band last game wondering if we'll see the draven band this game because so far for sdsu it's been total priority on that jungle and we've seen the graves both games both times it's sort of done what it needs to do or what it's supposed to do it was a bit of a drain tank in game one did some damage and was very distracting in game number two then now we could see it once again as the Zaya, the Jarvan, still taken off the table immediately. And there's the Draven Van. Yeah, there's the Draven Van as expected. It does mean Tabula Rasa is going to have one of potentially those signature picks that have been banned out throughout the series available to them. And I mean, it it is to be expected at that point, I want to say. Because, you know, you ban out this Kendra, you ban out this Silas, you ban out this Hecarim, all very likely going towards Tabula Rasa. It's just, which one of those do you want to deal with? Interestingly enough, though, the Ash support does get banned out. So apparently, the Tic Tac bow was a little bit more effective than maybe we gave it credit for. Yeah, I think, if anything, there's that mental element of just having to be aware of it and having to watch out for it that could be impactful of course in the lane as well we saw it work out to great success as the graves was banned away from san jose so we'll have to see a new uh pickup here for tabula rasa and the caitlin was up so it looks like the caitlin uh is first picked and I think the Caitlyn is still the strongest option available in a lot of ways. It's the best matchup into a lot of these set combos. You know, your Zeri Lulus, your Lucian Namis. Caitlyn can survive a lot of those lanes and still find value. And I think a big factor of that is she still has zone control. Her traps are still going to be good. You don't want to walk into them. She has that innate objective control. But this time around, Carly said, you know what? I'm going to take the laser monster for myself. This is a, I, I like this pickup here because it just denies Tom Goku from getting that uber safe mid laner. Exactly. And it also has 100% win rate this series, right? We've seen it. It's been working. 
We'll have to see if it's the champ or just sort of the games that happened around them as a Soraka locked in for John. Now, this is definitely different than what we've seen so far. I don't mind it because there's so much poke damage that comes out from the likes of Caitlyn and Lux. There's likely to be some sort of poke mage in the mid lane to sort of answer the victor, maybe. It depends on if they opt to go for the Akali again. But I mean, we saw what happened last time around when the dog was unleashed and all that sort of stuff. Now, also, maybe they were prepping for something like this. You know, the Hecarim doesn't really want to just be running into a Soraka either in a lot of situations. If she has that silence up, you know, you can sort of block that potential of throwing that ultimate down as well. You can potentially find a sneaky root onto one of them. So uh, it's an interesting combination here. So instead, they're going to take that Karma with a little bit more utility, a little bit less damage overall. And now you get, you know, Hecarim Karma. So you, know, you get your budget Sivir ultimate from the... Uh, and, mantra e there you put that on top of a hecarim and he's just going to sprint into the back line there i'm curious to see what adc they pick up here because uh we're gonna get a decent draft no matter what we're not even gonna see an adc yet diego gets picked yeah i'm looking for a little bit more of just looking for a little more information maybe some bands to go through because i doubt you're saving that adc for r5 uh but they do want to protect that viego and give themselves a good matchup into the hecarim at least early on so I do like that jungle lock, and it's also not super committal as far as the direction that San Diego wants to play with their composition. So like it for that reason as well. And that Varus, we saw it work pretty well for, I want to say, the first 20, 25, 25 minutes maybe, pushing a little bit. That first like 15 to 20 minutes of the game, very, very effective. Yeah, and I mean, the Varus is still very strong because you have so much poke damage. You're able to match the range of the Caitlyn. You're able to poke out this Karma. And especially if the Hecarim build that has been more popular, which is this more damage-oriented build, is going to pop up. You might see that come down, but I mean, if you want to counter the likes of a very fast Hecarim running at you, just run very fast the opposite way with a Sivir <laughs> Ultimate. So you have that engage, disengage tool in that regard as well. Going to be lots of movement speed, lots of running around the Rift here, and I don't mind the Sivir all that much as well. Sivir is in a really interesting spot where Navori is quite good on her because a lot of her damage comes from Boomerang Blade. It's sort of like a hybrid between the old Lethality Sivir, where she built, you know, just Dusk Blade and did a whole bunch of damage on her Q. And the Crit build, where you focus on the Ricochet. Navori gets you to do that extra little bit of damage on your Q, and you're still able to dish out as much consistent damage with your Ricochet. So it's a little bit of a mix of both worlds, but these solo lanes are spicy. That's that's a Gwen picked up. Yeah, we already got the Gwen, Fine. so if uh, if Piao King was looking for anything a little beefier, that'll certainly get shredded through instantly. And we do get the Yone locked in for Tom Goku. So going back to more of that uh, engage heavy, trying to dive around the back line style we saw game one. Yeah, and I think that with the Gwen being picked up here, it is blind picked, which is a little bit odd, I think, because Gwen is one of those champions that has some really good matchups and some really poor matchups at that. Renekton is one of those ones which is a little bit tricky for Gwen because she's always wanting to chase down her opponents in that situation. Renekton's never going to be the one to back down from a fight. In a mm -hmm. lot of situations, your call to me healing is going to be able to just give you that consistency over time. You're able to chase down Gwen a lot. Usually a lot of top laners, they don't have that much mobility. You know, she's got that skip and slash to sort of move away. But now you get slice and dice back the opposite way. You can't run away from the Renekton as easily. And Gwen's main thing, you, you want to be able to fight around your no-no zone there you know you're missed and renekton's just gonna jump right in there and say listen i'm going to stun you and you are going to die in a lot of situations so it's a it's an interesting matchup on the top side especially to just blind pick gwen here i'm interested as to why they just didn't pick a frontliner potentially there but then again there's the uh, potential of having you know the fiora come back the opposite way it's sort of a, a catch-22 there you either pick a carry and you're gonna get potentially counterpicked and you don't have that extra innate tankiness or you pick a tank and you get counterpicked and then you're not as tanky as you think you are so yeah a little bit of a rough situation there and that just feels like the nature of uh drafting right now is top lane can be so volatile in that sense where if you don't have two teams that just want to pick tanks then they're not going to do that in the first half of draft and they're just going to leave it there and it's going to be fine for them and they'll be able to go through uh have have a great day and just hang out but now we've got a couple of carries so it's going to be explosive already from the top side haven't talked about this Yone yet, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say yet for now because I don't want to get there quite yet. But I am gonna say for San Jose, it does feel like they don't have a true front line, but this Hecarim and this Gwen will do a lot of that work for them. And also looking at San Diego, they don't have a big tank either. This Renekton, this Viego, they're both bruisers at best. So it's gonna be scrappy. 
Yeah, and and the less we see Piao take a page out of the licorice book and go, you know, radiant virtue, Renekton top lane, be your frontliner. I don't want to see that happen, especially not out of Piao. I think Piao is one of those players who wants to just go in, mm -hmm. do lots of damage, be that scary 1v9 crocodile on the top side of the map. You know, he, he wants to force everyone to bring up that movie theater to the top side for the interior crocodile alligator. Nonetheless, it's it's a, it's an interesting situation where there's no frontline on either side and either one of these teams if the ball gets rolling a little bit too hard you're just gonna die you don't have a chance to stay alive here because you don't have any innate tankiness a lot of that tankiness from the side of san diego is going to come from the soraka healing just that consistent healing that's coming up so i think we're gonna have to see some really early grievous wounds come through from soda potentially from tabula rasa as well although chem punk chainsword rush is not optimal in any situation. Of course, on the flip side, you're going to have just that same amount of tankiness with the Karma Shields, with the Hecarim drain tanking and all that, and any life steal gets picked up. So then there's the necessity for Grievous Wounds on the opposite side. It's just, you need Grievous Wounds in this game because all the tankiness is in the healing. Exactly. It's, it's about that sustain. It's about that potential to just keep on going. And one champ that really does like to keep going and make these fights really weird with how long they survive is that Yone. So now I'm going to bring us back over to Tom Goku. And looking at this pick, it feels a little weird, but I am going to say it does feel like San Jose. They've got a lot of ways to go in. It's just not super obvious. Yeah, and I think that the Yone or the Y1, as I like to call it, you know, it just has a lot of agency to get in there, get dirty uh, and be able to get out. It's, it's a safe engage to a sense. There is the potential for non-committal engage. You can mm -hmm. use your fate seal to just jump in. You know, you do all your damage across five seconds and they say, okay, see ya. I'll leave the rest of the fight to the Kate and I'll leave the rest of the fight to the Gwen and all that sort of stuff. So you have that potential to be primary engaged, but also into something like a victory, you can punish that early game a little bit more. You're given that agency to just sort of get in there. Uh, the main difference between Yone and Yasuo, of course, is how committal the Yone is in the early game, especially. You know, you're going in there with your Q3 dash. You know, you're trying to mess up this victor from getting any sort of safe laning phase you can really up the tempo in that regard and of course there is always the option to make it non-committal by using your spirit to jump forward and all that so i want to see exactly how this yone plays i want to see an aggressive style come through and i think that curly just needs to play back once again uh granted throughout the series i think that tom goku has gotten the better of the laning phase in both of those matchups it was just that in game one uh curly just had the rest of the homies to back him up specifically a big old dog coming down there of course, once the dog is put on the bench, please adopt the dog, please. Uh, and, you know, all of a sudden, Tomogoku has been able to just sort of exert their will. And I think we saw that, especially last game, where they didn't really do a whole lot, and then they did a whole lot at the end. They picked up the Magis, and they had stacks. Yeah, uh, exactly. Like, the spirit of the dog, it, it feels, has just been, like, coming through so much as far as our questioning and our analysis. But also, it's been showing up in my neighborhood, because you know how there's, like, that one neighborhood dog that just barks at night, and it just happens to, like... It just shows up it's and you're right like, oh, there, that's actually. the dog, right? It's just over there. Every time that you've brought up Nasus, that dog has started barking here. I can just like hear him out of my left ear. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, the spirit of the dog is here. He's, he, even though he might not be on the rift, even though he's been banned away and taken off the table, he's still here in spirit because I can hear him barking from a few houses down the street. <laughs> Hey, listen, you know, it's got that dog in him, you know, gotta just make sure that they're doing their job barking at absolutely anything that moves, even if it is as docile as a leaf falling on the ground. But unfortunately, no dogs barking here. The only thing that's going to be barking is Renekton. I mean, alligators they don't growl, bark. growl more than they, anything. They exert noise. Yeah, I guess so. That's, some that's, I mean, they, I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm I can, in Canada. I don't I don't see i see gators i get close yeah, see yeah, i see gators yeah. so like they do growl like that's that's definitely a real thing but most of the time they just look at you and they're like you know i'm here i know that you're here and uh we're gonna we're gonna be fine we're gonna have a good time right we're just gonna look the other way and that's what happens and that's that's what you do you know you see gators just respect them don't try and get near them and you'll be fine there's this one guy who's been on like my my freaking TikTok constantly who's in the Everglades and he's just picking up snakes. He's looking at gators. He's like saying hi to him. And I'm just like, that is the new age Florida man. 
He is posting his <laughs> escapades in the Everglades on TikTok. No, straight up. He's just like, look at this beautiful snake, but it's invasive. Look at these seven Burmese pythons my friends and I picked up and, and found because they're invasive. Because there's a lot of those in Florida. We have a lot of invasive species. But... I'm telling you, crazy stuff. Crazy stuff happens down there. Hope we see some craziness out of Piao on the Renekton. Give us, give us some highlights, and doesn't just turn into some very, very fancy boots or a handbag. We, 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 you know, sometimes the gators are just they, they get sent to not the best end of life. We'll put it that way. They get turned into a yes. wallet, and all of a sudden, you're simply carrying around cash for. Uh, Maybe a radiant virtue, you know? If, if, if that's the case, I mean, you might as well be shiny at the end of the game. You might as well uh, go large and stuff. And I mean, to the the Neo-Florida man, are we going to call him? Uh, do you <laughs> think that they would pick up Renekton? Because Renekton's like a crocodile, but also like, but, like walks around. Like, like I don't know. Maybe, like, maybe he really Renekton? embodies that spirit. But I feel like there's a lot of other champs who embody Florida Man quite a bit. I feel like Udyr, even though he's like in the Freljord, it's the opposite. He's got the spirit of the animals and he is in tune with them. Just like our observer giving us more of the wildlife tour as we get this little guy before the, the wolf den starts to strike back. Yeah, I mean, and if that's the case, if Renekton is the Florida Man, then I think Udyr's the Toronto Man. Cause it's yeah, it's, it's like, it's more the idea of just like, having the power of the wilderness behind you right uh, i guess it's not the toronto man then it's just the northern ontario man there's not northern ontario, in northern ontario ontario I'm, I'm gonna keep it real northern ontario there eventually you get to a point like an hour north of toronto and then nothing happens and it's just a lot of trees and i don't know maybe there's someone like udir out there you never know I, i've never met them i've never i've never been that far north so regardless mm. <laughs> I've, in the I've barely been to canada so you're already uh, ahead of me I, Went to Niagara Falls, and that's it. Yeah, I Technically mean, crossed Falls the border. Kind of nice. It's pretty nice. Yeah. If that was like 12 or something. It's pretty cool. Got to see a big waterfall. Got to try Tim Hortons for the first time. Oh, Tim Hortons? That's that's a dub right there. Yeah, I, I had a coworker when I worked in at a bookstore in New York, and they would get triple triples. Oh. And I was very concerned for their future, like, artery health. Yeah, triple triples are, are a little much. Even double doubles can be a little bit over the top at times. Um, but yeah, it's Timmy's. Timmy's is great. It's it's one of those things where it is the benchmark. Timmy's is the benchmark in Canada for a lot of things, and uh, T is fittingly, you know, wearing the Canadian outfit there. You know, bundling mm -hmm. up. It's cold. Yeah, gotta gotta stay on top of it. Gotta watch out. Not gonna be doing any boar hunting. No Sejuani on the rift, but. I was, I'm going to say not quite the right outfit for going croc hunting, but it seems that they won't care too much at this stage in the game. Won't have to worry about that until later. It's already pretty much expected for that bot lane. The Caitlyn and the Karma going to take the lead in the mid lane. Tom Goku gets the XP lead, so takes the advantage, takes the initiative, and takes a little trade. Same the top side with Seal. San Jose making a staking their claim to lanes in the first minute. Yeah, they want to do exactly that. They want to try and play aggressive in this early game here. Of course, Renekton just lost level advantage. Renekton can normally win out on those trades, but I mean, the victor needs to be careful. But now you can see it sort of flip around a little bit here. Curly has those biscuits as well. And now all of a sudden, Tom Goku needs to be just a little bit more careful about these extended trades and everything. Granted, as long as Tom Goku is denying CS away from Kyorly, they are getting an innate advantage, of course. If you can prevent the victor from getting this cannon minion, you're going to be in good shape. Doesn't look like that's going to be the case here. Yeah. Oh, Got to get those augments. Starting to see just the, the, the laser being able to come out, starting to work for Kyorly. Now this wave stacking up quite a little bit. Not much to be done if you're Tabula Rasa, or not Tabula Rasa, if you're Tom Goku, it's Tabula Rasa. Goes for the full clear, as does Kimo. Opposite sides of the map, so no early fighting from the junglers. Does look like we're seeing a bit of pathing towards the mid lane. Purely sniffs it out and just goes for Cheetah Recall. 
and I think that's a, a smart situation here, especially when you're ranged versus melee. If you can get that wave pushed in, you might as well just take your reset. Whether they opt to TP or not, yeah, it doesn't seem like they're just going to walk back there. You get a little bit of an advantage there. You get your control ward as well, but this is what I want to see out of Piao. I want to see them push the envelope a little bit here because Gwen early game is not fantastic, especially when you have as much mobility as the Renekton. Tabula Rasa, what is this? Path? Oh my this gosh, psycho. he's going all the way around in a well-timed flash from John just be a walk away so summoners popped the ghost a little bit less valuables on top side we've got to dive instead ignite already dropped piao has to dive away that Ooh. ignite ticks down chemo gets the aggro reset for just a second and that's first blood picked up for the renekton Nah, so one dive goes incredibly well and you know you're able to burn out seals ghost as well you're gonna burn that teleport as well but I think Piao needed to make that happen as well. You look at that, took the Ignite instead of the Teleport. So looking for this laning prowess will have that Iron Spike Whip to potentially continue some of these trades longer. But nonetheless, it was a heavy investment. Will it pay off? Only time will tell in that regard. Of course, the bottom side, pass me the John saying, pass me the Summoner spell. Or at least that was Tabula Rasa saying that one. John not going to have that flash up for a little bit here. And that's going to be a lane that you can definitely punish. Uh, especially with a Yone that is on the precipice of getting to that level six. Exactly. So now, Kimo may be trying to take advantage of the fact that Devourer is low on mana, so there's going to be a very natural fight for T. There's a little banana goes wide, Soda has to flash. Not too much done, uh -oh. just another burning is topside. That item advantage coming through for Piao, and this Renekton has complete control of the topside. Yeah, and even still on this bottom side, Kimo's sticking around just to make sure that this wave gets pushed out enough. It's a lot of time spent down here, though, and you can see Tabula Rasa going to rotate over now. This could actually turn into trouble here. The Hecarim might just miss the timing, though. I think that they're, they're just off, yeah, as the decision was made. Ooh. Tabula Rasa tried to do more. Piao goes for another dive and manages to escape. Doesn't even need to pop the Dominus for the extra HP, picking up the level 6 off that kill, as this Croc is certainly hunting down the doll. Yeah, and unfortunately for Seal, just not enough experience there. Uh, missed out on just a couple of minions, and that ends up being the difference because even if they were to get Pao a little bit lower, you still have the option of that Dominus to sort of finish it off there. And this Renekton just wanting to snowball this top lane really hard. Should be able to pick up a tower plate as well, and you can already see how defensive Seal's going to have to play. Uh, first item, well, plated steel caps. I almost called them Ninja Tabby again. Yeah, plated I was going to say, caps. did you almost say Tabbies? <laughs> <laughs> I just call them tabbies. It's just easier. You know, plated steel caps first item. You can already tell they're sort of just sacking the lane a little bit here. Because you look across the rest of the map there, and yes, it's going to be nice for the fact that there's three auto attackers, but ooh, Hyorle's going to hit like a truck come the later stages. Seal's so going to have to find some way to find relevance here because that is a large crocodile on the top side with about an 1100 gold lead already. That is the gold lead effectively at this point. Yeah, and ooh. now Tom Goku goes in, gets the ultimate to land, and with the ignite. That'll be plenty of damage. Last auto secured by Tom Goku, so it won't be Soda stealing it away. Very, very well done. Now Seal, using that Demolish proc, gets a plate for themselves. So that'll help. At, I mean, help in, in air quotes, right? Like, it, it does a little bit big picture, doesn't do a ton to make this laning phase any less miserable. But I, I am just wondering as this game plays out, what is Seal really going to be able to do on a Gwen that's behind as Tom Goku has Ooh. to use... Spirit Dash just to get some minions, uh -oh. but leaves yourself open to a Chaos Storm back as Kyorly doesn't quite get the kill, but does burn that flash away. Yeah, not a bad play overall. You know, teleported back, was able to force out a summoner, at least from Tom Goku. Tom Goku can go TP back, but still, just look at these trades. These are going terribly. Piao just ends that trade with full health. And Seal just has to think about their actions at that point. Of course, this bottom side of the map. Little bits of trades back and forth, but realistically, Caitlyn versus Sivir, yeah, there's not going to be a whole lot of progress there overall. It really just comes down to this top side of the map, and this Renekton needs to get as fed as possible here, because Renekton's one of those champions, falls off a truck, oh. And he's getting fed! Very. <laughs> That's a big croc. Yeah, he's very big. I, I don't think that uh, you could turn him into a handbag. I think you'd need just a whole, like alligator, I guess, crocodile skin outfit to handle how big he's getting. <laughs> but I don't think that they'd even be able to take him down. Like, honestly, he's just so massive. There's no one who can contest him in the 1v1 at this point. I don't think there will be for the next 15, 20 minutes unless Tom Goku starts to get fed. Mm. Is Yeah, he's ahead of everyone else in the server by at least a 1,000. 
Yeah, and I mean, the goal difference isn't even that severe either. Oh boy, fighting though. Oh, Kimo may be caught out a little bit, but John is here. It's 3v3 so far, but here comes Tabula Ross charging <gasps> forward. Kimo trying to get the reset, oh, feared away from it. Barely manages to stay alive for a second until eventually going down. And with John falling as well, it's just going to be purely trying to hold this wave, but some good counterplay by San Jose. Yeah, and it actually leads to them just evening up the gold altogether. Yes, your top lane is effectively just a lost lane at this point. Seal's buying whatever they can to try and prevent this Renekton from just one-shotting them at every situation. But the rest of the map is still going to be relatively strong. And now, Devourer wow. on the butt end of that trade. Oh, just going to get out with the ultimate. Yep, just uses that. Ops not to use the Ghost or the Flash. Lower cooldown on the ulti. Does escape. Wastes a little time. I think is just going to have to wait for this wave to push back out. And then shove it in for a clean reset. As, yeah, we're dead even on the map. Which means that across a lot of these other roles, San Jose are just that much further ahead. Maybe three, four hundred gold on their opponents. Now starting to widen with a couple of those kills coming through. So... I'm glad to see that this isn't just lost from the top lane Ooh. matchup. As now, Tom Goku trying to find an advantage mid. John is here. We'll be able to just oh. play Medic for a little bit, unless the 2v1 is desired. It's very close. There's still no wish, actually. So, got caught on the cooldowns. Cow. And there was no extra healing to be done. Piao trying to get the response, but instead it's Tom Goku just making out like a bandit. Yeah, Tom Goku gets himself a nice... 1v2 situation there on this Yone and you know really good play John just isn't able to reply with enough healing you know as you mentioned the wish not available the heal wasn't up either so it's just purely getting a little bit too greedy I think just trying to find some sort of vision trying to catch out the rotations and everything and Tom Goku is able to punish that in turn of course teleport now going to be forced on this top side from seal once again and this is a little bit dangerous because, yes, you're teleporting back into lane. Yes, you have a little bit more agency in this lane. But if Piao just goes for a solo kill once again here, has that ultimate, has the ignite taken up there, it would be detrimental to Seal's game here. It doesn't seem like they're going to opt for that play. And it seems as if, finally, this Gwen is going to be able to sort of bite back just a little bit. You know, they're going to be able to potentially cut off just a little bit of that Renekton's healing. Maybe get a little bit of the skin, turn that into the wallet that we were talking about. But... As you mentioned, very big. Gonna need a whole suit. Is that the Florida Man suit? Wearing a like a crocodile skin suit in the same way? I don't like... think so, because I, I I think Florida Man is in tune with the Gators. He doesn't want to take them down, so I think it'd be like disrespectful to wear like a Gator skin suit. But I don't know. As now we've got a little bit of a re-engage. Uh -oh. Mantra powered Q for some damage. <gasps> oh, walks right into the trap. And that will be eaten up. Another There's a one. second behind, and that's enough for Soda's Ignite <laughs> to get the kill. It cut the wish healing. That is unfortunate. Yeah, it's it's just a little bit of poor preparation from John as well, not to like check where those would be. Now, Kimo. Oh, he is caught. But Gee. maybe T is a little too low, manages to kite on away. Now it's just Devourer. There's no ADC. Wave will get taken away and proxied here, but still very quick on the return. Good flash uh -oh. away. Devourer staying alive for a second, but too much movement to try and track. Will be San Jose once again coming out on top in the bot lane. Yeah, Soda feeling really good about that one. Just being the real hero in that situation, setting up a kill, able to provide all these shields. What? And oh no, Kyorly, we've seen this one before. A lot of damage. So That's a much lot damage. of damage. Should have. I think if the ultimate gets dropped by Tom Goku, it actually can come through. But I'm not sure if there was just enough time for that sequence. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's, it's very, very close on on that one. Very scary, I think, for the future of this game. If you're a Kyorly, the fact that Tom Goku's already doing so much work is Piao is setting up for a dive here. Does have the Dominus. Does have the Ignite. Try and get a little more fury, walk away from Seal, but it's brought right into the waiting arms of Kimo. Gets Seal. a couple more autos, has to flash, and that's another kill on the Gwen, but so much expended for it is once again, I've seen this movie before and it barely works out as the heal just keeps Curly alive. Yeah, and it's Gwen. Oh, it was the Viego as Gwen something that Rift Carol. Uh, Tabula Rasa, though. Oh my goodness. Oh, he's looking for Piao and that extra tower shot will do the damage as he's two levels up. 
on chemo from all of that just hecarim farming and extra xp so in a great spot won't be much else to do sure all the plates went down top side with plates going down now it's good extra bit of gold but no tower taken quite yet i've been very impressed with tabula rasa this game i mean we highlighted him at the start of the show highest ranked player in the lobby really leading the san jose team and it is showing yeah, and i think the biggest thing as well is just knowledge of what the ideal build would be because there's a lot of situations where on hacker room here you'd go for something like a kambung chain sword which we weren't really looking forward to just went for the shoujin says hey i'll just kill them before they can heal yeah exactly is it's a little awkward for tom goku Ooh. doesn't get stunned up there's the chaos storm dropped and uh that's it both teams gonna walk away dragons up in a few but yeah just the the awareness for tabula rasa here to to go for that shoujin because there's a few options that you can realistically go for so the situational awareness very, very good. Now this dragon has been started up. And the top side, Seal, been taking advantage of just being left alone and isn't worth very much oh. gold. So this tower, worth plenty more than that. And this is looking great for San Jose as they're starting up the fight on the bot side. Devourer just has to run away. Kimo going to oh. get caught without a tower, tries to get the fight back. Tom Goku with, I think, the longest teleport back from the spirit as that I've ever seen. And San Jose just running away with this map control. Yeah, and I mean, Seal was able to stall a long time on the top side so much so that it clearly had to come up and sort of close that one out. And finally, these first two dragons of the game aren't going to get split between the two teams. SJS, you are picking up the pace incredibly quickly here. Tom Goku, very strong, three, one, and one. Kyorly, oh, not going to end up with that long extended trade. But yes, as you mentioned, Tabula Rasa is sort of the member to watch here. 4 0 and 4 has had absolute control over this game. And even getting that shutdown on Dipkao just sort of cements that this Hecarim is going to be sort of that weird sort of carry, even though they're kind of tanky and frontline-y. It's, it, it's a weird situation with Hecarim. What really is Hecarim? There's so many different builds. Uh, one of those champions that could just sort of build anything and get away with it. And Tom Goku just getting away as well. Oh, that's not a good spot for us here. That is not. Doesn't get stunned, actually, so Ooh. might sur just survive. Shields? Just wow. Just lives. Yeah, and still has the, you know, the gall to try and go back in just for a little bit of extra damage. That's the main thing. You know, Yone is deceptively tanky as well with all of the shielding that they're going to pick up over time. You know, Immortal Shield Bow, they're going to get a whole bunch of lifesteal and everything. Going for that Shield Bow route. You know, we did talk last week in terms of Yone builds about the potential of like a Bork into Infinity Edge, into, you know, tank build. Seal just about to walk away as well, and... It just feels as if SDSU were sort of running out of gas. They had the foot on the gas pedal in game one. Game two was just a long slog fest, and now they're just sort of losing the touch of this game and everything. It's starting to losing the grasp on uh, what made them strong. Like, you look at the rest of the map, you ignore top lane, and it's just, it's so far in favor of SJSU. And then, of course, Seal just, you know, stuck with the hand that they were dealt. Yeah, and... The thing is, though, Seal, I think, has recognized their role. They're, they're playing this Gwen as utility-heavy as possible, right? And early Oblivion Orb, sure, it was to try and survive the lane, but that's going to probably come into play in a very real way once we're starting to look at Baron fights. And also just... Oh, man, that was, that was in that half second where you can't get cancelled yeah. by damage. Is, this is just going to be the Herald drop. But, yeah, it's like the team is just playing so well together. The shot calling from Tabula Rasa has been fantastic, just moving... The team so well, taking advantage of this lead, getting ahead of Kimo as well. Just all props, I think, to San Diego State not losing it and just transitioning game plans once this top lane fell apart. And it's... Yeah. And I think that's that's the major thing, is that they're just letting top lane exist and be sort of a pressure sink in a lot of ways. And I think that has been successful because Kimo has spent a lot of time top lane just sort of supplementing Piao, getting that lead for themselves. And if we actually switch over to the gold once again, like, I mean, the gold lead that Renekton has over the Gwen is probably even to the Hecarim over other members, Tom Goku. Oh man, running forward Ooh. somehow escapes again. This guy's like Houdini, an absolute escape artist, is yeah, about 2K in the top side. And as you said, there's about a 2K lead for Tabula Ross over almost every other member besides Piao and Kimo on SDSU. Yeah, I mean, Tim Goku as well. You look at that, it's a, a decent lead over their lane opponent, 1500 gold. And uh, this Caitlyn just exploded out with gold as well. You know, 8000 gold. She is the richest member in this game all of a sudden. And oh, Coralie. 
Oh, just caught all alone. There's a rampaging horse just walking up forward. He's got the man immune. He's got all the damage he needs and is unstoppable. Five kills now to his name. We can't find the score. It's no longer 404. It's for SDSU, how do they come back? Oh my, it, it, it took you a second. It took you a second. Yeah, but... <laughs> you know, it, it was it was 404 brain not found for a little bit there. But, you know, yeah, exactly. Once the error resolves itself, you're good to go. I, I think the, the major thing is you, you need to just tr this, this game needs to go to like 45 minutes if they want to win this out. It, it sounds brutal, but realistically, this mid-game spike that they're on, two items on the hacker, I'm about to be two items once again on this Yone as well, if things keep going the way they are. This Caitlyn's at two items. You need Sivir to get to like 400 farm at this point. You just need uh, Devourer to start devouring in that sense. It starts to eat up that front line that is all supplemented by shields. They need three or four items at this point. And it's it's a brutal reality because T is incredibly fed once again, has gone under the radar, got most of those kills just quietly on the side. But that is what needs to happen. And Kyoli needs to stop getting caught out as well by this Yone because this is far too often oh, that we're calling this. It is it is so unfortunate that just every time he tries to push out, it's over as Why? now in the jungle, actually turning around oh. for a second on the Tabula Rasa. The healing felt like it was there. Piao King's pretty big. Gets Ooh. shut down by the ace in the hole. As we said, we want to go to 45, but SJSU are trying to accelerate this game as much as possible. Already three down. Devourer won't quite be number four. With T able to escape. Ooh. Maybe there's another oh, look here fast. for Tabula Rossi. So foul. Okay. <laughs> T? Okay. Don Goku. Oh. Now stepping up once again. Devourer still alive. Cure Lee just recently respawned. Gets chunked back to half. It's not been a great time for this victor. And oh it seems the fighting is finally over. And I mean, the, the lead has just been accelerating for SJSU by 500 gold per... 500 gold per minute. Yes. It's the acceleration thing. 500 gold per minute per minute or something. It's, it's just growing incredibly quickly here. It is unstoppable, it feels, for the side of SDSU to just sort of get back into this game. And I mean, 10,000 gold leads are sort of like your benchmark for a big gold lead. And sometimes if you see it at like 35 minutes into the game, you're like, okay, yeah, it doesn't really matter. There's people who are capping out. They can't use all that gold. Everyone can use this gold here. And some Goku going to, hey, yeah, find another solo kill. Yep. Nothing else to be said. Chemo has just been really struggling this game as Viego picked up R3. I mean, I, I like the idea as far as what they were trying to do with this Renekton and they tried to keep accelerating it, but Seal just sort of stopped uh, engaging, just realized it's time to play supportive. And there just hasn't been much else to say about all of this investment that San Diego put towards uh, Piao. He's now even or behind all of San Jose and at this point, I think the only real uh, strong point for San Diego is the fact that they have so much wave clear. And wait, did Piao just alcove this and escape? Yeah. Piao oh. just walked away in that situation. Tom Goku. Nice. Oh my. Oh, he's doing it again. Couldn't quite get Kimo this time. And realizes the threat of others and the potential for more kills. Does get rooted up for a second. Piao. Now off on the oh. side, hoping that John doesn't go down, will fall even with the wish. As on the back side, Seal gets a solo onto Kimo. Now the attempted run back down. Not Look gonna be bear. enough, even though on the hunt was popped. That mantra empowered E helps ferry Seal away. And here comes the horse as he runs into the back line. T is unstoppable. Oh, Dabula Rasa, he's so fast, he's so speedy. And he gets a double kill for it. Drops a little Amumu crying as they've got Baron. They got everything they could need, and they're just going to run this one down. Yeah, they said, you know, this night has been late enough. They want to close it out here. Uh, Tabula Rasa also just made Renekton walk through a wall there. <laughs> Not sure if you saw that as well. And they got Baron while all that was happening. It was just a random fight on the top side of the two-man Baron. And they're diving more. Oh, Tabula Rasa still staying alive. Kimo's level 11 to Tabula Ross is 16, and he's getting sent back to base once again at gray screen. Very familiar for this Viego, as we're seeing the hex gates used for an escape. Yeah, it seems as if they know they can't quite end the game here, but uh, out of all of the gold leads in League of Legends, 14,000 is not one that I expected to see at 23 minutes into this game. We talked about the acceleration of gold, how it's 500 gold. 
per minute per minute or however it is i don't think it's actually that much because that would be like incredibly quick gold advance but they've been they've been growing their league quite a bit that's that's Zoom what in. i'm trying to say with way more words than i need to <laughs> try to get yeah. fancy with it you're you're in you're in college mode it's that essay writing mode where you got to extend it's your good. sentences as much as possible make sure that they're incredibly verbose and have all of the extra words required for that 1200 word limit if you're a if you're a liberal arts major out there i know you i see you as the step forward from tom goku actually prompts oh, no, the Tom dominus out of piao which is not great <laughs> as john just gets chunked to half from one basic ability out of dust tabula rasa that's oh my gosh it is dust oh. we've got a disappearing horse baby yeah we talked about how they they're able to get out of these situations like houdini quite literally they will disappear under your nose with absolutely no explanation uh tabula rasa though no, they're fast enough to just run around. Oh my goodness. <laughs> he doesn't even need to. He oh. wants to go back in. Now he's disappeared off the map. He's coming back up. Devourer oh. is next to fall. He's down. Now a disappearing horse once again. No one to reset off of quite yet. Chemo very low. Manages to make it back to the fountain, and we will only get two disappearances from Rasa on this act. But it will be the Nexus disappearing as SJSU's final trick against San Diego as they pull off the mini reverse sweep, losing game one, getting games two and three to stay at the top of the standings. Yeah, honestly, fantastic game coming through from Spartan Esport there, of course. Uh, just it seemed as if it took them a game to turn on in a sense and i mean when we had the interview last week with usu they said yeah you know what it was it was our first game of the day and it just felt as if maybe that was the same situation this time around they just sort of flipped the switch and they were able to get everything figured out for themselves and honestly once again fantastic performance by them and you know sort of locking up that top seed in their group at the very least they will be the team to beat or potentially the team to beat tied for uh, tied for first yeah. there's gonna be some sort of tie yeah, I think they're, they're, worst case scenario they're second place yeah. exactly i was gonna say they have locked up i think second at the very least they've played everyone else in that top level of teams and i think only falling to utah so maybe that'll be the head-to-head -head decider at the end of the day but overall a huge and fantastic performance from them as i believe we're gonna try and get an interview with one of the players from san jose state so we're gonna take a little break set that up for y'all and here inside the minds of the spartans who took this win today Slowly, you stop speaking at just the right moment. Valorant is often called a team-based shooter, but sometimes it can't just be about the team. Sometimes you gotta have those hero plays. Spec wanted the spray and pray and was actually able to save the day for SVSU, tying up the series 7-7. Seven seven. Hard B push here, two omens from coming out. One, oh, Spec oh. just fights three. What? Straight through the smoke? Oh, one spec. That's not legal, man. That's not legal. This is this is match day two of the ECAC league. You can't be doing that right now. It's <laughs> just goes with the call. Here in this clip, Fanshawe finds themselves with their backs against the wall. 20 seconds left on the clock, and they're desperate to take down Wake Forest. They don't have anything to get through this team. They don't have any weapons on the field. But with Jackie Moon in the wings, at least they had a sniper. Apparently. He's going to believe all the shots. Oh, a sniper! Jackie Moon from about midway through. What a shot right here from Jackie. Wow, good eye sniper. Yes, sir. Jackie Moon puts this on the right side. A little bit more to the left. This one would have been... Here in this clip, we're going to get a great moment from a Pac-Man. And as a Pac-Man player, I was super excited to see it. We're going to hear a lot of praise from our commentators giving Mosey those compliments of choosing Snake against Pac-Man. A great counter pick. They were super excited to see a snake on the field. But even without their blessing, trollery does not yield. Approach, but like you said, he's trying to play this safe because losing a stock right now for Concord would be really bad. Oh, and, well, no! A little bit of commentator's curse there. We kind of willed that one into existence. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. No! What? Now I know what you're thinking. Oh, Septilence, how could that be all we got from weeks number one and two? Please tell me there's more. 
If you like what you saw, you've got to go check out ECAC Esports on all social media platforms. Please see what they're bringing to the table. It is great collegiate esports week after week on the bright side, folks. This is just the beginning. We've got the whole rest of what's guaranteed to be a great season ahead of us. Thank you so much for joining me for this recap, and I'll see you on the next one. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Collegiate Esport Commissioner's Cup. I am Seth Lins, and I get a really neat opportunity here. We get to interview Burns from E United. Burns, how you doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing great. We're on day two of the event. It's been a fantastic one. I ran into you yesterday, but yeah. we were running around like chickens with our heads off, and it has been, I mean, how, how has your time been here? What has this event kind of been like? Yeah, it's great. I just love being in a passion pit, seeing all the college kids go at it. Uh, reminds me of like an old school MLG event almost, but being like in the epicenter of the passion yes. pit, seeing Rocket League, Valorant, Overwatch, and Smash, just, it's amazing to see all these schools compete against each other and get a shot to play on this main stage. Yeah, no doubt about it. And tell us a little bit about kind of what is what is E-United, right? Because we know that yeah, sure. you're here, we know you're here to represent them, but for the people that don't know, what, what is E-United? Yeah, E-United was founded in 2016. We're a professional esports organization. Uh, we've been in League of Legends, Overwatch, all the way to uh, Battle Ride, I think it was called back in the day. Uh, <laughs> Right now in uh, 2022, we are in Gears of War, Halo, Rocket League, PUBG, wow. and announcing a new title tomorrow. Uh, I know, get get the small intel here. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I went pro in Call of Duty when I was younger. I ended up playing my last event under E-United, switched in 2016, and I've been wow. uh, the GM ever since. So it's a, it's a true blessing to be able to stay with an organization for as long as I have, and uh, we love giving back to the collegiate community. Uh, I actually graduated from Full Sail in 2013. I was a little confused yep. about the jersey. I was <laughs> yeah. A little... <laughs> yeah, so the Full Sail boys are out of the tournament, unfortunately, but I decided I would rep them today I in their it. honor. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just great. I, I love working with younger individuals who are trying to find their path in esports, and yeah. these college kids are really showing what they're all about. Yeah, so to be kind of an ex-pro player, where a collegiate scene at the time didn't exist, especially not to the scale yeah. right now, what is it like to see such high levels of success, such high levels of support for something that you weren't able to kind of get as much support in at the time, something that was looked down on a lot more. Yeah, I'm uh, extremely jealous, that's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Full Sail started their program in 2017. When I was there in 2011 and 12, it was just a bunch of nerds running around, just right. creating their own clubs. I was still striving to go pro, but now you have these opportunities to play right. on main stage, play in front of thousands of people. We just had locals back in the day. You would show up and play for like $200, $100. It was like lunch money. Right. Now these kids are playing for scholarships. They're playing for fame. They could pop off here and end up getting a sponsor for ten dollars or $20,000 from somebody. Right. So the opportunities are just endless at the moment, and I think it's just great that uh, you, know, you basically can prove yourself and make anything happen right now. Welcome back, as we saw quite a series between SDSU and San Jose. But San Jose coming away with the win as we are joined by their top laner, Cole, for an interview. How you feeling after that win? Real, not a, I'm not going to say a comeback, but after losing game one, you guys looked really, really good for the rest of the series. Uh, yeah, so I'm feeling pretty good. Um, it was a really important match for us to win. Uh, we only dropped one series technically in Mountain West, so this kind of secures us for either first or second seed, which is pretty good. I mean, we just have to wait for for Utah to play their last. I think they have one more game um, to see our final seeding. But yeah, overall, feel pretty good. Yeah, and uh, I guess starting off with this series, you know, had a little bit of a rough start in game one there. The Nasus came out from the side of SDSU. Was that something you were expecting? What was your sort of idea behind it and sort of what ended up happening when it sort of got the ball rolling yeah so game one um we do we've we played at sdsu before we've played a show match against them uh i think like two months ago and then we've scrimmed them before um so i know that he like plays nasus we've played against it before so i wasn't like completely surprised 
Um, yeah, we just kind of thought that we'd be able to deal with it. And since they locked in um, Kate Lux, spot lane, and we knew they were going to play a mage mid if they locked in Nasus, and we thought that we had enough dive with um, Akali and Malphite and like Nami Alt that we'd be able to deal with it. Um, but then we kind of lost, we kind of lost our footing, I think, in the early game, and we kind of showed around bot. And then mid game, we just didn't have enough damage to deal with Nasus and Jarvan. Like we didn't have enough peel. Um, but yeah, we we kind of knew the Nasus was coming, but um, we decided to kind of pivot our draft more uh, to make it like easier to play at least for game two and three. Yeah, and then in turn in game two, you know, big turnaround in terms of uh, playing around that bot lane. We talked uh, on the cast as well about how strong of a bot lane meta things are right now, which, you know, as a top laner for you, kind of sucks. Right? But nonetheless, <laughs> yeah. you know, going more towards that bot lane in game two, you know, T had a fantastic performance, but it just felt like everyone was sort of waking up a little bit there. What was the mentality going into game two and then sort of throughout the game? How did things feel? Yeah, so game two, uh, like the first thing we wanted is we wanted like, a bot lane where like we had more control i guess uh because in the lucia nami lane i guess you used to be able to have a uh, pretty good prio but after like the nerfs and everything and the melee supports getting buffed and everything like that uh it's kind of hard to you have to play almost perfect to, to get ahead in the lane um so yeah we wanted to give bot lane kind of like a better matchup i guess and more comfort uh tt he he really likes playing draven we were kind of joking that every time we beat SDSU, he always has to play Draven for us to win. Um, but yeah, so we just picked like a stand more standard bot lane. Um, we hand shook the mid matchup, which was Mage on Mage. And then I was okay pl playing the blind Jax because I kind of thought he was just going to pivot into something like Gnar or Aatrox. But I, I did struggle kind of a lot against the Fiora. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't know. I just toughed it out and then we, we just out team fought the mid game. Yeah, and I guess the same thing goes to the game three as well. You know, yeah. Just an unlucky situation. You're, you're finding the Gwen into the Renekton, but uh, nonetheless, it just felt as if the game got unlocked. And a lot of that came from Tabula Rasa, your jungler there. Uh, you know, go, in game three, you know, it was sack top lane, I fear, and then the rest of the map sort of worked itself out. And uh, for you, you know, how does it feel? Are you fine with that? Is it just, you know, you win the game at the end of the day? It's just like, yeah, at the end, you just like, <laughs> diff, or, you know, how, how does it feel in that situation as well? Because it's it's a win, but, you know, it feels tough. Yeah, it was tough. Um, I mean, I think it feels worse if you don't know it's coming and you're not set up for it. But in that game, we knew, like, what was going on the whole time. Um, I think... I can't. I don't know the first dive specifically, but I know that we uh, we did punish them for them committing that much to topside. I think our Caitlyn five plated bot and our Yone solo killed mid like two times, even though uh, the Soraka was moving to him and our jungler was up like fifty CS. And yeah, it was just. I mean, I was just playing my role, my my role in the team. So, I mean, it feels bad, but I the win feels better, I guess. <laughs> That's true. Wins always feel great. So if there's anyone would like to shout out for today's W, now's your time. Um, I don't think I have anyone specifically that I want to shout out. I mean, everyone played well on our team. Um, we had really good mentals today. I'm proud of everyone. Um, yeah, and thanks everyone for watching and supporting on the stream. And yeah, that's pretty much all I got. Great to hear. Thank you so much for coming on, giving us a little bit of a foray into the minds behind SJSU and for putting on such a fun series to watch. Yeah, of course. Thank you. And for everyone at home, that marks the end of it here on Wednesdays. The Mountain West is the end of the day. We had some great games earlier, but Adam, as always, a great time casting with you. Of course, always a pleasure to be working with you, J Turbo. And of course, thank you to the back end crew, Ibram, our amazing observer, showing us the wildlife of the Rift and making sure we catch every single bit of the action. And of course, producer Colton as well, setting everything up, making sure we look just as good on screen as the players looked as well. I'll leave it to you to close us out. Here. Exactly. Thank you so much, everyone on the back end. Thank you guys at home for coming through and watching. And if there's more esports you want to watch, of course, esports you is the place to do it. Tomorrow we've got NJCAAE and ECC Valorant back to back. So not going to want to miss that one. And of course, be sure to check out Twitter and all of that jazz to see what other matches you want to catch. And of course, there's always reruns if you need more esports to watch. But from us here at Esports, you have a wonderful night.
So if, if somebody's trying to go pro, right, they're like, Burns, I want to be you one day. I want to be the GM of United one day. What is that first step to really take it from a hobby to, to a passion, to a job? Yeah, I think I've told this story a lot, but it's really, I thought about going pro every night before I went to bed. Right. Like, I lived and breathed Call of Duty for years. It was my life. I skipped, I had to skip dinner sometimes, I had to skip family functions, and my family didn't really understand, but it was what I wanted to do, and it all worked out, but uh, at the end of the day, you always need to kind of be organized, you have to have the ability to not put all of your eggs in one basket, so even though it worked out for me, there are so many opportunities right. in esports. There's being a caster or interviewing people. There's be working in production. There's helping people get waters. Like literally, there are so many opportunities. So, um, oh, this crowd's awesome. They're going right crazy, <laughs> dude. <laughs> that, they stayed on their last life right off now. Off subject, Smash, regardless if it's middle school, high school, college, it pops life. off it all pops. the time. I love it. Well, Burns, so, thank you so no, much, yeah, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no it. worries. Thank you, guys. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to ECAC Plays of the Week. And it's not just any week this time, it is the playoffs. We've got eight incredible clips, and I'm super excited to jump into them. My name's Septilins. I hope you're ready to hop into the ride, because it's going to be a great one. When I found out this was clip number eight of the playoffs highlight reel, I was flabbergasted because this is an incredible moment from Swift on the side of RPI. It's not just one or two elims to win the round and put RPI in a better position. It's all five coming from a single player. Take a look. They hit him with the judge. Operator in hand. Swift is trying to be able to find some value to it. The head hunter okay. does a number on him. Okay. They're going to get a 4K. They're going to be able to get this plan down. Dakota's going to try and find him. Do they go into the tank? Yes, they do. Oh, they come out. That's the ace <laughs> for Swift. God. They're able to make it happen all themselves. And they will get this one for free for RPI. Clip number seven tells a pretty amazing story as well. Ball State already up two games in a best of seven series, and they find themselves tied two to two, less than a minute left on the clock. Perhaps a little bit more pressure than they'd want there in game number three, but it's Daffy from Ball State that takes all the pressure and immediately relieves it from the team. Find it back, pass to Daffy, bar down and in. Ball State will not be denied a game. Crossbar has been doing a heck of a job here for Hartford, keeping the ball out of the net, but it only lasts for so long as Daffy's able to get. Playoffs call for one thing unconventional plays and crazy moments and I knew this was going to be a crazy moment when the clip started with me looking at the casters this stock comes through so fast from Northwood that we couldn't even get just the gameplay in the clip it wouldn't be long enough it is an incredible moment from SGP and it just goes to show how good Northwood continues to be I see seconds into the match and SGP's got a spike a zero to death at that brother that was literally one down here after after fireball bro please oh and now we're playing this dangerous game at the ledge for clip number five we're jumping into one of my favorite games and we get the chance to see one of my favorite ultimate combinations in the game right now the roadhog ultimate and the kitsune rush from kiriko so unbelievably strong and it really helps newberry kind of snap back in a moment where they were struggling to gain their footing once again to deal with that nano blade you really just have to get around the protection suzu and the sleep dart well, there's the whole hog, there's the Kitsune Rush, and there goes the lives of Alfred State. Depressus is going to find a third. That's going to be a team kill. Kitsune Rush plus whole hog overpowered, I swear. It Clip number four, not quite on the podium, but still very, very impressive. Emery and Henry versus St. Lawrence going head-to-head. -head. Both teams, two players left, but Hispanard wants to clean up their opponents as quick as humanly possible, and quick they certainly were. Yeah, little in fact, PhD actually stands for pretty heavy dude, because Dr. Mario might as well be a heavy with how he hits and how hard he can be to kill sometimes. The fact that he has Mario's hitboxes, his get off the tools, and oh, he's kill confirms at no. red, like I said, throw confirms. At the beginning of this video, I talked about the individual presence a single player can have to make or break success for their team. 
Keller from Fisher College proves that point in its entirety by dropping a 4K against Ball State University and removing any iota of wind from their sails on Q.